Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1 Cosmogenesis Part 2 The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order with Explanatory Sections. Section 9 The Moon, Deus Lunus, Ferbe. This archaic symbol is the most poetical of all symbols, as also the most philosophical. The ancient Greeks brought it into prominence, and the modern poets have worn it threadbare. The Queen of Night, riding in the majesty of her peerless light in heaven, throwing all, even Hesperus, into darkness, and spreading her silver mantle over the whole sidereal world, has ever been a favorite theme with all the poets of Christendom, from Milton and Shakespeare down to the latest versifier. But the refulgent lamp of night, with a suite of stars unnumbered, spoke only to the imagination of the profane. Until lately, religion and science had naught to do with the beautiful mythos. Yet the cold chaste moon, she, in the words of Shelley, Quote, who makes all beautiful on which she smiles, that wandering shrine of soft yet icy flame, which ever is transformed yet still the same, and warms but not illuminous, unquote. stands in closer relations to earth than any other sidereal orb. The sun is the giver of life to the whole planetary system, the moon is the giver of life to our globe, and the early races understood and knew it, even in their infancy. She is the queen, and she is the king, and was King Soma before she became transformed into Ferbe, and the chaste Diana. She is preeminently the deity of the Christians, through the Mosaic and Kabbalistic Jews, though the civilized world may have remained ignorant of the fact for long ages, in fact, ever since the last initiated father of the church died, carrying with him into his grave the secrets of the pagan temples. For the, quote, fathers, unquote, such as Oregon or Clemens Alexandrinus, the moon was Jehovah's living symbol, the giver of life and the giver of death, the disposer of being in our world. For if Artemis was Luna in heaven, and, with the Greeks, Diana on earth, who presided of childbirth and life, with the Egyptians she was Hecat, Hecati, in hell, the goddess of death, who ruled over magic and enchantments. More than this, as a personified moon, whose phenomena are triadic, Diana Hectiluna is the three in one. For she is Diva Triformis, Tergemina, Triceps, three heads on one neck, like Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Note, the goddess Trimorphos in the stature of Alcamenus. End of note. Hence she is the prototype of our trinity which has not always been entirely male. The number seven, so prominent in the Bible, so sacred in its seventh Sabbath day, came to the Jews from antiquity, deriving its origin from the fourfold number seven contained in the twenty-eight days of the lunar month, each septenary portion thereof being typified by one quarter of the moon. It is worth the trouble of presenting in this work a bird's-eye view of the origin and development of the lunar myth and worship in historical antiquity on our side of the globe. Its early origin is untraceable by exact science, rejecting as it does tradition, while for theology which, under the guidance of the crafty popes, has put a brand on every fragment of literature that does not bear the imprimatur of the Church of Rome, its archaic history is a sealed book. Whether the Egyptian or the Aryan Hindu religious philosophy is the more ancient, and the secret doctrine says it is the latter, does not much matter in this instance, as the lunar and solar, quote, worship, unquote, are the most ancient in the world. Both have survived and prevailed to this day throughout the whole world, with some openly 
with others, for example, in Christian symbolics, secretly. The cat, a lunar symbol, was sacred to Isis, herself the moon in one sense, as Osiris was the sun. The cat is often seen on top of the sistrum, in the hand of the goddess. This animal was held in great veneration in the city of Bubaste, which went into deep mourning after the death of every sacred cat, because Isis, as the moon, was particularly worshipped in the city of mysteries. The astronomical symbolism connected with it has already been given in section one of the symbolism, and no one has better described it than Mr. G. Massey in his lectures and in The Natural Genesis. The eye of the cat, it is said, seems to follow the lunar phases in its growth and decline, and its orbs shine like two stars in the darkness of night, hence the mythological allegory which shows Diana hiding under the shape of a cat in the moon, when, in company with other deities, she was seeking to escape the pursuit of Typhon, vide the metamorphosis of Ovid. The moon in Egypt was both the eye of Horus and the eye of Osiris, the sun. The same with the Cynocephalus. The dog-headed ape was a glyph to symbolize the sun and moon, in turn, though the Cynocephalus is more a hermetic than a religious symbol. For it is the hieroglyph of Mercury, the planet, as of the Mercury of the alchemical philosophers, as, say the alchemists, Mercury has to be ever near Isis as a minister, as without Mercury neither Isis nor Osiris can accomplish anything in the great work. Cynocephalus, whenever represented with the caduceus, the crescent, or the lotus, is a glyph of the philosophical Mercury, but when seen with a reed, or a roll of parchment, he stands for Hermes, the secretary and adviser of Isis, as Hanuman filled the same office with Rama. Though the regular sun-worshippers, the Parsis, are few, Yet not only is the bulk of the Hindu mythology and history based upon and interblended with these two worships, but so is also the Christian religion itself. From their origin down to our modern day it has coloured the theologies of both the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. The difference indeed between the Aryan Hindu and the Aryan European faiths is very small, if only the fundamental ideas of both are taken into consideration. Hindus are proud of calling themselves Suryas and Chandravanses of the solar and lunar dynasties. The Christians pretend to regard it as idolatry, and yet they adhere to a religion entirely based upon the solar and lunar worships. It is useless and vain for the Protestants to exclaim against the Roman Catholics for their, quote, Mariolatry, unquote, based on the ancient cult of lunar goddesses, which they themselves worship Jehovah, pre-eminently a lunar god, and when both churches have accepted in their theologies their, quote, son Christ, unquote, and the lunar trinity. What is known of Chaldean moon worship, of the Babylonian god, Sin, called by the Greeks Deus Lunus, is very little, and that little is apt to mislead the profane student who fails to grasp the esoteric significance of the symbols. As a popular known to the ancient profane philosophers and writers, for those who were initiated were pledged to silence, the Chaldea were the worshippers of the moon under her and his various names, just as were the Jews who came after them. In the unpublished manuscripts on the art speech already mentioned, giving a key to the formation of the ancient symbolical language, a logical raison d'être is brought forward for this double worship. It is written by a wonderfully well-informed and acute scholar and mystic who gives it in the comprehensive form of a hypothesis. The latter, however, becomes forcibly a proven fact in the history of religious evolution in human thought to anyone who has ever had a glimpse into the secret of ancient symbology. Thus he says, quote, One of the first occupations among men connected with those of actual necessity would be the perception of time periods marked on the vaulted arc of the heavens sprung and rising over the level floor of the horizon or the plain of still water. Note, 
ancient mythology includes ancient astronomy as well as astrology. The planets were the hands pointing out on the dial of our solar system the hours of certain periodical events. Thus, Mercury was the messenger appointed to keep time during the daily solar and lunar phenomena, and was otherwise connected with the god and goddess of light. End of note. These would come to be marked as those of day and night, of the phases of the moon, of its stellar or synodic revolutions, and of the period of the solar year, with the recurrence of the seasons, and with application to such periods of the natural measure of day or night, or of the day divided into the light and the dark. It would also be discovered that there was the longest and shortest solar day, and two solar days of equal day and night within the period of the solar year, and the points in the year of these could be marked with the greatest precision in the starry groups of the heavens or their constellations, subject to that retrograde movement thereof, which in time would require correction by intercalation, as was the cause in the description of the flood, where a correction of 150 days was made for a period of 600 years, during which confusion of landmarks had increased. This would naturally come to pass with all races in all time, and such knowledge must be taken to have been inherent in the human race prior to what we call the historic period. End of quote. On this basis, the author seeks for some natural physical function possessed in common with the human race and connected with the periodical manifestations, such that the connection between the two kinds of phenomena became fixed in popular usage. He finds it a. in the feminine physiological phenomena every lunar month of twenty-eight days or four weeks of seven days each, so that thirteen occurrences of the period should happen in three hundred and sixty four days, which is the solar week year of fifty two weeks of seven days each. b. The quickening of the fetus is marked by a period of one hundred and twenty six days, or eighteen weeks of seven days each. c. That period which is called the period of viability is one of two hundred and ten days, or thirty weeks of seven days each. D. The period of parturition is accomplished in 280 days, or a period of 40 weeks of 7 days each, or 10 lunar months of 28 days each, or of 9 calendar months of 31 days each, counting on the royal arc of heavens, for the measure of the period of traverse from the darkness of the womb to the light and glory of conscious existence, that continuing inscrutable mystery and miracle. Thus the observed periods of time marking the workings of the birth function would naturally become a basis of astronomical calculation. We may almost affirm that this was the mode of reckoning among all nations, either independently or intermediately and indirectly by tuition. It was the mode with the Hebrews, for even today they calculate the calendar by means of the 354 and 355 of the lunar year, and we possess a special evidence that it was the mode with the ancient Egyptians, as to which this is the proof. Quote, the basic idea underlying the religious philosophy of the Hebrews was that God contained all things within himself. Note. A caricatured and dwarfed Vedanti notion of Parabrahman containing within itself the whole universe as being that boundless universe itself, and there existing nothing outside of itself. End of note. And that man was his image. The place of the man and woman with the Hebrews was among the Egyptians occupied by the bull and the cow, sacred to Osiris and Isis, who were represented respectively by a man having a bull's head and a woman having the head of a cow, which symbols were worshipped. Note, just as they are to this day in India, the bull of Shiva and the cow representing several Shakti goddesses. End of note. 
Notoriously, Osiris was the sun and the river Nile, the tropical year of 365 days, which numbers the value of the word Nalos, and the bull, as he was also the principle of fire and of the bed of the river Nile, or the mother earth. For the parturient energies of which water was a necessity, the lunar year of 354 to 364 days, the time maker of the periods of gestation, and the cow marked by all with the crescent new moon. But the use of the cow of the Egyptians for the women of the Hebrews was not intended as of any radical difference of signification but a concurrence in the teaching intended, and merely a substitution of a symbol of common import, which was this, meaning the period of parturition with the cow and the woman was held to be the same, or two hundred and eighty days, or ten lunar months and four weeks each. And in this period consisted the essential value of this animal symbol, whose mark was that of the crescent moon. Note hence the worship of the moon by the Hebrews. End of note. These parturient and natural periods are found to have been subjects of symbolism all over the world. They were thus used by the Hindus, and are found to be most plainly set forth by the ancient Americans in the Richardson and Jest tablets in the Palenque Cross, and manifestly lay at the base of the formation of the calendar forms of the Mayas, of Yucatan, the Hindus, the Assyrians, and the ancient Babylonians, as well as the Egyptians and Old Hebrews. The natural symbols would be either the phallus or the phallus and yoni, or male and female. Indeed, the words translated by the generalizing terms male and female in the 27th verse of the first chapter of Genesis are sac and Cabra, or literally, Phallus and Yoni. Note, male and female created he them. End of note. Why the representation of the phallic emblems would barely indicate the genital members of the human body when their functions and the development of the seed vesicles emanating from them was considered. Then would come into indication a mode of measures of lunar time and through lunar of solar time. End of quote. This is the physiological or anthropological key to the moon symbol. The key that opens the mystery of the theogony or the evolution of the monumentaric gods is more complicated and has nothing phallic in it. All is mystical and divine there, but the Jews, beyond connecting Jehovah directly with the moon as a generative god, preferred to ignore the higher hierarchies and have made of some of them zodiacal constellations and planetary gods their patriarchs, thus humorizing the purely theosophical idea and dragging it down into the level of sinful humanity. See section Holy of Holies and the Symbolism of Book 2. The manuscripts from which the above is extracted explains very clearly to what hierarchy of God's Jehovah belonged and who this Jewish God was for it shows in clear language that which the writer has always insisted upon, namely, that the God with which the Christians have burdened themselves was no better than the lunar symbol of the reproductive or generative faculty in nature. They have ever ignored even the Hebrew secret God of the Kabbalists, Ein Sof, as grand as Parabramam in the earliest Kabbalistic and mystical conceptions. But it is not the Kabbalah of Rosenroth that can ever give the true original teachings of Simeon ben Yochai, as metaphysical and philosophical as any. And how many are there among the students of the Kabbalah who knew anything of them except in their distorted Latin translations? Let us glance at the idea which led the ancient Jews to adopt a substitute for the ever unknowable, and which has misled the Christians into mistaking the substitute for the reality. Quote, if to these organs, phallus and yoni, as symbols of creative cosmic agencies, the idea of time period can be attached, then, indeed, in the construction of temples as dwellings of deity or of Jehovah, 
that post designated as the holy of holies or the most high place should borrow its title from the recognized sacredness of the generative organs considered as symbols of measures as well as of creative cause with the ancient wise there was no name and no idea and no symbol of a first cause note because it was too sacred it is referred to as a that in the vedas it is the eternal cause and cannot therefore be spoken of as a first cause, a term implying the absence of any cause at one time. End of note. With the Hebrews, the indirect conception of such was couched in a term of negation of comprehension, meaning Ainsof, or the without bounds. But the symbol of its first comprehensible manifestation was the conception of a circle with its diameter line see the probe of book one part one to carry at once a geometric phallic and astronomic idea for the one takes its birth from the naught or the circle without which it could not be and from one or primal one spring the nine digits and geometrically all plain shapes so in the Kabbalah this circle, with its diameter line, is the picture of the ten sephiroth, or emanations, composing the Adam Kadman, the archetypal man, the creative origin of all things. This idea of connecting the circle and its diameter line, that is, number ten, with the signification of the reproductive organs and the most holy place, was carried out constructively in the king's chamber, or Holy of Holies of the Great Pyramid in the Tabernacle of Moses, and in the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon. It is the picture of a double womb, for in Hebrew the letter He is at the same time the number five, and symbol of the womb, and twice five is ten, or the phallic number. This double womb, also shows the duality of the idea carried from the highest spiritual down to the lowest or terrestrial plane and by the jews limited to the latter with them therefore the number seven has acquired the most prominent place in their exoteric religion a cult of external forms and empty rituals as their sabbath for instance the seventh day sacred to their deity the moon symbolical of the generative jehovah while with other nations the number seven was typical of theogonic evolution of cycles cosmic planes and the seven forces and occult powers of cosmos as a boundless whole whose first upper triangle was unreachable to the finite intellect of man while other nations therefore busied themselves in the forcible limitation of cosmos in space and time only with its septenary manifested plane the Jews centered this member solely in the moon, and based all their sacred calculations thereupon. Hence we find the thoughtful author of the manuscripts just quoted remarking in reference to the metrology of the Jews that, quote, If twenty thousand six hundred and twelve be multiplied by four divided by three, the product will afford a base for the ascertainment of the mean revolution of the moon, and if this product be again multiplied by four-thirds, this continued product will afford a base for finding the exact period of the mean solar year. This form, becoming for the finding of astronomical periods of time, of very great service. Unquote. This double number, male and female, is symbolized also in some well-known idols, for example, Ardana Reishvara, the Isis of the Hindus, Eridanus, or Ardan, or the Hebrew Jordan, or source of descent. She is standing on a lotus leaf flowing on the water, but the signification is that it is androgyne or hermaphrodite, that is phallus and yoni combined, the number ten, the Hebrew letter Jod, the containment of Jehovah. She, or rather she, he, 
gives the minutes of the same circle of 360 degrees. Jehovah in its best aspect is Bina, the upper mediating mother, the great sea or Holy Spirit, therefore rather a synonym of Mary, the mother of Jesus, than of his father. Ma that mother being the Latin mare, the sea, is here also Venus, the Stella del Mare, or Star of the Sea. The ancestors of the mysterious Arcadians, the Chandra or Indovansas, the lunar kings whom tradition shows reigning at Prayag, Allahabad, ages before our era, had come from India, and brought with them the worship of their forefathers, of Soma and his son Buddha, which afterwards became that of the Chaldeans. Yet such adoration, apart from popular astrology and heliolatry, was in no sense idolatry, no more at any rate than the modern Roman Catholic symbolism which connects their Virgin Mary, the Magna Mater of the Syrians and Greeks, with the moon. Of this worship the most pious Roman Catholics feel quite proud, and loudly confess to it. In a memoir to the French Academy, the Marquis de Merville says, It is only natural that, as an unconscious prophecy, Amon Ra should be his mother's husband, since the Magna Mater of the Christians is precisely the spouse of that son she conceives. We, Christians, can understand now why Nitis throws radiance on the sun while remaining the moon, since the Virgin, who is the Queen of Heaven, as Nith was, clothes herself in her radiance, and clothes in his turn the Christ's son. Tu vestis solem et te sol vestit is sung by the Roman Catholics during their service. And he adds, We, Christians, understand also how it is that the famous inscription at Sais should have stated that none has ever lifted my peplum, veil, considering that this sentence literally translated is the summary of what is sung in the church on the day of the Immaculate Conception. Archaeology of the Virgin Mother, page 117. Surely nothing could be more sincere than this. It justifies entirely what Mr. Gerald Massey has said in his lecture on Leonolatry, Ancient and Modern. Quote, the man in the moon, Osiris Sut, Jehovah Satan, Christ Judas, and other lunar twins, is often charged with bad conduct. In the lunar phenomena, the moon was one as the moon, which was twofold in sex and threefold in character, as mother, child, and adult male. Thus the child of the moon became the consort of his own mother. It could not be helped if there was to be a reproduction. He was compelled to be his own father. These relationships were repudiated by later sociology, and the primitive man in the moon got tabooed. Yet in its latest, most inexplicable phase, this has become the central doctrine of the grossest superstition the world has seen, for these lunar phenomena and their humanly represented relationships, the incestuous included, are the very foundations of the Christian trinity in unity. Through ignorance of the symbolism, the simple representation of early time has become the most profound religious mystery in modern lunarotry. The Roman Church, without being in any wise ashamed of the proof, portrays the Virgin Mary arrayed with the sun and the horned moon at her feet, holding the lunar infant in her arms as a child and consort of the mother moon. The mother, child, and adult male are fundamental. End of quote. Quote, in this way it can be proved that our Christology is mummified mythology and legendary lore which have been palmed off upon us in the Old Testament and the New as divine revelation uttered by the very voice of God. Unquote. A charming allegory is found in the Zohar, one which unveils better than anything ever did the true character of Jehovah or Yehaviha in the primitive conception of the Hebrew Kabbalists. It is now found in the philosophy of Ibn Gibral's Kabbalah, translated by Isaac Meyer.
In the introduction written by Reyes Kiyar, which is very old, says our author, and forms part of our broad edition of the Zohar, one, five B, sequence, is an account of a journey taken by R. Elazar, son of R. Shimob Yoa, and Rabbi Abba. They meet a man with a heavy burden and asked his name, but he refused to give it and proceeded to explain to them Torah. Law. They asked, Who caused thee thus to walk and carry such a heavy load? He answered, The letter Yod, which equals ten, and is the symbolical letter of Kether, and the essence and germ of the holy name, Yahaviha. They said to him, if thou wilt tell us the name of thy father, we will kiss the dust of thy feet. He replied, As to my father, he had his dwelling in the great sea, and was a fish therein, like Vishnu and dragon or Oanes, which first destroyed the great sea. And he was great and mighty and ancient of days, until he swallowed all other fishes in the great sea. Arelazar listened and said to him, Thou art the son of the holy flame, thou art the son of Rabham, Nunna, Saba, the old, the fish in Aramaic, O Keldi, is none, Nun. Thou art the son of the light of the Torah, Dharma, etc. Then the author explains that the feminine Sephiroth, Bina, is termed by the Kabbalist the Great Sea. Therefore Bina, whose divine names are Jehovah, Yah, and Elohim, is simply the Chaldean Tiamat, the female power, the Talat of Berosus, who presides over the chaos, and which made out later by Christian theology to be the serpent and the devil. She, he, Yahovah, is the supernatural, he and Eve. This Yehovah, then, or Jehovah, is identical with our chaos, father, mother, son, on the material plane and in the purely physical world. Demon and Deus at one at the same time, the sun and moon, good and evil, God and demon. Lunar magnetism generates life, preserves and destroys it, psychically as well as physically. And if, astronomically, she is one of the seven planets of the ancient world, in Theogony she is one of the regions thereof. With Christians now, as much as with pagans, the former referring to her under the name of one of their archangels, and the latter under that of one of their gods. Therefore, the meaning of the, quote, fairy tale, unquote, translated by Chovson from an old Chaldean manuscript, translated into Arabic, about Kuchami being instructed by the idol of the moon, is easily understood. Vide Book 3. Seldonus tells us the secret, as well as Memunid, Moranevachim, Book 3, Chapter 30. The worshippers of the Teraphim, the Jewish oracles, carved images and claimed that the light of the principal stars, the planets, permeating these through and through, the angelic virtues, or the regions of the stars and planets, conversed with them, teaching them many most useful things and arts." Unquote. And Seldonus explains that the Teraphim were built and composed after the possession of certain planets, those which the Greeks called Stoicheia, and according to figures that were located in the sky and called Alexeteroi, or the tutelary gods. Those who traced out the Stoicheia were called Stoicheomaticoi, or the diviners by the Stoicheia, from Dedis Sudis Teraf. Volume 2, page 31. Vidinfa, the Teraphim. It is in such sentences, however, in the Nabathean agriculture that have frightened the men of science and made them proclaim the work either an apocrypha or a fairy tale unworthy of the notice of an academician. At the same time, as shown, zealous Roman Catholics and Protestants tore it metaphorically to pieces, the former because it described the worship of demons, the latter because it is ungodly. They are all wrong once more. 
it is not a fairy tale, and as far as regards pious churchmen, the same worship may be shown in the scriptures, however disfigured by translation. Solar and lunar worship, as well as that of the stars and elements, are traced and figure in the Christian theology. Defended by papists, they are stoutly denied by the Protestants only at their own risk and peril. Two instances may be given. Amanius Marcellinus teaches that ancient divinations were always accomplished with the help of the spirits of the elements. Spiritus elementorum, and in Greek, pneumata ton stoicheon. But it is found now that the planets, the elements, and the zodiac were figured not only in Heliopolis by the twelve stones called Mysteries of the Elements, Elementorum Arcana, but also in a Solomon's Temple, and, as pointed out by various writers, in several old Italian churches, and even at Notre-Dame de Paris, where they can be seen to this day. No symbol, the sun included, was more complex in its manifold meanings than the lunar symbol. The sex was, of course, dual. With the summit was male, for example the Hindu king Soma, and the Chaldean Sin. With other nations, it was female, the beauteous goddess Diana Luna, Elithia, Lucina. In Tauris, human victims were sacrificed to Artemis, a form of the lunar goddess. The Cretans called her Dictina, and the Medes and Persians Anaitis, as shown by an inscription of Coloe, Artemidi Anaiti. But we are now concerned chiefly with the most chaste and pure of the virgin goddesses, Luna Artemis, to whom Pamphos was the first to give the surname of Caliste, and of whom Hippolytus wrote, Calista Polu Parfenon. See Pausanias, chapter 8, verses 35 and 8. This Artemis Lochia, the goddess that presided at conception and childbirth, see Iliad, Pausanias, etc., etc., is, in her functions, and as the triple hectate, the Orphic deity, the predecessor of the god of the rabbins and pre-Christian Kabbalists, and his lunar type. The goddess Trimorphos was the personified symbol of the various and successive aspects represented by the moon in each of her three phases, and this interpretation was already that of the Stoics. Why the Orphans explained the epithet Trimorphos by the three kingdoms of nature over which she reigned, Jealous, bloodthirsty, revengeful, and exacting, Hectate Luna is a worthy counterpart of the, quote, jealous God, unquote, of the Hebrew prophets. The whole riddle of the solar and lunar worship, as now traced in the churches, hangs indeed on this world-old mystery of lunar phenomena, the cruelty forces in the Queen of Night, that lie latent for modern science, but are fully active to the knowledge of Eastern adepts, explain well the thousand and one images under which the moon was represented by the ancients. It also shows how much more profoundly learned in the Selenic mysteries were the ancients than are now our modern astronomers. The whole pantheon of the lunar gods and goddesses, Nephis or Neith, Proserpina, Melitta, Sibele, Isis, Astarte, Venus, and Hectate, on the one hand, and Apollo, Dionysius, Adonis, Bacchus, Osiris, Artus, Tammuz, etc., etc., on the other, all show on the face of their names and titles those of sons and husbands of their mothers, their identity with the Christian trinity. In every religious system, the gods were made to merge their functions as father, son, and husband into one. And the goddesses were identified as a wife, mother, and sister of the male god, the former synthesizing the human attributes as the son, the giver of life, the latter merging all the other titles in the grand synthesis known as Maya, Maya, Maria, etc., a generic name. Maya in its false derivation, has come to mean with the Greeks mother, 
from the root ma, nurse, and even gave its name to the month of May, which was sacred to all those goddesses before it became consecrated to Mary. Note, the Roman Catholics are indebted for the idea of consecrating the month of May to the Virgin, to the pagan Plutarch, who shows that May is sacred to Maya, Maia, or Vesta, Alus Gellus, word Maya, our Mother Earth, or Nurse, a nourisher, personified, end of note. Its primitive meaning, however, was Maya, Durga, translated by the Orientalist as inaccessible, but meaning in truth the unreachable, in the sense of illusion and unreality, as being the source and cause of spells, the personification of illusion. In religious rites, the moon served a dual purpose. Personified as a female goddess for exoteric purposes, or as a male god in allegory and symbol, in occult philosophy our satellite was regarded as a sexless potency to be well studied, because it was to be dreaded. With the initiated Aryans, Chaldi, Greeks, and Romans, Soma sin Artemis Sotera, the hermaphrodite Apollo, whose attribute is the lyre, and the bearded Diana of the bow and arrow, Deus Lunus, and especially Osiris Lunus and Thot Lunus, were the occult potencies of the moon. Note, Thot Lunus is Buddha Soma of India, or Mercury and the Moon, or Mercury and the Moon, end of note. But whether male or female, whether Thot or Minerva, Soma or Astoreth, the moon is the occult mystery of mysteries, and more a symbol of evil than of good. Her seven phases, an original esoteric division, are divided into three astronomical phenomena, and four purely psychic phases. That the moon was not always reverenced is shown in the mysteries, in which the death of the moon god, the three phases of gradual waning and final disappearance, was allegorized by the moon standing for the genius of evil that triumphs for the time over the light and life-giving god, the sun, and all the skill and learning of the ancient hierophants in magic was required to turn this triumph into a defeat. It was the most ancient worship of all, that of the third race of our round, the hermaphrodites, to whom the male moon became sacred, when, after the fall, so-called, the sexes had become separated. Deus Lunus, then, became an androgyne, male and female in turn, to serve, finally, for purposes of sorcery, as a dual power, to the fourth root race, the Atlanteans. With the fifth, our own, the lunar solar worship divided the nations into two distinct antagonistic camps. It led to events described aeons later in the Mahabharatan war, which to the Europeans is fabulous, to the Hindus and occultists the historical, strife between the Suryavansas and the Indovansas. Originating in the dual aspect of the moon, the worship of the female and the male principles respectively, it ended in distinct solar and lunar cults. Among the Semitic races, the sun was for a very long time feminine and the moon masculine, the latter notion being adopted by them from the Atlantean traditions. The moon was called the Lord of the Sun, Belsemesh before the Semesh worship. Note, during that period which is absent from the Mosaic books, from the exile of Eden to the allegorical flood, the Jews worshipped with the rest of the Semites, Dionysi, the ruler of men, the judge or the son. Though the Jewish Canaan and Christianism have made the Son become the Lord God and Jehovah in the Bible, yet the latter is full of indiscreet traces of the androgyne deity, which was Jehovah the Son, and Astareth the Moon in its female aspect, and quite free from the present metaphorical element given to it. 
God is a consuming fire, appears in, and is encompassed by fire. It was not only in vision that Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 16, saw the Jews worshipping the sun. The Baal of the Israelites, the Shemes of the Moabites, and the Moloch of Ammonites, was the identical son Jehovah, and he is till now the king of the host of heaven. The sun, as much as Astareth, was the queen of heaven, or the moon. The sun of righteousness has become a metaphorical expression only now. End of note. The ignorance of the incipient reasons for such a distinction and of cult principles led the nations into anthropomorphic idol worship. But the religion of every ancient nation had been primarily based upon the occult manifestations of a purely abstract force or principle now called God. The very establishment of such worship shows, in its details and rites, that the philosophers who evolved those systems of nature, subjective and objective, possessed profound knowledge and were acquainted with many facts of a scientific nature. For besides being purely occult, the rites of lunar worship were based, as just shown, upon a knowledge of a physiology quite a modern science with us, psychology, sacred mathematics, geometry and metrology, and their right applications to symbols and figures, which are but glyphs recording observed natural and scientific facts, in short, upon a most minute and profound knowledge of nature. Lunar magnetism generates life, preserves, and kills it. Soma embodies the triple power of the Trimurti, though it passes unrecognized by the profane to this day. The allegory that makes Soma the moon produced by the churning of the ocean of life, space, by the gods in another Manvantara, that is, in a pre-genetic day of our planetary system, and that other allegory which shows the rishis milking the earth, whose calf was Soma, the moon, as a deep cosmographical meaning. For it is neither our earth which is milked, nor was the moon which we know the calf. Note. The earth flees for her life in the allegory before Prithu, who pursues her. She assumes the shape of a cow and, trembling with terror, runs away and hides even in the regions of Brahma. Therefore, it is not our earth. Again, in every Purana, the calf changes name. In one it is Manus Vayambhuva, in another Indra, in a third the Himavat, Himalayas itself, while Meru was the milker. This is a deeper allegory than one thinks. End of note. Had our wise men of science known as much of the mysteries of nature as the ancient Aryans did, they would surely never have imagined that the moon was projected from the earth. Once more, the oldest of permutations in Theogony, the son becoming his own father and the mother generated by the son, has to be remembered and taken into consideration if the symbolical language of the ancients is to be understood by us. Otherwise, mythology will be ever haunting the Orientalists as simply the disease which springs up at a peculiar stage of human culture, as Renouf gravely observes in a Hibert lecture. The ancients taught the, so to speak, auto-generation of the gods, the one divine essence, unmanifested, perpetually begetting a second self, manifested, which second self, androgynous in its nature, gives birth in an immaculate way to everything macro and microcosmical in this universe. This was shown in the circle and the diameter, or the sacred ten, a few pages back. But our Orientalists, their extreme desire to discover one homogeneous element in nature notwithstanding, will not see it, cramped in their researches by such ignorance, they, the Arianists and Egyptologists, 
are constantly led astray from truth in their speculations. Thus, de Roger is unable to understand, in the text which he translates, the meaning of Amun-Ra saying to King Aminophis, supposed to be Memnon, Thou art my son, I have begotten thee, and as he finds the same idea in many a text and under various forms, this very Christian Orientalist is finally compelled to exclaim that, for this idea to have entered the mind of a hierogrammatist, there must have been in their religion a more or less defined doctrine, indicating as a possible fact that might come to pass, a divine and immaculate incarnation under a human form. Precisely, but why throw the explanation on an impossible prophecy, when the whole secret is explained by the later religion copying the earlier? De Rouget still failed to account for and perceive what were the functions attributed to the feminine principle in that primordial generation. Note. His clear realization of it is that the Egyptians prophesied Jehovah, in brackets, exclamation mark, and his incarnated Redeemer, the good serpent, etc., etc., even to identifying Typhon with the wicked dragon of the Garden of Eden, and this passes as a serious and a sober science. End of note. He does not find it in the goddess Nath of Saiz. Yet he quotes the sentence of the commander to Cambyses when introducing that king into the Saitic temple. Quote, I made known to his majesty the dignity of Saiz, which is the abode of Nath, the great female producer, genitrix of the sun, who is the firstborn, and who is not begotten, but only brought forth, unquote. and hence is the fruit of an immaculate mother. How much more grandiose, philosophical and poetical, is the real distinction for whoever is able to understand and appreciate it, made between the immaculate virgin of the ancient pagans and the modern papal conception. With the former, the ever youthful mother nature, the antitype of her prototypes, the sun and moon, generates and brings forth her mind-born sun, the universe. The sun and moon, as male-female deities, fructify the earth, the microcosmical mother, and the latter conceives and brings forth in her turn. With the Christians, the firstborn, primogenitus, is indeed generated, that is, begotten, genitum non factum, and positively conceived and brought forth, virgo paricht, explains the Latin church. Thus she drags down the noble spiritual ideal of the Virgin Mary to the earth, and, making her of the earth earthly, degrades that ideal to the lowest of the anthropomorphic goddesses of the rabble. Truly, Nath, Isis, Diana, etc., etc., were each of them a demiurgical goddess, at once visible and invisible, having her place in heaven, and helping to the generation of species, the moon, in short. Her occult aspects and powers are numberless, and, in one of them, the moon becomes with the Egyptian Hathor, another aspect of Isis, and both of these goddesses are shown suckling horrors. Note, Hathor is the infernal's Isis, the goddess preeminently of the West, or the netherworld. End of note. Behold, in the Egyptian hall of the British Museum, Hathor worshipped by Pharaoh Totmes, who stands between her and the Lord of Heavens. The monolith was taken from Karnak, and the same goddess has the following legend inscribed on her throne, the Divine Mother and Lady, or Queen of Heaven, also the Morning Star, and the Light of the Sea, Stella Matutina, and Lux Maris. All the lunar goddesses had a dual aspect, one divine, the other infernal, all were the virgin mothers of an immaculately born son, the sun. Raoul Rocchetti shows the moon goddess of the Athenians, Pallas, or Cybele, Minerva, or again Diana, holding her child son in, on the lap, invoked in her festivals as Monogenes Feui, 
the one mother of God, sitting on a lion and surrounded by twelve personages, in whom the occultist recognizes the twelve great gods and the pious Christian orientalist the apostles, or rather the Greek and pagan prophecy thereof. They are both right, for the immaculate goddess of the Latin church is a faithful copy of the old pagan goddesses. The number twelve of the apostles is that of the twelve tribes, and the latter are a personification of the twelve great gods, and of the twelve signs of the zodiac. Every detail almost in the Christian dogma is borrowed from the heathens. Semele, the wife of Jupiter and the mother of Bacchus, the son, is, according to Anonus, also, quote, carried, unquote, or made to ascend to heaven after her death, where she presides between Mars and Venus, under the name of the Queen of the World, or the Universe, Panbasileia, at the names of which, as the names of Hathor, Hictate, and other infernal goddesses, quote, tremble all the demons, unquote. Note, this is de Merville, who proudly confesses the similarity, and he ought to know. End of note. Semilene tremensi daimones. This Greek inscription on a small temple, reproduced on a stone that was found by somebody, and copied by Montfaucon, as de Merville tells us. 113. Archaeologie de la Vierge Mère informs us of the stupendous fact that the magna mater of the old world was an impudent plagiarism perpetrated by the demon of the immaculate virgin mother of his church whether so or vice versa is of no importance that which is interesting to note is the perfect identity between the archaic copy and the modern original did space permit, we might show the inconceivable coolness and unconcern exhibited by certain followers of the Roman Catholic Church when made to face the revelations of the past. To Marie's remark that the Virgin took possession of the sanctuaries of Ceres and Venus, and that the pagan rite proclaimed and practiced in honor of those goddesses were in a good measure transferred to the mother of Christ, the advocate of Rome answers. Quote, that such is the fact, and that it is just as it should be, and quite natural, as the dogma, the liturgy, and the rites professed by the Roman Apostolical Church in 1862, are found engraved on monuments, inscribed on papyri and cylinders, hardly posterior to the deluge, he does seem impossible to deny the existence of a first anti-historical Roman Catholicism, of which our own is but the faithful continuation. But while the former was the culmination, the summum of the impudence of demons and goethic necromancy, the latter is divine. If in our Christian revelation, l'Apocalypse, Mary, clothed with the sun and having the moon under her feet, has nothing more in common with the humble servant of Nazareth. Sick! It is because she has now become the greatest of theological and cosmological powers in our universe. From Mercologie de la Vierge, pages 116 and 119, and by the Marquis de Merville. Verily so, since Pindar's hymns to Minerva, page 19, who sits at the right hand of her father Jupiter, and who is more powerful than all the other angels or gods, are likewise applied to the Virgin. It is Saint Bernard, who, quoted by Cornelius Alapid, is made to address the Virgin Mary in this wise, quote, The Son Christ lives in thee, and thou livest in him. Unquote. Sermon on the Holy Virgin Again the Virgin is admitted to be the moon by the same unsophisticated holy man. Being the Lucina of the church, that is, in a childbirth, the verse of Virgil, Casta fove Lucina, tus jam regnat Apollo, is applied to her. Like the moon, the Virgin is the queen of heaven, adds the innocent saint. Apocalypse chapter 12, commentary by Cornelius Alapid. This settles the question. 
the more similarity according to such writers as de Merville, there exists between the pagan conceptions and the christian dogmas the more divine appears the christian religion and the more is it seen to be the only truly inspired one especially in its roman catholic form the unbelieving scientists and the academicians who think they see in the latin church quite the opposite of divine inspiration and who will not believe in the satanic tricks of a plagiarism by anticipation are severely taken to ask but then quote, they believe in nothing and reject even the nabathean agriculture as a romance and a pack of superstitious nonsense unquote, complains the memorialist quote, in their perverted opinion Kutamis, idol of the moon, and the statue of the Madonna are one. Unquote. A noble marquis wrote twenty years ago six huge volumes, or as he calls them, memoirs, to the French Academy, with the sole object of showing Roman Catholicism an inspired and revealed faith. As a proof thereof, he furnishes numberless facts, all tending to show that the entire ancient world ever since the deluge had been with the help of the devil systematically plagiarizing the rites sermons and dogmas of the future holy church to be born ages later what would that faithful son of rome have said had he heard his co-religionist monsieur renouf the distinguished egyptologist of the british museum declaring in one of his learned lectures that quote, neither hebrews nor greeks borrowed any of their ideas from egypt unquote. note quoted in mr g mass's lecture End of note. but perhaps it is just this that m renouf intended to say namely that it is the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Aryans who borrowed theirs from the Latin Church. And if so, why, in the name of logic, do the Papists reject the additional information which the Orientalists may give them on moon worship, since it all tends to show their, the Roman Catholic, worship as old as the world of Sabaeanism and astrolatry? The reason of early Christian and later Roman Catholic astrolatry, or the symbolical worship of sun and moon, identical with that of the Gnostics, though less philosophical and pure than the sun worship of the Zoroastrians, is a natural consequence of its birth and origin. The adoption by the Latin Church of such symbols as the water, fire, sun, moon, and stars and a good many other things, is simply a continuation by the other Christians of the old worship of the pagan nations. Thus Odin got his wisdom, power, and knowledge by sitting at the feet of Mimir, the thrice-wise Jotun, who passed his life by the fountain of a primeval wisdom, the crystalline waters of which increased his knowledge daily. Mimir drew the highest knowledge from the fountain, because the world was born of water, hence primeval wisdom was to be found in that mysterious element, Osgord and the gods, page 86. The eye which Ovidin had to pledge to acquire that knowledge may be the sun which enlightens and penetrates all things, his other eye being the moon, whose reflection gazes out of the deep, and which at last, when setting, sinks into the ocean, from the same source. But it is something more besides this. Luke, the fire god, is said to have hidden in the water, as well as in the moon, the light giver, whose reflection he found therein. And this belief that the fire finds refuge in the water was not limited to the old Scandinavians. It was shared by all nations and was finally taken up by the early Christians, who symbolized the Holy Ghost under the shape of fire cloven tongues like as fire, the breath of the Father Son. This fire descends also into the water or the sea, Mar, Mary. The dove was the symbol of the soul with several nations. It was sacred to Venus, the goddess born from the sea foam, and it became later the symbol of the Christian Anima Mundi, or the Holy Spirit. One of the most occult chapters in the Book of the Dead is chapter 80, 
entitled to make the transformation into the god giving light to the path of darkness wherein woman light of the shadow serves tot in his retreat in the moon tot hermes is said to hide therein because he is the representative of the secret wisdom he is the manifested logos of its light side the concealed deity or dark wisdom when he is supposed to retire to the opposite hemisphere Speaking of her power, the moon calls herself repeatedly the light which shineth in darkness, the woman light. Hence it became the accepted symbol of all the virgin mother goddesses. As the wicked evil spirits warred against the moon in days of yore, so they are supposed to war now, without being able to prevail, however, against the actual queen of heaven, Mary the moon. Hence also the moon was intimately connected in all the pagan theogonies with the dragon, her eternal enemy, the virgin, or Madonna, standing on her feet. This because the head and tail of the dragon, which represent in Eastern astronomy to this day the ascending and descending nodes of the moon, were also symbolized in ancient Greece by the two serpents. Hercules kills them on the day of his birth and so does the babe in his virgin mother's arms. As Mr. Gerald Massey aptly observes in this connection, all such symbols figured their own facts from the first, and did not prefigure others of a total different order. The iconography, and dogmas too, had survived in Rome from a period remotely pre-Christian. There was neither forgery nor interpolation of types, nothing but a continuity of imagery with a perversion of its meaning. Next section is section 10. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis Part 2 the evolution of symbolism in its approximate order with explanatory sections section ten tree serpent and crocodile worship first a quote from de chateaubriand object of horror or of adoration men have for the serpent an implacable hatred or prostrate themselves before its genius thy calls it prudence claims it Envy carries it in its heart, and eloquence on its caduceus. In hell it arms the whip of the furious. In heaven eternity makes of it its symbol. Unquote. By de Chateaubriand. The Ophites asserted that there were several kinds of genii, from God to man, that the relative superiority of these was ruled by the degree of light that was accorded to each and they maintained that the serpent had to be constantly called upon and to be thanked for the signal service it had rendered humanity for it taught adam that if he ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil he would raise his being immensely by the learning and wisdom he would thus acquire such was the exoteric reason given it is easy to see whence the primal idea of this dual, Janus-like character of the serpent, the good and the bad. This symbol is one of the most ancient, because the reptile preceded the bird, and the bird the mammal. Thence the belief, or rather the superstition, of the savage tribes who think that the souls of their ancestors live under this form, and the general association of the serpent with the tree. The legends about the various things it represents are numberless, but as most of them are allegorical, they have now passed into the class of fables based on ignorance and dark superstition. For instance, when Philostratus narrates that the natives of India and Arabia fed on the heart and liver of serpents in order to learn the language of all the animals, the serpent being credited with that faculty, he certainly never meant his words to be accepted literally. See De Vita Apolloni, Libro 1, Chapter 14. As will be found more than once as we proceed, the serpent and dragon were the names given to the wise ones, 
the initiated adepts of olden times. It was their wisdom and their learning that were devoured or simulated by their followers, whence the allegory. When the Scandinavian Sigurd is fabled to have roasted the heart of Fafnir, the dragon whom he had slain, becoming thereby the wisest of men, it meant the same thing. Sigurd had become learned in the runes and magical charms. He had received the word from an initiate of that name or from a sorcerer, after which the latter died, as many do, after passing the word. Epiphanius let out the secret of the Gnostics while trying to expose their heresies. The Gnostic Ophites, he says, had a reason for honouring the serpent. It was because he taught the primeval men the mysteries. Verily so. But they did not have Adam and Eve in the garden in their minds when teaching this dogma, but simply that which is stated above. The Nagas of the Hindu and Tibetan adepts were human Nagas, serpents, not reptiles. Moreover, the serpent has ever been the type of a consecutive or serial rejuvenation of immortality and time. The numerous and extremely interesting readings, the interpretations and facts about serpent worship given in the natural genesis, are very ingenious and scientifically correct, but they are far from covering the whole of the meaning implied. They divulge only the astronomical and physiological mysteries with the addition of some cosmic phenomena. On the lowest plane of materiality the serpent was, no doubt, the great mystery in the mysteries, and was very likely adopted as a type of feminine pubescence, on account of its slowing and self-renewal. It was so, however, only with regard to mysteries concerning terrestrial animal life. For as a symbol of reclothing and rebirth in the universal mystery is its final phase, or shall we rather say its incipient and culminating phases, they were not of this plane. Note. See The Natural Genesis by Gerald Massey, Volume 1, page 340. End of note. They were generated in the pure realm of ideal light, and having accomplished the round of the whole cycle of adaptations and symbolism, the mysteries returned from whence they had come, into the essence of immaterial causality. They belonged to the highest gnosis, and surely this could have never obtained its name and fame solely on account of its penetration into physiological and especially feminine functions. As a symbol, the serpent had as many aspects and occult meanings as the tree itself, the tree of life, with which it was emblematically and almost indissolubly connected. Whether viewed as a metaphysical or physical symbol, the tree and serpent, jointly or separately, have never been so degraded by antiquity as they are now, in this our age of the breaking of idols, not for truth's sake, but to glorify the more gross matter. The revelations and interpretations in the rivers of life would have astounded the worshippers of the tree and serpent in the days of archaic Chaldean and Egyptian wisdom, and even the early Saivas would have recoiled in horror at the theories and suggestions of the author of the said work. The notion of pain at night and inman, that the cross or tau is simply a cup of the male organs in its triadic form is radically false, writes Mr. G. Massey who proves what he says. But this is a statement that could be as justly applied to almost to all the modern interpretations of ancient symbols. The natural genesis is a monumental work of research and thought, the most complete on that subject that has ever been published, covering as it does a wide field and explaining much more than all the symbologists who have hitherto written does not yet go beyond the psychotheistic stage of ancient thought. Nor were Payne, Knight, and Inman altogether wrong, except in entirely failing to see that their interpretations of the tree of life as the cross and phallus fitted the symbol and approximated it only on the lowest and last stage of the evolutionary development of the idea of the giver of life. It was the last and the grossest physical transformations of nature in animal, insect, bird, and even plant, for by own creative magnetism in the form of the attraction of the contraries or sexual polarization acts in the constitution of reptile and bird 
as it does in that of man. Moreover, the modern symbologists and orientalists, from first to last, being ignorant of the real mysteries revealed by occultism, can necessarily see but this last stage. If told that this mode of procreation, which the whole world of being has now in common on this earth, is but a passing phase, a physical means of furnishing the conditions to and producing the phenomena of life which will alter with this and disappear with the next root race, they would laugh at such a superstitious and unscientific idea. But the most learned occultists assert this because they know it. The universe of living beings, all of those which procreate the species, is the living witness to the various modes of procreation in the evolution of animal and human species and races. And the naturalist ought to sense this truth intuitionally, even though he is yet unable to demonstrate it. And how could he indeed with the present modes of thought? The landmarks of the archaic history of the past are few and scarce, and those that men of science come across are mistaken for finger-posts of our little era. Even so-called universal, in brackets question mark, history embraces but a tiny field in the almost boundless space of the unexplored regions of our latest fifth root race. Hence every fresh signpost Every new glyph of the hoary past that is discovered is added to the old stock of information to be interpreted on the same lines of pre-existing conceptions and without any reference to the special cycle of thought which that particular glyph may belong to. How can truth ever come to light if this method is never changed? Thus in the beginning of their joint existence as a glyph of immortal being, the tree and serpent were divine imagery, truly. The tree was reversed, and its roots were generated in heaven, and grew out of the rootless root of all being. Its trunk grew and developed, crossing the plains of Pleroma. It shot out crossways in its luxuriant branches, first on the plain of hardly differentiated matter, and then downward till they touched the terrestrial plain. Thus the Ashvata, tree of life and being, whose destruction alone leads to immortality, is said in the Bhagavad Gita to grow with its roots above its branches below. Chapter 15. The roots represent the supreme being, or first cause, the Logos, but one has to go beyond those roots to unite oneself with Krishna, who, says Arjuna, is, quote, greater than Brahman, the first cause, the indestructible, that which is, that which is not, and what is beyond them. Unquote. Its boughs are Hyayanagarbha, Brahma or Brahman, in its highest manifestations, say Shridara and Madhusudana, the highest Jankochans or Devas. The Vedas are its leaves. He only who goes beyond the roots shall never return, that is, shall reincarnate no more during this age of Brahma. It is only when its pure boughs had touched the terrestrial mud of the Garden of Eden, of our Adamic race, that this tree got soiled by the contact and lost its pristine purity, and that the serpent of eternity, the heaven-born Logos, was finally degraded. In days of old, of the divine dynasties on earth, the now dreaded reptile was regarded as the first beam of light that radiated from the abyss of divine mystery. Various were the forms which it was made to assume, and numerous the natural symbols adopted to it, as it crossed aeons of time, as from infinite time itself, Kala, it fell into the space and time evolved out of human speculation. These forms were cosmic and astronomical, theistic and pantheistic, abstract and concrete. They became in turn the polar dragon and the southern cross, the Alpha Draconis of the Pyramid, and the Hindu-Buddhist dragon, which ever threatens, yet never swallows the sun during its eclipses. Till then the tree remained evergreen, for it was sprinkled by the waters of life, the great dragon, ever divine, so long as it was kept within the precincts of the sidereal fields. 
but the tree grew, and its lower boughs touched at last the infernal regions, our earth. Then the great serpent, Need Hug, he who devours the corpses of the evildoers in the hall of misery, meaning human life, so soon as they are plunged into Vergelmir, the roaring cauldron of human passions, gnawed the wood tree. The worms of materiality covered the once healthy and mighty roots, and are now ascending higher and higher along the trunk, while the mead-gored snake coiled at the bottom of the seas, and circles the earth, and, through its venomous breath, makes her powerless to defend herself. They are all seven-headed, the dragons and serpents of antiquity, one head for each race, and every head with seven hairs on it as the allegory has it. A. from Anatta, the serpent of eternity which carries Vishnu through the Manvantara, from the original primordial Sesha, whose seven heads become one thousand heads in the Puranic fancy, down to the seven-headed Arcadian serpent. This typifies the seven principles throughout nature and man, the highest or middle head being the seventh. It is not of the Mosaic Jewish Sabbath that Philo speaks in his creation of the world, when saying that the world was completed, quote, according to the perfect nature of number six, unquote. For, quote, when that reason, nous, which is wholly in accordance with the number seven, has entered the soul, or rather the living body, the number six is thus arrested, and all the mortal things which that number makes, unquote. And again, number seven is the festival day of all the earth, the birthday of the world. I know not whether anyone would be able to celebrate the number seven in adequate terms. See pages 30 and 419 of Philo's work. The author of the Natural Genesis thinks that the septenary of stars seen in the great bear, the Septasis, and seven-headed dragon furnish a visible origin for the symbolic seven of time above. The goddess of the seven stars, he adds, was the mother of time as Kep, whence Kepti and Septi for the two times and number seven. So this is the star of the seven by name. Sevict, Cronus, the son of the goddess, has the name of the seven or seventh. So has Sefik, Abu, who builds the house on high, as Wisdom Sophia built hers with seven pillars. The primary current types were seven, and thus the beginning of time in heaven is based on the number and the name of seven, on account of the starry demonstrators. The seven stars, as they turned round annually, kept pointing, as it were, with the forefinger of the right hand and describing a circle in the upper and lower heaven. Note. For the same reason the division of the principles in man into seven are thus reckoned as they describe the same circle in the human high and lower nature. End of note. The number seven naturally suggested a measure by seven that led to what may be termed sevening, and to the marking and mapping out of the circle in seven corresponding divisions which were assigned to the seven great constellations, and thus was formed the celestial heptanomies of Egypt in the heavens. When the stellar heptanomies was broken up and divided into four quarters, it was multiplied by four, and the twenty-eight signs took the place of the primary seven constellations, the lunar zodiac of twenty-eight days being the registered result. Note. Thus, the septenary division is the oldest and preceded the fourfold division. It is the root of archaic classification. End of note. In the Chinese arrangement, the four sevens are given to four genii that precede over the four cardinal points. In Chinese Buddhism and Esotericism, the genii are represented by four dragons, the Maharajas of the stanzas. The seven northern constellations make up the black warrior. The seven eastern Chinese autumn constitute the white tiger. The seven southern are the vermilion bird, and the seven Western, called Vernal, are the Azure Dragon. Each of these four spirits presides over its heptanomis during one lunar week. The generative of the first heptanomis, Typhon of the Seven Stars, now took a lunar character. In this phase we find the goddess Sefik, whose name signifies number seven. 
is the feminine word or logos in place of the mother of time, who was the earliest word as goddess of the seven stars. See Typology of Time, Volume Two, Page Three Hundred and Thirteen. The author shows that it was the goddess of the great bear and mother of time who was in Egypt from the earliest times the living word, and that Sevek Cronus, whose type was the crocodile dragon, the pre-planetary form of Saturn, was called her son and consort. He was her word logos. Page three hundred twenty-eight of Volume One. The above is quite plain. But it was not the knowledge of astronomy only that led the ancients to the process of the sevening. The primal cause goes far deeper and will be explained in its place. The above quotations are no digressions; they are brought forward as showing a the reason why a full initiate was called a dragon, a snake, a naga, and b that our septenary division was used by the priests of the earliest dynasties in Egypt. For the same reason and on the same basis as by us, this needs further elucidation. However, as already stated, that which Mr. G. Massey calls the four genii or the four cardinal points, and the Chinese the black warrior, white tiger, vermilion bird, and azure dragon, is called in the sacred books the four hidden dragons of wisdom, and the celestial nagas. Now, as shown, the seven-headed or septenary dragon logos had been, in course of time, split up, so to speak, into four heptonomic parts or twenty-eight portions. Each lunar week has a distinct occult character in the lunar month. Each day of the twenty-eight has its special characteristics, as each of the twelve constellations, whether separately or in combination with other signs, has an occult influence either for good or for evil. This represents the sum of knowledge that men can acquire on this earth. Yet few are those who acquire it, and still fewer are the wise men who get to the root of knowledge, symbolized by the great root dragon, the spiritual logos of these visible signs. But those who do receive the name of dragons, and they are the arhats of the four truths of the twenty-eight faculties, or attributes, and have always been so called. The Alexandrian Neoplatonists asserted that to become real Chaldees or Magi, one had to master the science or knowledge of the periods of the seven rectors of the world, in whom is all wisdom. In Proclus in Timaeus, Book One, Jamblichus is credited with another version, which does not, however, alter the meaning. He says that. The Assyrians have not only preserved the records of seven and twenty myriads of years, as Hipparchus says they have, but likewise of the whole epochastices and periods of the seven rulers of the world. The legends of every nation and tribe, whether civilized or savage, point to the one universal belief in the great wisdom and cunning of the serpents. They are charmers. They hypnotize the bird with their eye, and the man himself very often does not feel above the fascinating influence. Therefore, the symbol is a most fitting one. The crocodile is the Egyptian dragon. It was the dual symbol of heaven and earth, of sun and moon, and was made sacred in consequence of its amphibious nature to Osiris and Isis, according to Eusebius. The Egyptians represented the sun in a ship as its pilot. This ship being carried along by a crocodile to show the motion of the sun in the moist, meaning space, the crocodile was moreover the symbol of Egypt herself, the lower as being the more swampy of the two countries. The alchemists claim another interpretation; they say that the symbol of the sun in the ship on the ether of space meant that the hermetic matter is the principle or basis of gold, or again. The philosophical sun, the water within which the crocodile is swimming, is that water or matter made liquid. The ship herself, finally, representing the vessel of nature in which the sun or the sulphuric igneous principle acts as a pilot, because it is the sun which conducts the work by his action upon the moist or mercury. The above is only for the alchemists. The serpent became the type and symbol of evil and of the devil only during the Middle Ages. 
The early Christians, besides the Ophite Gnostics, had the Geologos, the Good and the Bad Serpent, the Agathodemon and the Cacodemon. This is demonstrated by the writings of Marcus, Valentinus, and many others, and especially in Pistis Sophia, certainly a document of the earliest centuries of Christianity. On the marble sarcophagus of a tomb discovered in 1852 near the Porta Pia, one sees the scene of the adoration of the Magi, or else, remarks the late C. W. King in The Gnostics, the prototype of that scene, the birth of the new sun, that is sun, S-U-N. The mosaic floor exhibited a curious design, which might have represented either A. Isis suckling the babe Harpocrates, or B. The Madonna nursing the infant Jesus. In the smaller sarcophagi that surrounded the larger one, eleven leaden plates rolled like scrolls were found, three of which had been uh, deciphered. The contents of these ought to be regarded as final proof of a much vexed question, for they show that either the early Christians up to the sixth century were bona fide pagans, or that dogmatic Christianity was borrowed wholesale and passed in full into the Christian church, sun, tree, serpent, crocodile, and all. A quote from King's Gnostics, page 366. On the first is seen Anubis holding out a scroll. At his feet are two female busts. Below all are two serpents entwined, a corpse swathered up like a mummy. In the second scroll is Anubis holding out a cross, the sign of life. Under his feet lies the corpse encircled in the numerous folds of a huge serpent, the Agatodaemon, guardian of the deceased. In the third scroll Anubis bears on his arm the outline of a complete Latin cross. At the god's foot is a rhomboid, the Egyptian egg of the world, towards which crawls a serpent coiled into a circle. Under the busts is the letter Omega, repeated seven times in a line reminding one of the, quote, names, unquote. Very remarkable also is the line of characters, apparently palmarine, upon the legs of the first Anubis. As for the figure of the serpent, supposing these talismans to emanate not from the Isiac, but the newer Ophite creed, it may well stand for that true and perfect serpent, who leads forth the souls of all that put their trust in him out of the Egypt of the body, and through the Red Sea of death into the land of promise, saving them on their way from the serpents of the wilderness, that is, from the rulers of the stars. Unquote. From Kings Gnostics, page 366. And this true and perfect serpent is the seven-lettered God, who is now credited with being Jehovah, and Jesus one with him. To this seven-vowed God, the candidate for initiation is sent by Christos in the Pistis Sophia, a work earlier than St. John's Revelation, and evidently of the same school. The serpent of the seven thunders uttered these seven vowels, but seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not, says Revelation. Do ye seek after these mysteries? inquires Jesus in Pistis Sophia. No mystery is more excellent than they, the seven vowels, for they shall bring your souls unto the light of lights, that is, true wisdom. Nothing, therefore, is more excellent than the mysteries which ye seek after, saving only the mystery of the seven vowels and their forty and nine powers and the numbers thereof. In India it was the mystery of the seven fires and their forty-nine fires or aspects, or the members thereof, just the same. These seven vowels are represented by the swastika signs on the crowns of the seven heads of the serpent of eternity in India among esoteric Buddhists, in Egypt, in Chaldea, etc., etc., and among the initiates of every other country. It is on the seven zones of post-mortem ascent, in the hermetic writings, that the, quote, mortal, unquote, leaves on each one of his, quote, souls, unquote, or principles, until arrived on the plane of above all zones, he remains as the great formless serpent of absolute wisdom, 
or the deity itself. The seven-headed serpent has more than one signification in the arcane teachings. It is the seven-headed Draco, each of whose heads a star of the lesser bear, but it was also, and preeminently, the serpent of darkness, that is, inconceivable and incomprehensible, whose seven heads were the seven Logui, the reflections of the one and first manifested light, the universal Logos. Next section is section 11, Demon est Deus in Versus. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Part 2. The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order, with Explanatory Sections. Section 11. Demonist Deus in Versus. This symbological sentence, in its many-sided forms, is certainly most dangerous and iconoclastic in the face of all the dualistic later religions, or rather theologies, and especially so in the light of Christianity. Yet it is neither just nor correct to say that it is Christianity which has conceived and brought forth Satan, as an, quote, adversary, unquote, the opposing power required by the equilibrium and harmony of things in nature, like shadow to throw off still brighter the light, like night to bring into greater relief the day, and like cold to make one appreciate the more the comfort of heat. Satan has ever existed. Homogeneity is one and indivisible, but if the uh, homogeneous one and absolute is no mere figure of speech, and if heterogeneity in its dualistic aspect is its offspring, its bifurcus shadow or reflection, then even that divine homogeneity must contain in itself the essence of both good and evil. If, quote, God, unquote, is absolute, infinite, and the universal root of all, and everything in nature and its universe, whence comes evil, or de evil, if not from the same golden womb of the absolute? Thus we are forced either to accept the emanation of good and evil, of Agathodamon and Cacodamon as offshoots from the same trunk of the tree of being, or to resign ourselves to the absurdity of believing in two eternal absolutes. Having to trace the origin of the idea to the very beginnings of human mind, it is but just, meanwhile, to give his due even to the proverbial devil. Antiquity knew of no isolated, thoroughly and absolutely bad god of evil. Pagan thought represented good and evil as twin brothers, born from the same mother, nature. So soon as that thought ceased to be archaic, wisdom too became philosophy. In the beginning the symbols of good and evil were mere abstractions, light and darkness, then their types became chosen among the most natural and ever recurrent periodical cosmic phenomena, the day and the night, or the sun and moon. Then the hosts of the solar and lunar deities were made to represent them, and the dragon of darkness was contrasted with the dragon of light. See stanzas 5 and 7 of Book 1. The host of Satan is the son of God, no less than the host of the Bni Alchim, these children of God coming to present themselves before the Lord, their father. See Job 2. The sons of God became the fallen angels only after perceiving that the daughters of men were fair. Genesis chapter 6. In the Indian philosophy, the Suras are among the earliest and the brightest gods, and became Asuras only when dethroned by a Brahminical fancy. Satan never assumed an anthropomorphic, individualized shape until the creation by man of a one living, personal God had been accomplished, and then merely as a matter of prime necessity. A screen was needed, 
a scapegoat to explain the cruelty, blunders, and but too evident injustice perpetrated by him for whom absolute perfection, mercy, and goodness were claimed. This was the first comic effect of abandoning a philosophical and logical pantheism to build as a prop for lazy man, quote, a merciful father in heaven, unquote, whose daily and hourly actions as natura naturans, the comely mother but stone cold, belie the assumption. This led to the primal twins, Osiris Typhon, Ormas Ahriman, and finally Cain Abel and the Tutiquanti of Contraries. Having commenced by being synonymous with the nature, quote, God, unquote, the creator, ended by being made its author. Pascal settles the difficulty very cunningly. Nature has perfections in order to show that she is the image of God, and defects in order to show that she is only his image, he says. The further back one recedes into the darkness of the prehistoric ages, the more philosophical does the prototypic figure of the later Satan appear. The first, quote, adversary, unquote, in individual human form that one meets with in the old Puranic literature is one of her greatest rishis and yogis, Narada, surnamed the Strife Maker. And he is a Brahmaputra, a son of Brahma, the male. But of him later on, who the great deceiver really is, one can ascertain by searching for him with open eyes and an unprejudiced mind in every old cosmogony and scripture. It is the anthropomorphized demiurge, the creator of heaven and earth, when separated from the collective hosts of his fellow creators, whom, so to speak, he represents and synthesizes. It is now the god of theologies. The thought is father to the wish. Once upon a time a philosophical symbol left to perverse human fancy, afterwards fashioned into a fiendish, deceiving, cunning and jealous god. Dragons and other fallen angels being described in other parts of this work, a few words upon the much slandered Satan will be sufficient. That which the student will do well to remember is that, with every people except the Christian nations, the devil is to this day no worse an entity than the opposite aspect in the dual nature of the so-called creator. This is only natural. One cannot claim God as the synthesis of the whole universe, as omnipresent and omniscient and infinite, and then divorce him from evil. As there is far more evil than good in the world, it follows on logical grounds that either God must include evil, or stand as the direct cause of it, or else surrender his claims to absoluteness. The ancients understood this so well that their philosophers, now followed by the Kabbalists, defined evil as the lining of God or good, demon est deus in versus, being a very old adage. Indeed, evil is but an antagonizing blind force in nature. It is reaction, opposition, and contrast, evil for some, good for others. There is no malum in se, only the shadow of light, without which light could have no existence, even in our perceptions. If evil disappeared, good would disappear along with it from earth. The old dragon was pure spirit before he became matter, passive before he became active. In the Syro-Chaldean magic, both Ophis and Ophiomorphos are joined in the zodiac at the sign of the androgyne Virgo Scorpio. Before its fall on earth, the quote, serpent unquote, was Ophis Christos, and after its fall it became Ophiomorphos Christos. Everywhere the speculations of the Kabbalists treat of evil as a force, which is antagonistic, but at the same time essential to good as given it vitality and existence, which it could never have otherwise. There would be no life possible, in the Mayavic sense, without death, nor regeneration and reconstruction without destruction. Plants would perish in eternal sunlight, and so would man, 
who would become an automaton without the exercise of his free will and aspirations after that sunlight, which would lose its being and value for him had he nothing but light. Good is infinite and eternal only in the eternally concealed from us, and this is why we imagine it eternal. On the manifested planes, one equilibrates the other. Few are those theists and believers in a personal God who do not make of Satan the shadow of God, or who, confounding both, do not believe that they have a right to pray to that idol, asking its help and protection for the exercise and impunity of their evil and cruel deeds. Lead us not into temptation, is addressed daily to our Father which art in heaven, and not to the devil, by millions of human Christian hearts. They do so, repeating the very words put in the mouth of their Saviour, and do not give one thought to the fact that their meaning is contradicted point-blank by James, the brother of the Lord. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. From James 1.13 why then say that it is the devil who tempts us, when the church teaches us on the authority of Christ that it is God who does so? Open any pious volume in which the word temptation is defined in its theological sense, and forthwith you find two definitions. One, those afflictions and troubles whereby God tries his people. Two, those means and enticements which the devil makes use of to ensnare and allure mankind. St. James 1, verse 2, 12, and Matthew 6, verse 13. If accepted literally, the two teachings of Christ and James contradict each other, and what dogma can reconcile the two if the occult meaning is rejected? Between the alternative allurements, Wise will be that philosopher who will be able to decide where God disappears to make room for the devil. Therefore, when we read that the devil is a liar and the father of it, that is, incarnate lie, and are told in the same breath that Satan, the devil, was the son of God and the most beautiful of his archangels, rather than believe that father and son are a gigantic, personified, and eternal lie, we prefer to turn to pantheism and to pagan philosophy for information. Once that the key to Genesis is in our hands, it is the scientific and symbolical Kabbalah which unveils the secret. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical, and so are Jehovah and Cain one. That Cain who is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God. Jehovah tempts the king of Israel to number the people, and Satan tempts him to do the same in another place. Jehovah turns into the fiery serpents to bite those he is displeased with, and Jehovah informs the brazen serpent that heals them. These short and seemingly contradictory statements in the Old Testament, contradictory because the two powers are separated instead of being regarded as the two faces of one and the same thing, are the echoes distorted out of recognition by exotericism and theology of the universal and philosophical dogmas in nature so well understood by the primitive sages. We find the same groundwork in several personifications in the Puranas, only far more ample and philosophically suggestive. Thus, Pulastya, a son of God, one of the first progeny, is made the progenitor of demons, the Rakshasas, the tempters and the devourers of men. Pisaka, female demon, is a daughter of Daksha, the son of God too, and the mother of all the Pisakas, Padma Purana. The demons, so called in the Puranas, are very extraordinary devils when judged from the standpoint of European and Orthodox views about these creatures, since all of them, Danavas, Daityas, Pisakas, and the Rakshasas, are represented as extremely pious following the precepts of the Vedas, some of them even being great yogis. But they oppose the clergy and ritualism, sacrifices and forms, just what the full-blown yogins do to this day in India, and are no less respected for it, though they are allowed to follow neither caste nor ritual. Hence all those Puranic giants and titans are called devils. 
The missionaries, ever on the watch to show, if they can, the Hindu traditions no better than a reflection of the Jewish Bible, have evolved a whole romance on the alleged identity of, of Pulastia with Cain, and of the Rakshasas with the Cainites, the accursed, the cause of the Noachian deluge. See the work of Abbe Guaresio, who, quote, etymologizes, unquote, Pulastia's name as meaning the rejected, hence Cain, if you please. Pulastia dwells in Kedara, he says, which means a dug-up place, a mine, and Cain is shown in tradition and the Bible as the first worker in metals and a miner thereof. While it is very probable that the Giborim, the giants of the Bible, are the Rakshasas of the Hindus, it is still more certain that both are Atlanteans and belong to the submerged races. However it may be, no Satan could be more persistent in slandering his enemy or more spiteful in his hatred than the Christian theologians are in cursing him as the father of every evil. Compare their vituperations and opinions given about the devil with the philosophical views of the Puranic sages and their Christ-like masuitude. When Parasara, whose father was devoured by Rakshasa, was preparing himself to destroy magically the whole race, his grandsire, Vasishta, says a few extremely suggestive words to him. He shows the irate sage, on his own confession, that there is evil and karma, but no evil spirits. Let thy wrath be appeased, he says. The Rakshasas are not culpable. Thy father's death was the work of karma. Anger is the passion of fools. It becometh not a wise man. By whom, it may be asked, is any one killed? Every man reaps the consequences of his own acts. Anger, my son, is the destruction of all that man obtains and prevents the attainment of emancipation. The sages shun wrath. Be not thou, my child, subject to its influence. Let not those unoffending spirits of darkness be consumed. Let thy sacrifice cease. Mercy is the might of the righteous. Vishnu Puranya, Book 1, Chapter 1 Thus, every such, quote, sacrifice, unquote, or prayer to God for help, is no better than an act of black magic. That which Parasara prayed for was the destruction of the spirits of darkness for his personal revenge. He is called a pagan, and the Christians have doomed him as such to eternal hell. Yet, in what respect is the prayer of sovereigns and generals who pray before every battle for the destruction of their enemy any better? Such a prayer is, in every case, black magic of the worst kind, concealed like a demon, Mr. Hyde, under a sanctimonious Dr. Jekyll. In human nature, evil denotes only the polarity of matter and spirit, a struggle for life between the two manifested principles in space and time, which principles are one per se, inasmuch they are rooted in the absolute. In cosmos, the equilibrium must be preserved. The operations of the two countries produce harmony, like the centripetal and centrifugal forces, which are necessary to each other, mutually interdependent, in order that both should live. If one is arrested, the action of the other will become immediately self-destructive. Since the personification called Satan has been amply analyzed from its triple aspect in the Old Testament Christian theology and the ancient Gentile attitude of thought, those who would learn more of it refer to Volume 2 of Isis Unveiled, Chapter 10. See also several sections in Book 2, Part 2 of this work. The present subject is touched upon and fresh explanations attempted for a very good reason. Before we can approach the evolution of physical and divine man, we have first to master the idea of cyclic evolution, to acquaint ourselves with the philosophies and beliefs of the four races which preceded our present race, to learn what were the ideas of those titans and giants, giants verily, mentally as well as physically. The whole of antiquity was imbued with that philosophy which teaches the involution of spirit into matter, the progressive downward cyclic descent, or active self-conscious evolution. 
the Alexandrian Gnostics have sufficiently divulged the secret of initiations, and their records are full of, quote, the sliding down of aeons, unquote, in their double qualification of angelic beings and periods, the one the natural evolution of the other. On the other hand, oriental traditions on both sides of the black water, the oceans that separate the two Easts, are as full of allegories about the downfall of Peroma, of that of the gods and divas. One and all, they allegorized and explained the fall as the desire to learn and acquire knowledge, to know. This is the natural sequence of mental evolution, the spiritual becoming transmuted into the material or physical. The same law of descent into materiality and reascent into spirituality asserted itself during the Christian era, the reaction having stopped only just now in our own special sub-race. That which, perhaps ten millenniums ago, was allegorized in Pimander in a triune character of interpretation, meant as a record of an astronomical, anthropological, and even alchemical fact namely, the allegory of the seven rectus breaking through the seven circles of fire, was dwarfed into one material and anthropomorphic interpretation, the rebellion and fall of the angels. Their multivocal, profoundly philosophical narrative, under its poetical form of the marriage of heaven with earth, the love of nature for divine form, and the heavenly man enraptured with his own beauty mirrored in nature, that is, spirit attracted into matter, has now become, under theological handling, the, quote, the seven rectors disobeying Jehovah, self-admiration generating satanic pride, followed by their fall, Jehovah permitting no worship to be lost save upon himself, unquote. In short, the beautiful planet angels, the glorious cyclic aeons of the ancients, became henceforward synthesized in their most orthodox shape in Samael, the chief of the demons in the Talmud. Quote, that great serpent with twelve wings that draws down after himself in his fall, the solar system or the titans. Unquote. Bashkemal, the alter ego and the Sabean type of Samuel meant, in its philosophical and esoteric aspect, the quote year, unquote, in its astrological evil aspect, its twelve months, or wings, of unavoidable evils in nature, and in esoteric theogony, see Trollson in Nabathean Agriculture, volume 2, page 217, both Schemel and Samuel represented a particular divinity, where the Kabbalists, they are the spirit of the earth, the personal god that governs it, identical de facto with Jehavu. For the Talmudists admit themselves that Samael is a god name of one of the seven Elohim. The Kabbalists, moreover, show the two, Shemuel and Samael, as a symbolical form of Saturn, Kronos, the twelve wings standing for the twelve months, and the symbol in its collectivity representing a racial cycle. Jehovah and Saturn are also glyphically identical. This leads, in its turn, to a very curious deduction from a Roman Catholic dogma. Many renowned writers belonging to the Latin Church admit that a difference exists and should be made between the Uranian Titans, the antediluvian giants, also Titans, and those post-diluvian giants in whom they, the Roman Catholics, will see the descendants of the mythical Ham. In clear words, there is a difference to be made between the cosmic, primordial opposing forces guided by cyclic law, the Atlantean human giants, and the post-Diluvian great adepts, whether of the right or the left hand. At the same time, they showed that Michael, quote, the generalissimus of the fighting celestial host, the bodyguard of Jehovah, unquote, as it would seem, si de merveille, is also a titan only with the adjective of divine before the cognomen. Thus those, quote, Uranides, unquote, who are called everywhere divine titans, and who, having rebelled against Kronos, Saturn, and therefore also shown to be the enemies of Samael, an Elohim also and synonymous with Jehovah in his collectivity, 
are identical with Michael and his host. In short, the roles are reversed, all the combatants are confused, and no student is able to distinguish clearly which is which. Esoteric explanation may, however, bring some order into this confusion, in which Jehovah becomes Saturn, and Michael and his army, Satan, and the rebellious angels, owing to the indiscreet endeavors of the two faithful zealots to sin every pagan god, the devil. The true meaning is far more philosophical, and the legend of the first fall of the angels assumes a scientific coloring when correctly understood. Kronos stands for endless, hence immovable, duration, without beginning, without an end, beyond divided time and beyond space. Those, quote, angels, unquote, genii, or divas, who were born to act in space and time, that is, to break through the seven circles of the super-spiritual planes into the phenomenal or circumscribed super-terrestrial regions, are said allegorically to have rebelled against Kronos and fought that then one living and highest God. In his turn, when Cronus is represented as mutilating Uranus, his father, the meaning of this mutilation is very simple. Absolute time is made to become the finite and the conditioned. A portion is robbed from the whole, thus showing that Saturn, the father of the gods, has been transformed from eternal duration into a limited period. Cronus cuts down with his scythe, even the longest and to us seemingly endless cycles, yet for all that limited in eternity and puts down with the same scythe the mightiest rebels. A. Not one will escape the scythe of time. Praise the god or gods or flout, one or both, and that scythe will not be made to tremble one millionth of a second in its ascending or descending course. The titans of Hesiod's Theogony were copied in Greece from the Suras and Asuras of India. These Hesiodic titans, the Uranides, numbered once upon a time as only six, having been recently discovered to be seven, the seventh being called Phoric, in an old fragment relating to the Greek myth. Thus their identity with the seven rectors is fully demonstrated. The origin of the war in heaven and the fall has, in our mind, to be traced unavoidably to India, and perhaps far earlier than the Puranic accounts thereof. For Taramaya was in a later age, and there are three accounts, each of a distinct war, to be traced in almost Eric cosmogony. The first war happened in the night of time, between the gods, the Asuras, and lasted for the period of one Quote, divine year, unquote. Note, one day of Brahma lasting four billion three hundred and twenty million years. Multiply this by three hundred and sixty-five. The Asuras here, no gods, but demons, are still Suras, gods high in hierarchy than such secondary gods as are not even mentioned in the Vedas. The duration of the war shows its significance, and that they are only the personified cosmic powers. It is evidently for sectarian purposes and out of odium theologicum that the elusive form assumed by Vishnu Mayamur was attributed in later rearrangements of old texts to himself. He also fancied he found an allusion to Buddhism in Bhagavad Gita, whereas, as proven by K. T. Telank, he had only confused the Buddhists and the older Charvaka materialists. The version exists nowhere in other Puranas, if the inference does, as Professor Wilson claims, in the Vishnu Purana, the translation of which, especially of Book 3, Chapter 18 where the reverend orientalist arbitrarily introduces Buddha and shows him teaching Buddhism to Daityas, led to another, quote, great war, unquote, between himself and Colonel Fanz Kennedy. The latter charged him publicly and willfully, distorting Puranic texts. I affirm, wrote the Colonel at Bombay in 1840, that the Puranas do not contain what Professor Wilson has stated is contained in them. Until such passages are produced, I may be allowed to repeat my former conclusions, that Professor Wilson's opinion, that the Puranas as now extant, and compilations made between the 8th and 17th centuries, Anno Domine, 
rests solely on gratuitous assumptions and unfounded assertions, and that his reasoning in support of it is either futile, fallacious, contradictory, or improbable. See Vishnupurana, translated by Wilson, edition by Fitz Edward Hall, Volume 5, Appendix. End of note. On this occasion, the deities were defeated by the Daityas, under the leadership of Hrada. After that, owing to a device of Vishnu, to whom the conquered gods applied for help, the latter defeated the Asuras. In the Vishnu Purana, no interval is found between the two wars. In the esoteric doctrine, one war takes place before the building of the solar system, another on earth at the, quote, creation, unquote, of man, and a third, quote, war, unquote, is mentioned as taking place at the close of the fourth race, between its adepts and those of the fifth race, that is, between the initiates of the sacred island and the sorcerers of Atlantis. We shall notice the first contest, as recounted by Parashara, while trying to separate the two accounts purposely blended together. It is there stated that as the Daityas and Asuras were engaged in the duties of their respective orders, Varna, and followed the path prescribed by holy writ, practising also religious penance, a queer employment for demons, if they are identical with our devils, as it is claimed. It was impossible for the gods to destroy them. The prayers addressed by the gods to Vishnu are curious as showing the ideas involved in an anthropomorphic deity. Having, after their defeat, quote, fled to the northern shore of the Milky Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, the discomfited gods address many supplications to the first of beings, the divine Vishnu, and among others this one, Glory to thee, who art one with the saints, whose perfect nature is ever blessed. Glory to thee, who art one with the serpent race, double-tongued, impetuous, cruel, insatiate of enjoyment, and abounding with wealth. Glory to thee, O Lord, who hast neither colour, nor extension, nor size, Ghana, nor any predictable qualities, and whose essence, Rupa, purest of the pure, is appreciable only by holy Paramarshi, greatest of sages or rishis. We bow to thee in the nature of Brahma, uncreated, undecaying Avyaya, who art in our bodies, and in all other bodies, and in all living creatures, and beside whom nothing exists. We glorify that Vasudeva, the Lord of all, who is without soil, the seed of all things, exempt from dissolution, unborn, eternal, being in essence Parampadatmavat, beyond the condition of spirit and in essence and substance, Rupa, the whole of this universe. From Book 3, Chapter 17, Vishnu Purana. Note on the northern shore of the Milky Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. This statement belongs to the Third War, since the terrestrial continents, seas and rivers are mentioned in connection with it. End of note. The above is quoted as an illustration of the vast field offered by the Puranas to adverse and erroneous criticism by every European bigot who forms an estimate of an alien religion on mere external evidence. Any man accustomed to subject what he reads to thoughtful analysis will see at a glance the incongruity of addressing the accepted unknowable, the formless, and attributeless absolute such as the Vedantins define Brahma as being, quote, one with the serpent race, double-tongued, cruel, and insatiable, unquote, thus associating the abstract with the concrete, and bestowing adjectives on that which is freed from any limitations and conditionless. Even Dr. Wilson, who, after living surrounded by Brahmins and Pundits in India for so many years, ought to have known better. Even that scholar lost no opportunity to criticize the Hindu scriptures on this account. Thus he exclaims, Note, in Book 1, Chapter 17, 
narrating the story of Pralada, the son of Hiranyakasipu, the Puranic Satan, the great enemy of Vishnu, and the king of the three worlds in whose heart Vishnu entered. End of note. Quote, the Puranas constantly teach incompatible doctrines. According to this passage, the Supreme Being is not the inert cause of creation only, but exercises the functions of an active providence. The commentator quotes a text of the Veda in support of this view. Universal soul entering into men governs their conduct. Incongruities, however, are as frequent in the Vedas as in the Puranas. Unquote. Less frequent in sober truth than in the Mosaic Bible. But prejudice is great in the hearts of our Orientalists, especially in those of reverent scholars. Universal soul is not the inert cause of creation or para Brahma, but simply that which we call the sixth principle of intellectual cosmos on the manifested plane of being. It is Mahat, or Mahabuddhi, the great soul, the vehicle of spirit, the first primeval reflection of the former's cause, and that which is even beyond spirit. So much for Professor Wilson's uncalled for fling. As for the apparently incongruous appeal to Vishnu by the defeated gods, the explanation is there, in the text of Vishnu Purana, if Orientalists would only notice it. Note. This ignorance is truly and beautifully expressed in the praise of the yogins to Brahma, the upholder of the earth, in Book 1, Chapter 4 of Vishnu Purana, when they say, Those who have not practiced devotion conceive erroneously of the nature of the world. The ignorant who do not perceive that this universe is of the nature of wisdom and judge of it as an object of a perception only, are lost in the ocean of spiritual ignorance. But they who know true wisdom, and whose minds are pure, behold this whole world as one with divine knowledge, as one with thee, O God. Be favorable, O universal spirit. End of note. There is Vishnu as Brahma, and Vishnu in his two aspects, philosophy teaches. There is but one Brahma, essentially, prakriti and spirit, etc. Therefore, it is not Vishnu, the inert cause of creation, which exercised the functions of an active providence, but the universal soul, that which life as Levi calls astral light in its material aspect. And this, quote, soul, unquote, is, in its dual aspect of spirit and matter, the true anthropomorphic god of the theists, as this god is a personification of that universal creative agent, pure and impure both, owing to its manifested condition and differentiation in this myavic world, god and devil, truly. But Dr. Wilson failed to see how Vishnu, in this character, closely resembles the Lord God of Israel, especially in his policy of deception, temptation, and cunning. In the Vishnu Purana this is made as plain as can be, for it is said there that, quote, At the conclusion of their prayers, Stotra, the gods beheld the sovereign deity Hari, Vishnu, armed with the conch, the discus, and the mace, riding on Garuda. Unquote. Now, Garuda is the momentaric cycle, as will be shown in its place. Vishnu, therefore, is the deity in space and time, the peculiar god of the Vaishnavas, a tribal or racial god, as they are called in esoteric philosophy, that is, one of the many Jayanis or gods, or Elohim, one of whom was generally chosen for some special reasons by a nation or a tribe, and thus became gradually a god above all gods. Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 5 The highest god as Jehovah, Osiris, Bel, or any other of the seven regions. The tree is known by its fruit, the nature of a god by his actions. The latter we have either to judge by the dead letter narratives or to accept allegorically. If we compare the two, Vishnu as the defender and champion of the defeated gods, and Jehovah 
the defender and champion of the chosen people, so called by defender and champion of the, quote, chosen, unquote, people, so called by antiphrasis, no doubt, as it is the Jews who had chosen that, quote, jealous, unquote, God. We shall find that both use deceit and cunning. They do so on the principle of the end justifying the means, in order to have the best of their respective opponents and foes, the demons. First, while, according to the Kabbalists, Jehovah assumes the shape of the tempting serpent in the Garden of Eden, sends Satan with a special mission to tempt Job, and harasses and wearies Pharaoh with, with Sarai, Abraham's wife, and hardens his heart against Moses, lest there should be no opportunity for plaguing his victims with great plagues, from Genesis chapter 12, Exodus. Vision is made in his Purana to resort to a trick no less unworthy of any respectable God. Quote, have compassion upon us, O Lord, and protect us who have come to thee for succor from the deities, demons. Pray the defeated gods. They have seized upon the three worlds and appropriated the offerings which are our portion, taking care not to transgress the precepts of the Veda. Although we, as well as they, are parts of thee, engaged as they are in the path prescribed by the Holy Writ, it is impossible for us to destroy them. Do thou, whose wisdom is immeasurable, a mayatman, instruct us in some device by which we may be able to exterminate the enemies of the gods. Unquote. Note on We as well as they are parts of thee. Quote, there was a day when the sons of God came before the Lord, and Satan came with his brothers also before the Lord, unquote. from Job chapter 2, the Abyss, Ethiopic text. End of note. Quote, when the mighty Vishnu heard their request, he emitted from his body an illusory form, Mayama, the deluder by illusion, which he gave to the gods, and thus spake. This Mayama shall wholly beguile the datas, so that being led astray from the path of the Vedas, they may not be put to death. Go then and fear not. Let this delusive vision precede you. It shall this day be of great service unto you, O gods. After this, the great delusion, Mayama, descending to earth, beheld the deities engaged in ascetic penances, and approaching them in the semblance of a digambara, naked mendicant, with his head shaven, he thus addressed them in gentle accents, O lords of the deities, wherefore is it that you practice these acts of penances? Finally, the deities were seduced by the wily talk of Mahamua, as Eve was seduced by the advice of the serpent. They became apostasies to the Vedas. As Dr. Muir translates the passage, quote, The great deceiver practicing illusion next beguiled other deities by means of many other sorts of heresy. In a very short time, these asuras, deities, deluded by the deceiver who was Vishnu, abandoned the entire system founded on the ordinances of the Triple Veda. Some reviled the Vedas, others the gods, others the ceremonial of sacrifice, and others the Brahmans. This, they exclaimed, is a doctrine which will not bear discussion. The slaughter of animals in sacrifice is not conducive to religious merit. To say that oblations of butter consumed in the fire produce any future reward is the assertion of a child. If it be a fact that a beast slain in sacrifice is exalted to heaven, why does not the worshipper slaughter his own father? Infallible utterances do not, great asuras, fall from the skies. It is only assertions founded on reasoning that are accepted by me and by other intelligent persons like yourselves. Thus, by numerous methods, the deities were unsettled by the great deceiver, reason. When they had entered upon the path of error, the gods mustered all their energies and approached to battle. 
Then followed a combat between the guards and the Asuras, and the latter, who had abandoned the right road, were smitten by the former. In previous times they had been defended by the armor of righteousness which they bore, but when that had been destroyed, they also perished. Quote from Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, Volume 19, page 302. Whatever may be thought of Hildus, no enemy of theirs can regard them as fools a people whose holy men and sages have left to the world the greatest and most sublime philosophies that ever emanated from the minds of men must have known the difference between right and wrong. Even a savage can discern white from black, good from bad, and deceit from sincerity and truthfulness. Those who had narrated this event in the biography of their god must have seen that in this case it was that god who was the arch-deceiver, and the Daityas who never transgressed the precepts of the Vedas, who had the sunny side in the transaction, and who were the true gods. Thence there must have been, and there is, a secret meaning hidden under this allegory. In no class of society, in no nation, are deceit and craft considered as divine virtues, except perhaps in the clerical classes of theologians and modern Jesuitism. The Vishnu Purana, like all other works of this kind, has passed at a later period into the hands of the temple Brahmins, and the old manuscripts have no doubt been once more tampered with by sectarians. Note in the Vishnu Purana. Wilson's opinion that the Vishnu Purana is a production of our era and that in its present form it is not earlier than between the 8th and the 17th in brackets double exclamation mark century is absurd beyond noticing. End of note. But there was a time when the Puranas were esoteric works and so they are still for the initiates who can read them with the key that is in their possession. Whether the Brahmin initiate will ever give out the full meaning of these allegories is a question with which the writer is not concerned. The present object is to show that, while honouring the creative powers in their multiple forms, no philosopher could, or even has, accepted the allegory for the true spirit, except perhaps some philosophers belonging to the present, quote, superior and civilised, unquote, Christian races. For as shown, Jehovah is not one whit the superior of Vishnu on the plane of ethics. This is why the occultists, and even some Kabbalists, whether they regard or not those creative forces as living and conscious entities, and one does not see why they should not be so accepted, will never confuse the cause with the effect, and accept the spirit of the earth for Parabram or Ein Sof. At all events, they know well the true nature of what was called Father Aether by the Greeks, Jupiter Titan, etc., etc. They know that the soul of the astral light is divine, and its body, the light waves on the lower planes, infernal. This light is symbolized by the magic head in the Zohar, the double face on the double pyramid, the black pyramid rising against a pure white ground, with a white head and face within its black triangle, the white pyramid inverted, the reflection the first in the dark waters showing the black reflection of the white face. This is the astral light or demon est Deus inversus. Next section is section 12, the theogony of the creative gods. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1 Cosmogenesis Part 2 The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order, with explanatory sections. Section 12 the Theogony of the Creative Gods To thoroughly comprehend the idea underlying every ancient cosmology, 
necessitates the study and a comparative analysis of all the great religions of antiquity, as it is only by this method that the root idea will be made plain. Exact science, could the latter soar so high, while tracing the operations of nature to their ultimate and original sources, would call this idea the hierarchy of forces. The original transcendental and philosophical conception was one, but as systems began to reflect with every age more and more the idiosyncrasies of nations, and as the latter, after separating, settled into distinct groups, each evolving along its own national or tribal groove, the main idea gradually became veiled with the overgrowth of human fancy. While some countries the forces, or rather the intelligent powers of nature, received divine honours they were hardly entitled to, in others, as now in Europe and the civilised lands, the very thought of any such force being endowed with intelligence seems absurd, and is proclaimed unscientific. Therefore, one finds relief in such statements as are found in the introduction to Arsgord and the Gods, Tales and Traditions of Our Northern Ancestors, by W. S. W. Anson. The author remarks, on page 3, quote, Although in Central Asia, or on the banks of the Indus, in the land of the pyramids, and in the Greek and Italian peninsulas, and even in the north, where the Celts, Teutons, and Slavs wandered, the religious conceptions of the people have taken different forms, yet their common origin is still perceptible. We point out this connection between the stories of the gods and the deep thought contained in them, and their importance in order that the reader may see that it was not a magic world of erratic fancy which opens out before him, but that life and nature form the basis of the existence and action of these divinities. End of quote. And though it is impossible for any occultist or student of Eastern esotericism to concur in the strange idea that the religious conceptions of the most famous nations of antiquity are connected with the beginnings of civilization amongst the Germanic races, he is yet glad to find such truths expressed as that, quote, these fairy tales are not senseless stories written for the amusement of the idle, they embody the profound religion of our forefathers. End of quote. Precisely so. Not only their religion, but likewise their history. For a myth in Greek, mythos, means oral tradition, passed from mouth to mouth, from one generation to the other. And even in the modern etymology, the term stands for a fabulous statement conveying some important truth, a tale of some extraordinary personage whose biography has become overgrown, owing to the veneration of successive generations, with rich popular fancy, but which is no wholesale fable. Like our ancestors, the primitive Aryans, we believe firmly in the personality and intelligence of more than one phenomenon producing force in nature. As time rolled on, the archaic teaching grew dimmer, and those nations more or less lost sight of the highest and one principle of all things, and began to transfer the abstract attributes of the causeless cause to the caused effects, becoming their turn causative, the creative powers of the universe. The great nations, out of the fear profaning the idea, the smaller, because they either fail to grasp it, or lack the power of philosophic conception needed to preserve it in all its immaculate purity. But one and all, with the exception of the latest Aryans, now become Europeans and Christians, show this veneration in their cosmogonies. As Thomas Taylor, the most intuitional of all the translators of Greek fragments, shows no nation has ever conceived the one principle as the immediate creator of the visible universe, for no sane man would credit a planner and architect with having built the edifice he admires with his own hands. On the testimony of Damascius, Periarchon, they referred to it as the unknown darkness. The Babylonians passed over this principle in silence. To that God, says Porphyry in Periapocus Epochum, who is above all things, neither external speech ought to be addressed, 
nor yet that which is inward. His side begins his theogony with, Chaos of all things with the first produced, first allowing the inference that its cause or producer must be passed over in reverential silence. Homer in his poems ascends no higher than night, whom he represents Seves as reverencing. Note on Thomas Taylor. See Magazine for April 1797. End of note. Note on Hesiod. Chaos of all things was the first produced. See Taylor's Introduction to the Paramedes of Plato, page 260. Eto men priutiota chaos genet. Genet being considered in antiquity as meaning was generated, and not simply was. See Taylor's Introduction to the Paramedes of Plato, page 260, end of note. According to all the ancient theologists, and to the doctrines of Pythagoras and Plato, Seves, or the immediate artifice of the universe, is not the highest god, any more than Sir Christopher Wren in his physical human aspect is the mind in him which produced his great works of art. Homer, therefore, is not only silent with respect to the first principle, but likewise with respect to those two principles immediately posterior to the first, the aether and chaos of Orpheus and Hesiod, and the bound and infinity of Pythagoras and Plato. Note, it is the bound confused with the infinite that Kapila overwhelms with sarcasms in his disputations with the Brahman yogis, who claim in their mystical visions to see the highest one. End of note. Proclus says of this highest principle that it is the unity of unities, and beyond the first adite. More ineffable than all silence, and more cult than all essence concealed amidst the intelligible gods. From the same source. To what was written by Thomas Taylor in 1797, namely, that the Jews appear to have ascended no higher than the immediate artifice of the universe, as Moses introduces a darkness on the face of the deep, without even insinuating that there was any cause of its existence, one might add something more. Never have the Jews in their Bible, a purely satiric symbolical work, degraded so profoundly their metaphysical deity as have the Christians, by accepting Jehovah as their one living yet personal God. Note, see Thomas Taylor's article in his monthly magazine quoted in The Platonist, edited by T. M. Johnson, FTS, Osceola, Missouri, February number of 1887. End of note. This first, or rather one, principle was called the circle of heaven, symbolized by the hiagram of a point within a circle or equilateral triangle, the point being the Logos. Thus in the Rig Veda, wherein Brahma is not even named, Kusmagan is preluded with Hirayana Garba, the golden egg, and Prajapati, Brahma later on, from whom emanate all the hierarchies of quote, creators, unquote. The monad, or point, is the original and is the unit from which follows the entire numeral system. This point is the first cause, but that from which it emanates, or of which, rather, it is the expression that the Logos is passed over in silence. In its turn, the universal symbol, the point within the circle, was not yet the architect, but the cause of that architect, and the latter stood to it in precisely the same relation as the point itself stood to the circumference of the circle, which cannot be defined according to Hermes Trismegistus. Porphyry shows that the monad and the duad of Pythagoras are identical with Plato's infinite and finite in Philebus, or what Plato calls the Apeiron and Peras. It is the latter only, the mother, which is substantial, with the former being the cause of all unity and measure of all things. Vita Pythagore, page 47. The Jewad Mulaprakriti, the veil, being thus shown to be the mother of the Logos and, at the same time, his daughter, that is, the object of his perception, the produced producer and the secondary cause of it. With Pythagoras, the monad returns into silence and darkness as soon as it has evolved the triad, from which emanate the remaining seven numbers of the ten numbers, which are at the base of the manifested universe. In the Norse cosmogony, it is again the same. In the beginning was a great abyss, chaos. Neither day nor night existed. The abyss was Ginnunagap. 
the yawning gulf, without beginning, without end. All Father, the uncreated, the unseen, dwelt in the depth of the abyss, space, and what was willed came into being. See Asgard and the gods. As in the Hindu cosmogony, the evolution of the universe is divided into two acts, called in India the Prakriti and Padma creations. Before the warm rays pouring from the home of brightness awake life in the great waters of space, the elements of the first creation come into view, and from them is formed the giant Ymir, also Orgilmir, primordial matter differentiated from chaos, literally seething clay. Then comes the cow Ord Humla, the nourisher, from whom is born Bure, the producer, who, by Bestla, the daughter of the frost giants, the sons of Ymir, had three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve, or spirit, will, and holiness. Compare the genesis of the primordial races in this work. Note on the cow Ord Humla, the nourisher, Vak, the melodious cow who milks sustenance and water, and yields us nourishment and sustenance, as described in Rig Veda. End of note. This was when darkness still reigned throughout space, when the Arsis, reader's note, or Arsana, end of reader's note, the creative powers, the Ankochans, were not yet evolved. And the Yggdrasil, the tree of the universe of time and of life, had not yet grown, and there was as yet no Valhalla, or Hall of Heroes. The Scandinavian legends of creation of our earth and world begins with time and human life. All that precedes it is for them darkness, wherein all father, the cause of all, dwells. As observed by the editor of Asgard and the Gods, Though these legends have in them the idea of that All-Father, the original cause of all, he is scarcely more than mentioned in the poems, not because, as he thinks before the preaching of the Gospel, the idea could not rise to distinct conceptions of the Eternal, but on account of its great esoteric character. Therefore, all the creative gods, or personal deities, begin at the secondary stage of cosmic evolution. Zeus is born in and out of Kronos, time. So is Brahma the production and emanation of Kala, eternity and time, Kala being one of the names of Vishnu. Hence we find Odin, the father of the gods and of the Asas, as Brahma is the father of the gods and of the Asuras. And hence also the androgyne character of all the chief creative gods, from the second monad of the Greeks down to the Sephiroth, Adam Kadmon, the Brahma or Prajapatibak of the Vedas, and the androgyne of Plato, which is but another version of the Indian symbol. The best metaphysical definition of primeval theogony and the spirit of the Vedantins may be found in the notes on the Bhagavad Gita by Mr. T. Sabaro, see Theosophist for February 1887. Parabhaman, the unknown and the incognizable, as the lecturer tells his audience, is not ego, it is not non-ego, nor is it consciousness. It is not even Atma. But though not itself an object of knowledge, it is yet capable of supporting and giving rise to every kind of object and every kind of existence which becomes an object of knowledge. It is the one essence from which starts into existence a centre of energy, which he calls Logos. This Logos is the Sabda Brahman of the Hindus, which he will not even call Eshvara, the Lord God, lest the term should create confusion in the people's minds. But it is the Avalokiteshvara of the Hindus, the verbum of the Christians in its real esoteric meaning, not in the theological disfigurement. It is, he says, the Gnata, or the ego in the cosmos, and every other ego is but its reflection and manifestation. It exists in a latent condition in the bosom of Parabrahman at the time of Pralaya, during Manvantara. It has a consciousness and an individuality of its own, it is a centre of energy, but such centres of energy are almost innumerable in the bosom of Parabrahman. It must not be supposed that even the Logos is the creator, or that it is but a single centre of energy. Their number is almost infinite. This ego, he adds, is the first that appears in cosmos, and is the end of all evolution. It is the abstract ego. This is the first manifestation or aspect of Parabrahman. 
Once once it starts into conscious being, from its objective standpoint, Parabrahman appears to it as Mula Prakriti. Please bear this in mind, observes the lecturer, for here is the root of the whole difficulty about Purusha and Prakriti felt by the various writers on Vedantic philosophy. This Mula Prakriti is material to it, the Logos, as any material object is material to us. This Mula Prakriti is no more Parabrahman than the bundle of attributes of a pillar is the pillar itself. Parabrahman is an unconditioned and absolute reality, and Mula Prakriti is a sort of veil thrown over it. Parabrahman by itself cannot be seen as it is. It is seen by the Logos with a veil thrown over it, and that veil is the mighty expanse of cosmic matter. Parabrahman after having appeared on the one hand as the ego, and on the other as Mula Prakriti, acts as the one energy through the Logos. And the lecturer explains what he means by this acting of something which is nothing, though it is the all, by a fine simile. He compares the Logos to the sun through which light and heat radiate, but whose energy, light and heat, exist in some unknown condition in space and are diffused in space only as a visible light and heat, the sun being only the agent thereof. This is the first triadic hypostasis. The quaternary is made up by the energizing light shed by the Logos. The Hebrew Kabbalists gave it in a shape which esoterically is identical with the Vedantic. Ainsaf, they taught, could not be comprehended, could not be located, nor named, though the causeless cause of all. Hence its name, Ainsaf, is a term of negation, the inscrutable, the incognizable, and the unnameable. They made of it, therefore, a boundless circle, a sphere, of which human intellect, with the utmost stretch, could only perceive the vault. In the words of one who has unriddled much in the Kabbalistical system, in one of its meanings thoroughly, in its numerical and geometrical esotericism, close your eyes, and from your own consciousness of perception, try and think outward to the extremest limits in every direction. You will find that equal lines or rays of perception extend out evenly in all directions, so that the utmost effort of perception will terminate in the vault of a sphere. The limitation of this sphere will, of necessity, be a great circle, and the direct rays of thought in any and every direction must be right line ready on the circle. This, then, must be, humanly speaking, the extremest, all-embracing conception of the Ains of Manifest, which formulates itself as a geometrical figure, meaning of a circle with its elements of curved circumference and right line diameter divided into radii. Hence, a geometrical shape is the first recognizable means of connection between the Ains of and the intelligence of man. Note from the Masonic Review for June 1886. End of note. This great circle, which Eastern esotericism reduces to the point within the boundless circle, is the Avalokiteshvara, the Logos or Verbum of which Mr. Saburo speaks. But this circle or manifested God is as unknown to us, except through its manifested universe, as the one though easier or rather more possible to our highest conceptions. This Logos, which sleeps in the bosom of Parabrahman during Palaya, as our ego is latent in us at the time of Susupti, sleep, which cannot cognize Parabrahman otherwise than Amula Prakriti, the latter being a cosmic veil which is the mighty expanse of cosmic matter, is thus only an organ in cosmic creation through which radiate the energy and wisdom of Parabrahman, unknown to the Logos, as it is to ourselves. Moreover, as the Logos is unknown to us, as Parabrahman is unknown in reality to the Logos, both Eastern esotericism and the Kabbalah, in order to bring the Logos within the range of our conceptions, have resolved the abstract synthesis into concrete images, meaning into the reflections or multiplied aspects of that Logos, or Avalokiteshvara, Brahma, Ormazd, Osiris, Adam Kadmon, call it by any of these names, 
Which aspects or manventaric emanations are the Dianchochans, the Elohim, the Devas, the Amshaspens, etc., etc.? Metaphysicians explain the root and germ of the latter, according to Mr. Sabaro, as the first manifestation of Parabrahma, the highest trinity that we are capable of understanding, which is Mula Prakriti, the veil, the logos, and the conscious energy of the latter, or its power and light. Note, called in the Bhagavad Gita, Daivi Prakriti, end of note. Or matter force and the ego, or the one root of self, of which every other kind of self is but a manifestation or a reflection. It is then only in this light of consciousness, of mental and physical perception, that practical occultism can throw this into visibility by geometrical figures, which, when closely studied, will yield not only a scientific explanation of the real objective existence of the seven sons of the divine Sophia, which is the light of the Logos, but show by means of other yet undiscovered keys that, with regard to humanity, these seven suns and their numberless emanations, centers of energy personified, are an absolute necessity. Make away with them, and the mystery of being and mankind will never be unriddled, not even closely approached. Note on not only scientific explanation of the real objective existence. Objective in the world of Maya, of course, still as real as we are, end of note. It is through this light that everything is created. This root of mental self is also the root of a physical self. For this light is the permutation in our manifested world of Mula Prakriti called Aditi in the Vedas. In its third aspect it becomes Vak, the daughter and the mother of the Logos, as Isis is the daughter and the mother of Osiris, who is Horus, and of Mut, the daughter, wife, and mother of Ammon in the Egyptian moon glyph. Note on Vak. In the course of cosmic manifestation, this Daivi Prakriti, instead of being the mother of the Logos, should strictly speaking be called his daughter. Note on the Bhagavad Gita, page 305, Theosophist, end of note. In the Kabbalah, Sephira is the same as Shekinah, and is, in another synthesis, the wife, daughter, and mother of the heavenly man, Adam Kadmon, and is even identical with him, just as Vak is identical with Brahma, and is called the female Logos. In the Rig Veda, Vak is the mystic speech, by whom occult knowledge and wisdom are communicated to man, and thus Vak is said to have entered the Rishis. She is generated by the gods. She is the divine Vak, the queen of gods and she is associated like Sephira with the Sephiroth, with the Prajapati in their work of creation. Moreover, she is called the mother of the Vedas, since it is through her power, as mystic speech, that Brahma revealed them, and also owing to her power that he produced the universe, that is, through speech, and words synthesized by the word and numbers. Note. The wise men, like Stanley Jeevans amongst the moderns, who invented the scheme which makes the incomprehensible assume a tangible form, could only do so by resorting to numbers and geometrical figures. End of note. But Vak, being also spoken of as the daughter of Daksha, the god who lives in all the Kalpas, her Mayavic character is thereby shown. During the Pralaya she disappears, absorbed in the one all-devouring ray. But there are two distinct aspects in universal esotericism, Eastern and Western, in all those personations of the female power in nature, or nature the noumenal and the phenomenal. One is its purely metaphysical aspect, as described by the learned lecturer in his notes on the Bhagavad Gita. The other terrestrial and physical, and at the same time divine from the standpoint of practical human conception and occultism. They are all the symbols and personifications of chaos, the great deep, or the primordial waters of space, the impenetrable veil between the incognizable and the logos of creation. Connecting himself through his mind with Vak, Brahma, the logos, created the primordial waters. In the Kataka Upanishad it is stated still more clearly, Prajapati was this universe, Vak was a second to him. 
he associated with her. She produced these creatures and again re-entered Prajapati. Note. This connects Vak and Sephira with the goddess Kuan Yin, the merciful mother, the divine voice of the soul, even in exoteric Buddhism, and with the female aspect of Kuan Shayin, the Logos, the verbum of creation, and at the same time with the voice that speaks audibly to the initiate, according to esoteric Buddhism. But call, the Philia Vokis, the daughter of the divine voice of the Hebrews, responding from the mercy seat within the veil of the temple, is a result. End of note. And here we may incidentally point out one of the many unjust slurs thrown by the pious and good missionaries in India on the religion of that land. This allegory in the Satapata Brahmana, namely that Brahma, as the father of men, performed the work of procreation by incestuous intercourse with his own daughter Vak, also called Sandhya, Twilight, and Satarupa, the Hundred Formed is incessantly thrown into the teeth of the Brahmins as condemning their detestable, false religion. Besides the fact, conveniently forgotten by the Europeans, that the patriarch Lot is shown guilty of the same crime under the human form, whereas Brahma, or rather Prajapati, accomplished the incest under the form of a buck with his daughter, who had that of a Hind, Rohit. The esoteric reading of Genesis chapter 3 shows the same. Moreover, there is certainly a cosmic, not a physiological meaning attached to the Indian allegory, since Vak is a permutation of Aditi and Mulaprakriti, chaos, and Brahma a permutation of Narayana, the spirit of God. Entering into and fructifying nature, therefore, there is nothing phallic in the conception at all. As already stated, Adityavak is the female Logos, or the word Verbum, and Sephira in the Kabbalah is the same. These feminine Logoi are all correlations in their noumenal aspect of light and sound and ether, showing how well informed were the ancients, both in physical science as now known to the moderns, and as to the birth of that science in the spiritual and astral spheres. Quote, Our old writers said that Vak is of four kinds, para Pasyanti, Madhyama, Vaikari, a statement found in the Rig Veda and the Upanishads. Vaikari Vak is what we utter. It is sound, speech, that again which becomes comprehensive and objective to one of our physical senses and may be brought under the laws of perception. Hence, every kind of Vaikari Vak exists in its Madhyama, Pasyanti, and ultimately in its paraform. The reason why this pranava is called vak is this, that these four principles of the great cosmos correspond to these four forms of vak. The whole cosmos in its objective form is vaikari vak. The light of the logos is a madhyama form, and the logos itself the pasyanti form, while parabrahman is the para, beyond the noumenon of all noumena aspect of that vak from notes on the Bhagavad Gita. Note on Pranava. Pranava, like Um, is a mystic term pronounced by the yogis during meditation of the terms called, according to exoteric commentators, Vyaritis, or Om, Bur, Bhuva, Swar. Om, Earth, Sky, Heaven. Pranava is the most sacred, perhaps, they are pronounced with breath suppressed. See Manu 2, 76-81, and Mittakshara commenting on the Yainavaka Suriti, 1, 23. But the esoteric explanation goes a great deal further. End of note. Thusvak, Shekina, or the music of the spheres of Pythagoras are one, if we take for our example instances in the three most apparently dissimilar religious philosophies in the world, the Hindu, the Greek, and the Chaldean Hebrew. These personations and allegories may be viewed under four chief and three lesser aspects, or seven in all, as in esotericism. The paraform 
is the irresubjective and latent light and sound which exist eternally in the bosom of the incognizable when transferred into the ideation of the logos or its latent light it is called pascianti and when it becomes that light expressed it is madhyama now the kabbalah gives the definition thus there are three kinds of light and that fourth which interpenetrates the others one the clear and the penetrating the objective light two the reflected light and three the abstract light the ten sephiroth the three and the seven are called in the kabbalah the ten words dibrim or dabarim the numbers and the emanations of the heavenly light which is both adam kadman and sephira or brahma pratyapativak light sound number are the three factors of creation in the kabbalah parabrahman cannot be known except through the luminous point the logos which knows not parabrahman but only mula prakriti similarly adam kadman knew only sikina though he was the vehicle of ein Sof. and as adam kadman he is in the esoteric interpretation the total of the number ten the sephiroth himself a trinity or the three attributes of the incognizable deity in one note it is in this trinity that it is meant by the three steps of vishnu which means vishnu being considered as the infinite in exotericism that from the parabram issued mula prakriti purusha the logos and prakriti the four forms with itself the synthesis of vak and in the kabbalah ein sof shekina adam kadman and sephira the four or the three emanations being distinct yet one end of note when the heavenly man or logos first assumed the form of the crown kether and identified himself with sephira he caused seven splendid lights to emanate from it the crown which made in their totality a ten so the brahma prajapati once he became separated from yet identical with vak caused the seven rishis the seven manas or prajapatis to issue from that crown note on the crown chaldean book of numbers in the current Kabbalah, the name Jehovah replaces Adam Kadmon. End of note. In exotericism, one will always find ten and seven of either Sephiroth or Prajapati. In esoteric rendering, always three and seven, which yield also ten. Only when divided in the manifest sphere into three and seven, they form the androgyne and the swastika or the figure X, manifested and differentiated. This will help the student to understand why Pythagoras esteemed the deity, the Logos, to be the center of unity and source of harmony. We say this deity was the Logos, not the monad that dwelleth in solitude and silence, because Pythagoras taught that unity, being indivisible, is no number. And this is also why it was required of the candidate who applied for admittance into his school that he should have already studied as a preliminary step the sciences of arithmetic astronomy geometry and music held as the four divisions of mathematics note justin martyr tells us that owing to his ignorance of these four sciences he was rejected by the pythagoreans as a candidate for admission into their school End of note. Again, this explains why the Pythagoreans asserted that the doctrine of numbers, the chief of all in esotericism, had been revealed to men by the celestial deities, that the world had been called forth out of chaos by sound or harmony, and constructed according to the principles of musical proportion, that the seven planets which rule the destiny of mortals have a harmonious motion, and intervals corresponding to musical diastemes rendering various sounds so perfectly consonant that they produce the sweetest melody which is inaudible to us only by reason of the greatness of the sound which our ears are incapable of receiving sensoriness in the pythagorean theogony the hierarchies of the heavenly host and gods were numbered and expressed numerically pythagoras had studied esoteric science in india 
Therefore we find his pupils saying, The monad, the manifested one, is the principle of all things. From the monad and the intermediate duad, chaos. From numbers, points. From points, lines. From lines, superficies. From superficies, solids. From these, solid bodies, whose elements are four, fire, water, air, earth, of all which transmute, correlated, and totally changed, the world consists. Theogenes Lartius in Vita Pythagore. And this may also, if it does not unriddle the mystery altogether, at any rate lift a corner of the veil of those wondrous allegories that have been thrown upon Bach, the most mysterious of all the Brahminical goddesses, she who is termed the melodious cow who milked forth sustenance and water, the earth, with all her mystic powers. And again she who yields us nourishment and sustenance, physical earth. Isis is also mystic nature and also earth, and her cow's horns identify her with Bach. The latter, after having been recognized in her highest form as Para, becomes at the lower or material end of creation Vaikari. Hence she is mystic, though physical, nature, with all her magic ways and properties. Again, as goddess of speech and of sound, and the permutation of Aditi, she is chaos in one sense. At any rate, she is the mother of the gods, and it is from Brahma, Ishvara, or the Logos, and Vak, as from Adam Kadmon and Sephira, that the real manifested theogony has to start. Beyond all is darkness and abstract speculation. With the Diankochans, or the gods, the seers, the prophets, and the adepts in general are on firm ground, whether as Aditi, or the divine Sophia of the Greek Gnostics, she is the mother of the seven sons, the angels of the face, of the deep, or the great green one, of the book of the dead. Says the book of Jem, Knowledge Through Meditation, quote, The great mother lay with triangle, and the vertical line, and the square, the second vertical line, and the five-pointed star in her bosom, ready to bring them forth, the valiant sons of the square, triangle, double, vertical lines, or four million three hundred and twenty thousand, the cycle, whose two elders are the circle and the point. Unquote. At the beginning of every cycle of four million three hundred and twenty thousand, the seven, or as some nations had it, eight great gods, descended to establish the new order of things and give the impetus to the new cycle. That eighth god was the unifying circle, or logos, separated and made distinct from its host in exoteric dogma, just as the three divine hypostases of the ancient Greeks are now considered in the churches as three distinct personae. Quote, the mighty ones perform their great works and leave behind them everlasting monuments to commemorate their visit every time they penetrate within our Mayavic veil atmosphere. Unquote. Says a commentary. Note on the five pointed star, etc. three one four one five or P Pi. The synthesis or the host unified in the Logos and the point called in Roman Catholicism the angel of the face and in Hebrew, who is like unto, or the same as God, the manifested representation. End of note. Note in the commentary. Appearing at the beginning of cycles, as also every sidereal year, or 25,868 years, therefore the Kaberi, or Kabarim, received their name in Chaldea, as it means the measures of heaven, from Kob, measure of, and Urim, heavens. End of note. Thus we are taught that the great pyramids were built under their direct supervision. Quote, when Druva, the then pole star, was at his lowest culmination, and the Critica, Pleiades, looked over his head, were on the same meridian but above, to watch the work of the giants. Unquote. Thus, as the first pyramids were built at the beginning of a sidereal year under Druva, Alpha Polaris, it must have been over 31,105 31, years ago. 
Bunsen was right in admitting for Egypt an antiquity of over 21,000 years, but this concession hardly exhausts truth and fact in this question. Quote, the stories told by Egyptian priests and others of timekeeping in Egypt are now beginning to look less like lies in the sight of all who have escaped from biblical bondage, unquote, writes the author of The Natural Genesis. Inscriptions have lately been found at Saqqara, making mention of two Sothiac cycles, registered at that time, now some 6,000 years ago. Thus, when Herodotus was in Egypt, the Egyptians had, as now known, observed at least five different Sothiac cycles of 1,461 years. The priests informed the Greek inquirer that time had been reckoned by them for so long that the sun had twice risen when it then set, and twice set when it arose. This can only be realized as a fact in nature by means of two cycles of precession, or a period of 51,736 years. Volume 2, page 318, but see in our book 2, Chronology of the Brahmins. More Isaac, see Kirchus, Oedipus, volume 2, page 425, shows the ancient Syrians defining their world of their rulers and active gods in the same way as the Chaldeans. The lowest world was the sublunary, our own, watched by the, quote, angels, unquote, of the first or lower order. The one that came next in rank was Mercury, ruled by the, quote, archangels, unquote. Then came Venus, whose gods were the principalities. The fourth was that of the sun, the domain and region of the highest and mightiest gods of our system, the solar gods of all nations. The fifth was Mars, ruled by the, quote, virtues, unquote. The sixth, that of Bel, or Jupiter, was governed by the dominions. The seventh, the world of Saturn, by the thrones. These are the worlds of form. Above came the four higher ones, making seven again, since the three highest are unmentionable and unpronounceable. The eighth, composed of 1,122 stars, is the domain of the cherubs. The ninth, belonging to the walking, and numberless stars on account of their distance, has the seraphs. As to the tenth, Kirche, quoting more Isaac, says that it is composed of invisible stars that could be taken, they said, for clouds. So massed are they in the zone that we call via Straminis, the Milky Way, and he hastens to explain that these are the stars of Lucifer, engulfed with him in his terrible shipwreck. That which comes after and beyond the tenth world, our quaternary or the Arupa world, the Syrians could not tell. All they knew was that it is there that begins the vast and incomprehensible ocean of the infinite, the abode of the true divinity without boundary or end. Champollion shows the same belief among the Egyptians, Hermes having spoken of the father, mother, and son, whose spirit collectively is the divine fiat, shapes the universe, says, Seven agents, mediums, were also formed, to contain the material or manifested worlds within their respective circles, and the action of these agents were named destiny. He further enumerates seven and ten and twelve orders, which would take too long to detail here as the Rig Vedana, together with the Brahmanda Purana, and all such works, whether describing the magic efficiency of the Rig Vedic mantras, or the future Kalpas, are declared by Dr. Weber and others to be modern compilations, quote, belonging probably only to the time of the Puranas, unquote. It is useless to refer the reader to their mystic explanations, and one may as well quote simply from the archaic books utterly unknown to the orientalists these works explain that which so puzzles the scholars namely that the saptarshi the mind-born sons of brahma are referred to in satapata brahmana under one set of names in the mahabharata under another set and that the vayu purana makes even nine instead of seven rishis by adding the names of brigu and daksha to the list but the same occurs in every exoteric scripture. The secret doctrine gives a long genealogy of rishis, but separates them into many classes. 
like the gods of the egyptians who are divided into seven and even twelve classes so are the indian rishis and their hierarchies the first three groups are the divine the cosmical and the sublunary then come the solar gods of our system the planetary the submundane and the purely human the heroes and the manushi at present however we are only concerned with the pre-cosmic divine gods the prajapati or the seven builders this group is found unmistakably in every cosmogony owing to the loss of egyptian archaic documents since according to m maspero quote, the materials and historical data on hand to study the history of the religious evolution in egypt are neither complete nor very often intelligible unquote. In order to have the statements brought forward from the sacred doctrine corroborated partially and indirectly, the ancient hymns and inscriptions on the tombs be appealed to. One such, at any rate, shows that Osiris was, like Brahma Prajapati, Adam Kadmon, Omajd, and so many other Logui, the chief and synthesis of the group of creators or builders. Before Osiris became the one and the highest god of Egypt, he was worshipped at Abydos as the head or leader of the heavenly host of the builders belonging to the high of the three orders. The hymn engraved on the votive stela of a tomb from Abydos, third register, addresses Osiris thus, quote, Salutations to thee, Osiris, elder son of Sib, thou the greatest of the six gods issued from the goddess Nu, primordial water. Thou the great favourite of thy father, Ra, father of fathers, king of duration, master in the eternity, who, as soon as these issued from thy mother's bosom, gathered all the crowns and attached the Uraeus, serpent or Naja, on thy head, multiform god, whose name is unknown, and who has many names in towns and provinces. Note. This Egyptian word, Naja, reminds one a good deal of the Indian Naga, the serpent god. Brahma and Shiva and Vishnu are all crowned with and connected with Nagas, a sign of their cyclic and cosmic character. End of note. Coming out from the primordial water crowned with the Uraeus, which is the serpent emblem of the cosmic fire, and himself the seventh over the six primary god issued from Father Mother, Nu and Nut, the sky, who can Osiris be but the chief Prajapati, the chief Sephiroth, the chief Amshasp and Ormasht? That this latter soul and cosmic god stood, in the beginning of religious evolution, in the same position as the archangel, quote, whose name was secret, unquote, is certain. This archangel was the representative on earth of the hidden Jewish god, Michael, in short. It is his Quote, face, unquote, that is said to have gone before the Jews like a quote, pillar of fire. Unquote. Bunuf says, The seven Amshaspens, who are most assuredly our archangels, designate also the personifications of the divine virtues. From comment on the Yachana, page 174. And these archangels, therefore, are as certainly the Saptarishi of the Hindus though it is next to impossible to class each with its pagan prototype and parallel, since, as in the case of Osiris, they have all so many names in towns and provinces. Some of the most important, however, will be shown in their order. One thing is thus undeniably proven. The more one studies their hierarchies and finds out their identity, the more proofs one acquires that there is not one of the past and present personal gods known to us from the earliest days of history that does not belong to the third stage of cosmic manifestation. In every religion we find the concealed deity forming the groundwork, then the ray therefrom that falls into primordial cosmic matter, the first manifestation, then the androgyne result, the dual male and female abstract force personified, the second stage. This separates itself finally in the third into seven forces called the creative powers by all the ancient religions, and the virtues of God by the Christians. 
the late explanation and metaphysical abstract qualifications have never prevented the roman and greek churches from worshipping these virtues under the personifications and distinct names of the seven archangels in the book of the ruskin page fifty nine first treatise in the talmud a distinction between these groups is given which is the correct cabalistical explanation it says there are three groups or orders of sephiroth First, the Sephiroth called the Divine Attributes, abstract. Second, the physical or sidereal Sephiroth, personal. One group of seven, the other of ten. Third, the metaphysical Sephiroth, or periphrases of Jehovah, who are the first three Sephiroth, Kether, Kokma, and Bina, the rest of the seven being the personal seven spirits of the presence, also of the planets. The same division has to be applied to the primary, secondary, and tertiary evolution of God in every theogony, if one wishes to translate the meaning esoterically. We must not confuse the pure metaphysical personifications of the abstract attributes of deity with their reflection, the sidereal gods. This reflection, however, is in reality the objective expression of the abstraction living entities and the models formed on that divine prototype. Moreover, the three metaphysical sephiroth, or the periphrases of Jehovah, are not Jehovah. It is the latter himself with the additional titles of Adonai, Elohim, Sabaoth, and the numerous names lavished on him, who is the periphrases of the Sade, the Omnipotent. The name is a circumlocution indeed, a too abundant figure of Jewish rhetoric, and has always been denounced by the occultists. To the Jewish Kabbalists, and even the Christian alchemists and Rosicrucians, Jehovah was a convenient screen, unified by the folding of its many flaps, and adopted as a substitute, one name of an individual Sephiroth being as good as another name, for those who had the secret. The tetragrammaton, the ineffable, the sidereal sum total, was invented for no other purpose than to mislead the profane and to symbolize life and generation. Note, says the translator of Avicebun's Kabbalah, Mr. Isaac Mayer of Philadelphia, of this sum total. The letter of Kether is Yod, Obina, He, together Yahe, the feminine name. The third letter, that of Hokma, is Vau, making together Yav, of Yahweh, the tetragrammaton, and real the complete symbols of his efficaciousness. The last, He, of this ineffable name, being always applied to the six lower, and the last, together, the seven remaining Sephiroth. Thus the tetragrammaton is holy only in its abstract synthesis. As a quaternary containing the lower seven Sephiroth, it is phallic. End of note. The real secret and unpronounceable name, the word that is no word, has to be sought in the seven names of the first seven emanations, or the sons of the fire, in the secret scriptures of all the great nations, and even in the Zohar, the Kabbalistic law of that smallest of all, the Jewish. This word, composed of seven letters in each tongue, is found embodied in the architectural remains of every grand building in the world, from the Cyclopean remains on Easter Island, part of a continent buried under the seas near four million years ago than twenty thousand, down to the earliest Egyptian pyramids. Note on the buried continent. The statement will, of course, be found preposterous and absurd, and simply laughed at, but if one believes in the final submersion of Atlantis 850,000 years ago, as taught in esoteric Buddhism, the gradual first sinking having begun during the Eocene Age, one has to accept the statement for the so-called Lemuria, the continent of the third root race, first nearly destroyed by combustion and then submerged. This is what the commentary says. The first earth having been purified by the forty-nine fires, her people, born of fire and water, could not die, etc. The second earth, with its rays, disappeared as vapour vanishes in the air. The third earth had everything consumed on it after the separation, and went down into the lower deep, the ocean. 
This was twice 82 cyclic years ago. Now, a cyclic year is what we call a sidereal year and is founded on the precession of the equinoxes, or 25,868 years each. And this is equal, therefore, in all, to 4,242,352 years. More details will be found in the text of Book 2. Meanwhile, this doctrine is embodied in the King of Edom. End of note. We shall have to enter more fuller upon this subject and bring practical illustrations to prove the statements made in the text. For the present, it is sufficient to show, by a few instances, the truth of what was asserted at the beginning of this monograph, namely, that no cosmogony the world over, with the sole exception of the Christian, has ever attributed to the one highest cause, the universal deific, the immediate creation of our earth, man, or anything connected with these. This statement holds as good for the Hebrew or Chaldean Kabbalah as it does for Genesis, had the latter been ever thoroughly understood and, what is still more important, correctly translated. Note. The same reserve is found in the Talmud and in every national system of religion, whether monotheistic or exoterically polytheistical. From the superb religious poem by the Kabbalist Rabbi Solomon ben Gabirol in the Kether Malkut, we select a few definitions given in the prayers of Kippur. Thou art one, the beginning of all numbers, and the foundation of all edifices. Thou art one, and in the secret of thy unity the wisest of men are lost, because they know it not. Thou art one, and thy unity is never diminished, never extended, and cannot be changed. Thou art one, but not as an element of numeration, for thy unity admits not of multiplication, change, or form. Thou art existent, but the understanding and wisdom of mortals cannot attain to thy existence, nor determine for thee the where, the how, and the why. Thou art existent, but in thyself alone, there being none other that can exist with thee. Thou art existent before all time and without place. Thou art existent, and thy existence is so profound and secret that none can penetrate and discover thy secrecy. Thou art living, but within no time that can be fixed or known. Thou art living, soul, for thou art thyself, the soul of all souls, etc., etc. There is a distance between this Kabbalistical deity and the Biblical Jehovah, the spiteful and revengeful God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who tempted the former and wrestled with the last. No Vedantin but would repudiate such a parabram. End of note. Everywhere there is either a logos, a light shining in darkness, truly, or the architect of the worlds is esoterically a plural number. The Latin Church, paradoxical as ever, while applying the epithet of Creator to Jehovah alone, adopts a whole curial of names for the working forces of the latter, those names betraying the secret. For if the said forces had naught to do with creation, so called, why call them Elohim, Alchim, in plural? Divine workmen and energies, Energeia, incandescent celestial stones, Lapidus igniti calorum, and especially supporters of the world, cosmocratores, governors or rulers of the world, rectores mundi, the wheels of the world, rote, often in flames and powers, sons of God, dne alchim, valiant counsellors, etc., etc. It was often premised, and as unjustly as usual, that China, nearly as old a country as India, had no cosmogony. Quote, it was unknown to Confucius, and the Buddhists extended their cosmogony without introducing a personal god. Unquote. It is complained. Note, Reverend Joseph Edkins, On Cosmogony, page 320. And, very wisely, they have acted. End of note. The Yi King, 
quote, the very essence of ancient thought and the combined work of the most venerated sages fail to show a distinct cosmogony, unquote. Nevertheless, there is one, and a very distinct one, only as Confucius did not admit of a future life, and the Chinese Buddhists reject the idea of one creator, accepting one cause and its noblest effects, they are misunderstood by the believers in a personal God. Note, Confucius not admitting a future life. If he rejected it, it was on the ground of what he calls the changes, in other words, rebirths of man and constant transformation. He denied immortality to the personality of man, as we do, not to man in capital letters. End of note. The, quote, great extreme, unquote, as the comment of changes, transmigrations, is the shortest and perhaps the most suggestive of all cosmogonies for those who, like the Confucianists, love virtue for its own sake, and try to do good unselfishly without perpetual looking to reward and profit. The great extreme of Confucius produces two figures. These two produce in their turn the four images. These again, the eight symbols. It is complained that though the Confucianists see in them heaven, earth, and man in miniature, we can see in them anything we like. No doubt, and so it is with regard to many symbols, especially in those of the latest religions. But they who know something of occult numerals see in these figures the symbol, however rude, of a harmonious progressive evolution of cosmos and its beings, both the heavenly and the terrestrial. And anyone who has studied the numerical evolution in the primeval cosmogony of Pythagoras, a contemporary of Confucius, can never fail to find in his triad, tetractes, and decayed, the same, emerging from the one and solitary monad. Confucius is laughed at by his Christian biographer for, quote, talking of divination, unquote, before and after this passage, and is represented as saying, quote, the eight symbols determine good and ill fortune, and these lead to great deeds. There are no imitable images greater than heaven and earth. There are no changes greater than the four seasons, meaning north, south, east, and west, a sickness. There are no suspended images brighter than the sun and moon. In preparing things for use, there is none greater than the sage. In determining good and ill luck, there is nothing greater than the, the divining straws and the tortoise. Unquote. Note. He may be laughed at by the Protestants, but the Roman Catholics have no right to mock him without becoming guilty of blasphemy and sacrilege. For it is over two hundred years since Confucius was canonized as a saint in China by the Roman Catholics, who have thereby obtained many converts among the ignorant Confucianists. And of note. Therefore, the divining straws and the tortoise, the symbolic sets of lines, and the great sage who looks at them as they become one and two, and two become four, and four become eight, and the other sets, three and six, are laughed to scorn, only because his wise symbols are misunderstood. So the author and his colleagues will scoff, no doubt, at these dances given in our text, for they represent precisely the same idea. The old archaic map of Cosmogon is full of lines, in the Confucian style, of concentric circles and dots. Yet all these represent the most abstract and philosophical conceptions of the cosmogony of our universe. At all events, it may answer perhaps better to the requirements and the scientific purposes of our age than the cosmogonical essays of St. Augustine and the Venerable Bede, though these were published over a millennium later than the Confucian. Confucius, one of the great sages of the ancient world, believed in ancient magic and practiced it himself if we take for granted the statements of Qin Yu. And he praised it to the skies in Yi Qin, we are told by his reverend critic. Nevertheless, even in his age, that is, 600 BC, Confucius and his school taught the sphericity of the earth and even the heliocentric system, while at about thrice 600 years after the Chinese philosopher, the popes of Rome threatened and even burnt, quote, heretics, unquote, for asserting the same. 
He is laughed at for speaking of the, quote, sacred tortoise, unquote. No unprejudiced person can see any great difference between a tortoise and a lamb as candidates for sacredness, as both are symbols and no more. The ox, the eagle, the lion, and occasionally the dove are the sacred animals of the Western Bible, the first three being found grouped round the evangelists, and the fourth, the human face, is a seraph, that is, a fiery serpent, the Gnostic Agatodaemon, probably. Note on the eagle and the animals. The animals regarded as sacred in the Bible are not few. The goat, for one, the Azazel, or God of Victory. As Aben Ezra says, If thou art capable of comprehending the mystery of Azazel, thou wilt learn the mystery of his, God's, name, for it has similar associates in scriptures. I will tell thee by allusion one portion of the mystery. When thou shalt have thirty-three years of age, thou wilt comprehend me. So with the mystery of the tortoise, rejoicing over the poetry of biblical metaphors, associating with the name of Jehovah, incandescent stones, sacred animals, etc., and quoting from the Bible de Vence, volume 19, page 318, a French pious writer says, Indeed, all of them are Elohim like their God, for these angels assume, through a holy usurpation, the very divine name of Jehovah each time they represent him. Pneumatology, Volume 2, page 294. No one ever doubted that the name must have been assumed, when under the guise of the infinite, one incognizable, the Malachim, messengers, descended to eat and drink with men. But if the Elohim, and even lower beings, assuming the God-name, were and are still worshipped, why should the same Elohim be called devils, when appearing under the names of other gods? End of note. Note on the Gnostic Agathodaemon. The choice is curious, and shows how paradoxical were the first Christians in their selections. For why should they have chosen these symbols of Egyptian paganism, when the eagle is never mentioned in the New Testament save once, when Jesus refers to it as a carrion eater, Matthew chapter 24, verse 28. And in the Old Testament it is called unclean, that the lion is made a point of comparison with Satan, both roaring for men to devour, and the oxen are driven out of the temple. On the other hand, the serpent, brought as an exemplar wisdom to follow, is now regarded as the symbol of the devil. The esoteric pearl of Christ's religion, degraded into Christian theology, may indeed be said to have chosen a strange and unfitting shell to be born in and evolved from. End of note. As explained, the sacred animals and the flames or sparks within the Holy Four refer to the prototypes of all that is found in the universe in the divine thought, in the root, which is the perfect cube, or the foundation of the cosmos collectively and individually. They have all an occult reference to primordial cosmic forms, and its first concretions, work, and evolution. In the earliest Hindu exoteric cosmogonies, it is not even the Demiurge who creates, for it is said in one of the Puranas that the great architect of the world gives the first impulse to the rotary motion of our planetary system by stepping in turn over each planet and body. It is this action that causes each sphere to turn around itself and all around the sun, after which action it is the Paramandika, the solar and lunar Petris, the Dionikochans, who take charge of their respective spheres, earths and planets, to the end of the Kalpa. The creators are the Rishis, most of whom are credited with the authorship of the mantras or hymns of the Rig Veda. They are sometimes seven, sometimes ten, when they become Prajapati, the Lord of Beings. Then they re-become the seven and the fourteen Manus, as the representatives of the seven and fourteen cycles of existence, days of Brahma, thus answering to the seven aeons, when, at the end of the first stage of evolution, they are transformed into the seven stellar rishis, the Saptarishis, while their human doubles appear as heroes, kings, and sages on this earth. The esoteric doctrine of the East having thus furnished and struck the keynote, 
which is as scientific as it is philosophical and poetical, which may be seen under its allegorical garb, every nation has followed its lead. It is from the exoteric religions that we have to dig out the root idea before we turn to esoteric truths, lest the latter should be rejected. Furthermore, every symbol in every national religion may be read esoterically, and the proof furnished for its being correctly read by transliterating it into its corresponding numerals and geometrical forms, by the extraordinary agreement of all, however much the glyphs and symbols may vary among themselves. For in the origin, those symbols were all identical. Take, for instance, the opening sentences in various cosmogonies, in every case, it is either a circle, an egg, or a head. Darkness is always associated with this first symbol and surrounds it, as shown in the Hindu, the Egyptian, the Chaldeo Hebrew, and even the Scandinavian systems. Hence, black ravens, black doves, black waters, and even black flames, the seventh tongue of Agni, the fire god being called Kali, the black, as it was a black flickering flame. Two black doves flew from Egypt, and settling on the oaks of Dodona, gave their names to the Grecian gods. Noah lets out a black raven after the deluge, which is a symbol for the cosmic pralaya, after which began the real creation or evolution of our earth and humanity. Udin's black ravens fluttered around the goddess Saga, and whispered to her of the past and of the future. What is the real meaning of all those black birds? They are all connected with the primeval wisdom, which flows out of the pre-cosmic source of all, symbolized by the head, the circle, the egg, and they all have an identical meaning and relate to the primordial archetypal man, Adam Kadmon, the creative origin of all things, which is composed of the host of cosmic powers, the creative Dian Kochans, beyond which all is darkness. Let us inquire of the wisdom of the Kabbalah, even veiled and distorted as it now is, to explain in its numerical language an approximate meaning, at least of the word raven. This is its number value as given in the source of measures. The term raven is used but once, and taken as eth horeb equals 678, or 113 by 6, while the dove is mentioned five times. Its value is 71, and 71 by 5 equals 355. Six diameters, or the raven, crossing, would divide the circumference of a circle of 355 into 12 parts, or compartments, and 355 subdivided for each unit by 6 would equal 213 zero or the head, beginning in the first verse of Genesis. This divided or subdivided after the same fashion by 2, or the 355 by 12, would equal 213 minus 0, or the head, beginning in the first verse of Genesis. This divided or subdivided after the same fashion by 2, or the 355 by 12, would give 213 minus 2, or the word drash, or the first word of Genesis, with its prepositional prefix, signifying the same concrete or general form, astronomically, with the one here intended. Now the secret reading of the first verse of Genesis begin. In Rash, Birash, or Head, developed gods, the heavens and the earth. It is easy to comprehend the esoteric meaning of the raven, once that the like meaning of the flood or Noah's deluge is ascertained. Whatever the many other meanings of this emblematical allegory may be, its chief meaning is that of a new cycle and a new round, our fourth round. Note. Bryant is right in saying, Druid Bardessin says of Noah that when he came out of the ark, the birth of a new cycle, after a stay therein for a year and a day, that 364 plus 1 equals 365 days, he was congratulated by Neptune upon his birth from the waters of the flood, who wished him a happy new year. 
The year, or cycle esoterically, was the new race of men born from woman after the separation of the sexes, which is the secondary meaning of the allegory, its primary meaning being the beginning of the fourth round, or the new creation. End of note. The raven, or the earth horib, yields the same numerical value as the head, and returned not to the ark, while the dove returned, carrying the olive branch. When Noah, the new man of the new race, whose prototype is Vaivasvata Manu, prepared to leave the ark, the womb, or arga, of terrestrial nature, is the symbol of the pure spiritual sexless and androgyne man of the first three races who vanished from the earth for ever. Numerically, Jehovah, Adam, Noah, are one in the Kabbalah. At best, then, it is deity descending on the Ararat, later on Sinai, to incarnate in man his image, through the natural process henceforth, the mother's womb, whose symbols are the ark, the mount, Sinai, etc., in Genesis. The Jewish allegory is at once astronomical and purely physiological rather than anthropomorphic. And here lies the abyss between the two systems, Aryan and Semitic, though built on the same foundation. As shown by an expounder of the Kabbalah, the basic idea underlying the philosophy of the Hebrews was that God contained all things within himself, and that man was his image. Man, including woman, as androgynes, and that geometry and numbers and measures applicable to astronomy are contained in the terms man and woman and apparent incongruity of such a mode was eliminated by showing the connection of man and woman with a particular system of numbers and measures and geometry by the parturient time periods which furnished the connecting link between the terms and the facts shown and perfected the mode used it is argued that the primal cause being absolutely incognizable the symbol of its first comprehensible manifestation was the conception of a circle with its diameter line, so at once to carry the idea of geometry, phallicism, and astronomy, and this was finally applied to the signification of simply human generative organs. Note, unpublished manuscripts, but see source of measures, end of note. Hence the whole cycle of events, from Adam and the patriarchs down to Noah, is made to apply to phallic and astronomical uses, the one regulating the other, as the lunar periods, for instance. Hence, too, the genesis begins after their coming out of the ark and the close of the flood at the fourth race. With the Aryan people it is different. Eastern esotericism has never degraded the one infinite deity, the container of all things, to such uses. And this is shown by the absence of Brahma from the Rig Veda and the modest possessions occupied therein by Rudra and Vishnu, who became the powerful and great gods, the infinities of the exoteric creeds, ages later. But even they, creators as the three may be, are not the direct creators and forefathers of men. The latter are shown occupying a still lower scale, and are called prajapatis, the pithris, or lunar ancestors, etc., etc., never the one infinite god. Esoteric philosophy shows only physical man as creator. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis Part 2, The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order, with Explanatory Sections. Section 13, The Seven Creations there was neither day nor night, nor sky nor earth, nor darkness nor light, nor any other thing save only one, unapprehensible by intellect, or that which is Brahma and Pumis, spirit, and Pradhana, crude matter. Veda, Vishnu Purana, commentary. Or literally, one Pradhanika, Brahma spirit, that was. The Pradhanika Brahma spirit is Mulaprakriti and Parabamam. In Vishnu Purana, Parasara says to Maitreya, his pupil, I have thus explained to you, excellent Muni, six creations. 
the creation of the aravaks rotas beings was the seventh and was that of man then he proceeds to speak of two additional and very mysterious creations variously interpreted by the commentators origen commentating upon the books written by celsus his opponent books which were all destroyed by the prudent church fathers evidently answers the objections of his contradictor and reveals his system at the same time this was evidently septenary but his theogony the genesis of the stars or planets that of sound and colour all found as an answer satire and no better celsus you see desiring to exhibit his learning speaks of a ladder of creation with seven gates and on the top of it the eighth ever closed the mysteries of the persian mithras are explained and musical reasons moreover are added and to these again he strives to add a second explanation connected also with musical considerations that is with the seven notes of the scale the seven spirits of the stars etc etc note origen contra celso b six chapter twenty two end of note Valentinus expatiates upon the power of the great seven, who were called to bring forth this universe after Aritus, or the ineffable, whose name is composed of seven letters, had represented the first hebdomad. This name, Aritus, is one to indicate the sevenfold nature of the one, the Logos. The goddess Rhea, says Proclus in Timaeus, page one to one, is a monad, duad, and heptad, comprehending in herself all the titanide who are seven. The seven creations are found in almost every Purana. They are all preceded by what Wilson translates the indiscreet principle, absolute spirit, independent of any relation with objects of sense. They are one, Mahatava, the universal soul, infinite intellect. Or divine mind. Two, Buddha, or Buddha Sarga, elemental creation, the first differentiation of universal indiscrete substance. Three, Indriya or Aindriyaka, organic evolution. These three were the Prakrita creations, the developments of indiscrete nature preceded by indiscrete principle. Four, Mukya, the fundamental creation of perceptible things, was that of inanimate bodies. Note, the text says, And the fourth creation is here the primary, for things immovable and emphatically known as primary. See Fitzwood Hall's Corrections. End of note. 5. Tyria Gionia, or Tyriax Rotas, was that of animals. 6. Urdvas Rotas, or that of divinities, in brackets question mark. Note, how can divinities have been created after the animals? The esoteric meaning of the expression animals is the germs of all animal life, including man. Man is called a sacrificial animal, and an animal that is the only one among animal creation who sacrifices to the gods. Moreover, by the sacred animals, the twelve signs of the zodiac are often meant in the sacred texts, as already stated. End of note. 7. Arvaksrotas was that of man. See Vishnu Purana. This is the order given in the exoteric texts. According to esoteric teaching, there are seven primary and seven secondary, quote, creations, unquote. The former being the forces self-evolving from the one causeless force, the latter showing the manifested universe emanating from the already differentiated divine elements. Esoterically, as well as exoterically, all the above enumerated creations stand for the seven periods of evolution, whether after an age or a day of Brahma. This is the teaching par excellence of occult philosophy, which, however, never uses the term creation, nor even that of evolution. 
with regard to primary creation, but calls all such forces the aspects of the causeless force. In the Bible, the seven periods are dwarfed into the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, and the Westerns adhere to the latter. In the Hindu philosophy, when the active creator has produced the world of gods, the germs of all the undifferentiated elements and the rudiments of future senses, the world of Noumena, in short, the universe remains unaltered for a day of Brahma, a period of four billion three hundred and twenty million years. This is the seventh passive period of the Sabbath day of Eastern philosophy that follows six periods of active evolution. In the Satapata Brahmana, Brahma, Nuta, the absolute cause of all causes, radiates the gods. Having radiated the gods through its inherent nature, the work is interrupted. In the first book of Manu it is said, at the expiration of each night, Pralaya. Brahma, having been asleep, awakes and, through the soul energy of the motion, causes to emanate from itself the spirit, which in its essence is and yet is not. In the Sefer Jizaira, the Kabbalistic book of creation, the author has evidently repeated the words of Manu. In it, the divine substance is represented as having alone existed from the eternity, boundless and absolute, and as having emitted from itself the spirit. One is the spirit of the living God, blessed be his name, who liveth for ever. Voice, spirit, and word, this is the Holy Spirit. Sefer Jizaira, Chapter 1, Mishnah 9 and this is the Kabbalistic abstract trinity, so unceremoniously anthropomorphized by the fathers. From this triple one emanated the whole cosmos. First from one emanated number two, or air, the creative element, and then number three, water, proceeded from the air. Ether or fire complete the mystic four, the Arba'il, from the same source. In the Eastern doctrine, fire is the first element, ether, synthesizing the whole, since it contains all of them. In the Vishnu Purana, the whole seven periods are given, and the progressive evolution of spirit soul and of the seven forms of matter or principles are shown. It is impossible to enumerate them in this work. The reader is asked to peruse one of the Puranas. Ah, Yehuda began, it is written. Elohim said, let there be a firmament in the midst of waters, at the time that the Holy created the world. He, they, created seven heavens above. He created seven earths below, seven seas, seven days, seven rivers, seven weeks, seven years, seven times, and seven thousand years that the world has been, the seventh of all the millennium. So here are seven earths below, they are all inhabited except those which are above and those below. And between each earth a heaven, firmament, is spread out between each other. And there are in them, these earths, creatures who look different from each other. But if you object and say that all the children of the world came out from Adam, it is not so. And the lower earths, where do they come from? They are from the chain of the earth, and from the heaven below, etc., etc. Note, Kabbalah, page 415 to 16, by T. Mayer, Philadelphia. End of note. Irenaeus is our witness, and a very unwilling one, too, that the Gnostics taught the same system veiling very carefully the true esoteric meaning. This veiling, however, is identical with that of the Vishnu Purana and others. Thus, Irenaeus writes of the Marcosians. They maintain that first of all the four elements, fire, water, earth and air, were produced after the image of the primary tetrad above, and that then if we add their operations, namely heat, cold, dryness, and moisture, 
an exact likeness of the Ogdoad is presented. From Book 1, Chapter 17. Only this likeness and the Ogdoad itself is a blind, just as in the seven creations of the Vishnu Puranyas, to which two more are added, of which the eighth, termed Anugraha, possesses both the qualities of goodness and darkness, a Sankhyan more than a Puranic idea. For Irenaeus says again, Book 1, Chapter 30, Verse 6, that they, the Gnostics, had a like eighth creation, which was good and bad, divine and human. They affirm that man was formed on the eighth day. Sometimes they affirm that he was made on the sixth day, and at others on the eighth, unless perchance they mean that his earthly part was formed on the sixth day, and his fleshly part, in brackets question mark, on the eighth day these two being distinguished by them. They were so distinguished, but not as Irenaeus gives it. The Gnostics had a superior hebdomad, as an inferior one in heaven, and a third a terrestrial hebdomad, on the plane of matter. Yao, the mystery god and the regent of the moon, as given in Origen's chart, was the chief of these superior seven heavens, hence identical with the chief of the lunar Petris, that name being given by them to the lunar Dionkochans. Note, superior to the spirits or heavens of the earth only. End of note. Quote, they affirm that these seven heavens are intelligent and speak of them as being angels, unquote, writes the same Irenaeus, and adds that on this account they termed Yao Hebdomas, while his mother was called Ogduas, because, as he explains, she preserved the number of the first begotten and primary Ogduad of the Pleroma, from the same source, Book 1, verse 2. This first begotten Ogduad was A, in Theogony, the second Logos, the manifested, because he was born of the sevenfold first Logos, hence he is the eighth on this manifested plane, and B, in astrolatry, it was the son, Martanda, the eighth son of Aditi, whom she rejects while preserving her seven sons, the planets. For the ancients have never regarded the sun as a planet, but as a central and fixed star. This, then, is the second hebdomad born of the seven rayed one, Agni, the sun, and what not, only not the seven planets, which are Surya's brothers, not his sons. These astral gods, whose chief with the Gnostics was Ilda Baut, from Ilda, child, and Baut, the egg, the son of the Pleroma, was his Ilda Baut's son. Note. See Isis Unveil, Volume 2, page 183, end of note. He produces from himself these six stellar spirits, Jove, Jehovah, Sabaoth, Adonai, Elui, Osuraios, Astaphaios, and it is they who are the second or inferior Hebdomad. Note, see also King's Gnostics, other sects regarded Jehovah, as Ildabaoth himself. King identifies him with Saturn. End of note. As to the third, it is composed of the seven primeval men, the shadows of the lunar gods, projected by the first Hebdomad. In this, the Gnostics did not, as seen, differ much from the esoteric doctrine, except that they veiled it. As to the charge made by Irenaeus, who was evidently ignorant of the true tenets of the heretics, with regard to man being created on the sixth day and man being created on the eighth. This relates to the mysteries of the inner man. It will become comprehensible to the reader only after he has read Book Two and understood well the anthropogenesis of the esoteric doctrine. Ildabaoth is a copy of Manu. The latter boasts, O best of twice-born men, Know that I, Manu, am he, the creator of all this world, whom that male Viraj spontaneously produced. 1. Verse 33. He first creates the ten lords of being, the Prajapatis, 
who, as verse 36 says, produce seven other Manus, the ordinances of Manu. Ildabaoth does likewise. I am father and God, and there is no one above me, he exclaims, for which his mother coolly puts him down by saying, Do not lie, Ildabaoth, for the father of all, the first man, Anthropos, is above thee, and so is Anthropos, the son of Anthropos. Irenaeus, Book 1, Chapter 30, Verse 6 This is a good proof that there were three Logui besides the seven born of the first, one of these being the solar Logos, and again, who was that Anthropos himself, so much higher than Ildabaoth? The Gnostic records alone can solve this riddle. In Pistisophia, the four-vowled name, Yeov, is in each case accompanied by the epithet of the primal, or first man. This shows again that the Gnosis were but an echo of archaic doctrine. The names answering to Parabram, to Brahm, and Manu, the first thinking man, are composed of one-vowled, three-vowled, and seven-vowled sounds. Marcus, whose philosophy was certainly more Pythagorean than anything else, speaks of revelation to him of the seven heavens sounding each one vowel as they pronounce the seven names of the seven angelic hierarchies. When spirit has permeated every minutest at atom of the seven principles of cosmos, then the secondary creation after the above-mentioned period of rest begins. The Creators Elohim, outline in the second hour the shape of man, says Rabbi Simeon in the Naktamaron of the Hebrews. There are twelve hours in the day, says the Mishnah, and it is during these that creation is accomplished. The twelve hours of the day are again the dwarfed copy, the faint yet faithful echo of primitive wisdom. They are like the twelve thousand divine years of the gods, a cyclic blind, Every day of Brahma has fourteen manus, which the Hebrew Kabbalists, following, however, in this the Chaldeans, have disguised into twelve hours. Note. Elsewhere, however, the identity is revealed. See Supra, the quotation from Ibn Gabriel and his seven heavens, seven earths, etc. End of note. The Nuktomenon of Apollonius of Tiana is the same thing. The uh, dodecadron lies concealed in the perfect cube, says the Kabbalists. The mystic meaning of this is that the twelve great transformations of spirit into matter, the twelve thousand divine years, take place during the four great ages, or the first Mahayuga. Beginning with the metaphysical and the suprahuman, it ends in the physical and purely human natures of cosmos and man. Eastern philosophy can give the number of mortal years that run along the line of spiritual and physical evolutions of the seen and the unseen, if Western science fails to do so. Primary creation is called the creation of light, spirit, and the secondary, that of darkness, matter. Note, this must not be confused with pre-cosmic darkness, the divine all, end of note. Both are found in Genesis chapters 1, verse 2, and at the beginning of chapter 2. The first is the emanation of the self-born gods, Elohim, the second of physical nature. This is why it is said in the Zohar, O companions, companions, man as emanation was both man and woman, as well on the side of the father as on the side of the mother. And this is the sense of the words. And Elohim spoke, Let there be light, and it was light. And this is the twofold man. Light, moreover, on our plane, is darkness in the higher spheres. Man and woman on the side of the father, spirit, refers to primary creation, and on the side of the mother, matter, to the secondary. The twofold man is Adam Kadmon, the male and female abstract prototype, and the differentiated Elohim. Man proceeds from the Diankochan, and is a fallen angel, a god in exile, as will be shown. 
In India, these creations were described as follows: one, mat tatwa creation, so called because it was the primordial self-evolution of that which had to become mahat, the divine mind, conscious and intelligent, esoterically, the spirit of the universal soul, worthiest of ascetics, through its potency, the potency of that cause. Every produced cause comes by its proper nature. Vishnu Purana. Seeing that the potencies of all beings are understood only through the knowledge of Tat, Brahma, which is beyond reasoning, creation, and the like, such potencies are referable to Brahma. Tat then precedes the manifestation. The first was Mahat, says Linga Purana, for the one, the Tat. Is neither first nor last, but all. Exoterically, however, this manifestation is the work of the supreme one, a natural effect, rather, of an eternal cause. Or, as the commentator says, it might have been understood to mean that Brahma was then created, in brackets question mark, being identified with Mahat, active intelligence, or the operating will of the supreme. Esoteric philosophy renders it the operating law. It is on the right comprehension of this tenet in the Brahmanas and Puranas that hangs, we believe, the apple of discord between the three Vedantin sects, the Advaita, Dvaita, and the Visishta Dvaitas. The first arguing rightly that Parabrahman, having no relation as the absolute all to the manifested world, the infinite having no connection with the finite, can neither will nor create, that therefore Brahma, Mahat, Ishvara, or whatever name the creative power may be known by, creative gods and all, are simply an elusive aspect of Parabrahman in the conception of the conceivers, while the other sects identify the impersonal cause with the creator or Ishvara. Mahat, or Mahabuddhi, is, with the Vaishnavas, however, divine mind, in active operation, or, as Anaxagoras has it, an ordering and disposing mind, which was the cause of all things. Nus odia cosmonte kai pantheon aetios. Wilson saw at a glance the suggestive connection between Mahat and the Phoenician Mot, or Mut, who was female with the Egyptians, the goddess Mut, the mother, which, like Mahat, he says, was the first product of the mixture in brackets question mark, of spirit and matter, and the first rudiment of creation. Ex connexione autem ejus spiritus produit mot, from whose seed were created all living things. Repeat Brücke, Book 1, page 240, giving it a still more materialistic and anthropomorphic colouring. Nevertheless, the esoteric sense of the doctrine is seen through every exoteric sentence on the very face of the old Sanskrit texts that treat of primordial creation. The supreme soul, the all permanent sarvaga, substance of the world, having entered, been drawn, into matter, prakriti, and spirit, purusha, agitated the mutable and the immutable principles, the season of creation, manvantara having arrived. Note. The nous of the Greeks, which is a spiritual divine mind, or mens, mahat, operates upon matter in the same way. It enters into and agitates it. Spiritus intus alit, totamque infus operatus, mens agitat molem, et magno se corpore miscet. In the Phoenician cosmogony, spirit mixing with its own principles gives rise to creation also. From Brücke, Book 1, page 240. The Orphic tried shows an identical doctrine, for there, Panis, or Eros, chaos containing crude undifferentiated cosmic matter, and Kronos, time, are the three cooperating principles emanating from the unknowable and concealed point which produce the work of creation. And they are the Hindu Purusha, Phanes, Pradhana, Chaos, and Kala, Kronos, or Time, 
the good Professor Wilson does not like the idea, as no Christian clergyman, however liberal, would. He remarks that, as presently explained, the mixture of the supreme spirit of soul is not mechanical. It is an influence or effect exerted upon intermediate agents which produce effects. The sentence in Vishnu Purana, as fragrance affects the mind from its proximity merely and not from any immediate operation upon mind itself, so the Supreme influenced the elements of creation. The reverend and erudite Sancritist correctly explains. As perfumes do not delight the mind by actual contact, but by the impression they make upon the sense of smelling, which communicates it to the mind, adding, The entrance of the supreme into spirit, as well as matter, is less intelligible than the view elsewhere taken of it, as the infusion of spirit identified with the supreme into prakriti or matter alone. He prefers the verse in Padma Purana, he who is called the male, spirit of Prakriti, that same divine Vishnu entered into Prakriti. This view is certainly more akin to the plastic character of certain verses in the Bible concerning the patriarchs, such as Lot, Genesis 19, verses 34 to 38. And even Adam, in chapter 4, verse 1, and others of a still more anthropomorphic nature, but it is just that which led humanity to phallicism, Christian religion being honeycombed with it, from the first chapter of Genesis down to the Revelation. End of note. Esoteric doctrine teaches that the Diankochans are the collective aggregate of divine intelligence or primordial mind, and that the first manas, the seven mind-born spiritual intelligences, are identical with the former. Hence the Quan Shi Yin, the golden dragon in whom are the seven of stanza three is the primordial logos or brahma the first manifested creative power and the dhyana energies are the manus or manus vayambhuva collectively the direct connection moreover between the manus and mahat is easy to see man is from the root man to think and thinking proceeds from the mind it is in cosmogony the pre-nebula period two the second creation, Buddha, was of the rudimental principles, Tanmatras, thence termed the elemental creation, Buddha Sarga. Note. All these sentences are quoted from Vishnu Purana, Book 1, Chapter 2. End of note. It is the period of the first breath of the differentiation of pre-cosmic elements or matter. Buddhaddi means literally the origin of the elements and precedes Buddha Sarga their creation or differentiation of those elements in primordial akasha, chaos or vacuity. Note, Vishnu is both Bhutisa, lord of the elements and all things, and Vishwarupa, universal substance or soul. End of note. In the Vishnu Purana it is said to proceed along and belong to the triple aspect of Ankara, translated egotism, but meaning rather that untranslatable term the I amness, that which first issues from Mahat or divine mind, the first shadowy outline of selfhood, for pure Ahankara becomes passionate and finally rudimental, initial. It is the origin of conscious as of all unconscious being, though the esoteric school rejects the idea of anything being unconscious, save on this our plane of illusion and ignorance. At this stage of the second creation, the second hierarchy of the manas appear, the Diankochans or Divas, who are the origin of form, Rupa. The Chitrasi Kandina, bright crested, or the Riksha, those Rishis who have become the informing souls of the seven stars, or the Great Bear. Note, see concerning their post types, the treatise written by Tritemius. Agrippa's master, 16th century, concerning the seven secondaries or spiritual intelligences, who, after God, actuate the universe, giving out, besides secret cycles and several prophecies, certain facts and beliefs about the genii, or the Elohim, which preside over and guide the septenary stages of the world's course. End of note. In astronomical and cosmogonical language, this creation relates to the first stage of cosmic life, 
the fire mist period after its chaotic stage when atoms issue from Laia. Note, from the first, the Orientalists have found themselves beset by great difficulties with regard to any possible order in the Puranic creations. Brahma is very often confused with Brahma by Wilson, for which he is criticized by his successors. The original Sanskrit texts are preferred by Mr. Fitzedward Hall for the translation of Vishnu Purana and texts to those used by Wilson. Had Professor Wilson enjoyed the advantages which are now at the command of the student of Indian philosophy, unquestionably he would have expressed himself differently, as said by the editor of his works. This reminds one of the answer given by one of Thomas Taylor's admirers to those scholars who criticized his translations of Plato. Thomas Taylor may have had less knowledge of the Greek than his critics have, but he understood Plato far better than they do, he said. Our present Orientalists disfigure the mystic sense of the Sanskrit texts far more than Wilson ever did, though the latter is undeniably guilty of very gross errors. End of note. 3. The third, the Indriya, was the modified form of Ankara, the conception of I, from Aham, I, termed the organic creation, or creation of the senses, Aindriyaka. These three were the Prakrita creation, the discrete developments of indiscrete nature preceded by the indiscrete principle. Preceded by ought to be replaced here with beginning by. Buddhi for the latter is neither a discrete nor an indiscrete quantity, but partakes of the nature of both, in man as in cosmos, a unit a human monad on the plane of illusion, when once freed from the three forms of Ahankara and liberated from its terrestrial manas, Buddhi becomes truly a continued quantity, both in duration and extension, because eternal and immortal. Earlier it is stated that the third creation, abounding with the quality of goodness, is termed Urdvasrotas and a page or two further the Urdhavrotas creation is referred to as the sixth creation, that of the divinities. Page 75 This shows plainly that earlier as well as later Manvantaras have been purposely confused to prevent the profane from perceiving the truth. This is called incongruity and contradictions by the Orientalists. Note, quote, the three creations beginning with intelligence are elemental, but the six creations which proceed from the series of which intellect is the first are the work of Brahma, from Vayu Purana. Here, creations mean everywhere stages of evolution. Mahat, intellect or mind, which corresponds with manas, the former being on the cosmic and the latter on the human plane stands here too, lower than buddhi or supra-divine intelligence. Therefore, when we read in Linga Puranya that the first creation was that of Mahat, intellect being the first in manifestation, we must refer that specified creation to the first evolution of our system or even our earth, none of the preceding ones being discussed in the Puranas, but only occasionally hinted at. End of note. This, quote, creation, unquote, of the immortals, the Deva Sarga, is the last of the first series and has a universal reference, namely, to evolutions in general, not specifically to our Manvantara. But the latter begins with the same over and over again, showing that it refers to several distinct kalpas. For it is said, quote, at the close of the past Padma Kalpa, the divine Brahma awoke from his night of sleep and beheld the universe void. Unquote. Then Brahma is shown going once more over the seven creations in the secondary stage of evolution, repeating the first three on the objective plane. Four, the Mukya, the primary, as it begins the series of four. Neither the word inanimate bodies nor yet immovable things, as translated by Wilson, gives a correct idea of the Sanskrit terms used. 
Esoteric philosophy is not the only one to reject the idea of any atom being inorganic, for it is found also in orthodox Hinduism. Moreover, Wilson himself says in his Collected Works, Volume 3, page 381, All the Hindu systems consider vegetable bodies as endowed with life. Karakara, or the synonymous Stavara, and Jangama, is therefore inaccurately rendered by animate and inanimate, sentient beings and unconscious, or conscious and unconscious beings, etc., etc., Locomotive and fixed would be better, since trees are considered to possess souls. Mukya is the creation or organic evolution of the vegetable kingdom. In this secondary period, the three degrees of elemental or rudimental kingdoms are evolved in this world, corresponding inversely in order to the three prakritic creations during the primary period of Brahma's activity. As in that period, in the words of Vishnu Purana, the first creation was that of Mahat, intellect, the second of Tanmatras, rudimental principles, and the third that of the senses, Aindriyaka. In this one, the order of the elemental forces stands thus. 1. The nascent centers of forces, intellectual and physical. 2. The rudimental principles, never force, so to say, and three, nascent a perception, which is the mahat of the lower kingdoms, especially developed in the third order of elementals. These are succeeded by the objective kingdom of minerals, in which latter that a perception is entirely latent, to redevelop only in the plants. The mukya, creation, then, is the middle point between the three lower and the three higher kingdoms, which represent the seven esoteric kingdoms of cosmos as of earth. 5. The Tiryak Sorotas, or Tiryak Yonya creation, that of the sacred animals, corresponding only to earth, to the dumb animal creation. Note, Professor Wilson translates it as though animals were higher on the scale of creation than divinities or angels, although the truth about the devas is very plainly stated further on. This creation, says the text, is both primary, prakrita, and secondary, vaikrita. It is the latter as regards the origin of the gods from Brahma, the personal anthropomorphic creator of our material universe. It is the former primary as affecting Rudra, who is the immediate production of the first principle. Rudra is not alone a title of Shiva, but embraces agents of creation, angels and men, as will be shown further on. End of note. That which is meant by animals in the primary creation is the germ of awakening consciousness or of a perception, that which is faintly traceable in some sensitive plants on earth, and more distinctly in the protistic monora. Note, Neither plant nor animal, but an existence between the two. End of note. On our globe, during the first round, animal, quote, creation, unquote, precedes that of man, while the former, or mammal, evolves from the latter in our fourth round, on the physical plane. In round one, the animal atoms are drawn into a cohesion of human physical form, while in round four, the reverse occurs according to magnetic conditions developed during life. And this is metempsychosis. See Mineral Monad in Five Years of Theosophy, page 276. This fifth stage of evolution, called exoterically creation, may be viewed in both the primary and secondary periods, one as the spiritual and cosmic, the other as the material and terrestrial. It is archibiosis, or life origination, origination so far, of course, as the manifestation of life on all the seven planes is concerned. It is at this period of evolution that the absolutely eternal universal motion, or vibration, that which is called in esoteric language the great breath, differentiates in the primordial first manifested atom. More and more, as chemical and physical sciences progress, does this occult axiom find its corroboration in the world of knowledge? The scientific hypothesis 
that even the simplest elements of matter are identical in nature and differ from each other only owing to the variety of the distributions of atoms in the molecule or speck of substance or by the modes of its atomic vibration gains every day more ground thus as the differentiation of the primordial germ of life has to precede the evolution of the Giancochan of the third group or hierarchy of being in primary creation before those gods can become rupa embodied in their first ethereal form so animal creation has to precede for that same reason divine man on earth and this is why we find in the puranas the fifth the tariagyonya creation was that of animals and six the urdvasrotas creation or that of divinities from vishnu purana book one chapter one but these divinities are simply the prototypes of the first race the fathers of their mind-born progeny with the soft bones note created beings explains vishnu purana although they are destroyed in their individual forms at the periods of dissolution yet being affected by the good or evil acts of former existences are never exempted from their consequences and when brahma produces the world anew they are the progeny of his will collecting his mind into itself yoga willing brahma creates the four orders of beings termed gods demons progenitors and men progenitors meaning the prototypes and evolvers of the first root race of men their progenitors are the pitris and are of seven classes they are said in exoteric mythology to be born of a brahma's side like eve from the rib of adam and of note it is these who became the evolvers of the sweat born an expression explained in book two finally the sixth creation is followed and creation in general closed by seven the evolution of the arvaksvarotas beings which was the seventh and was that of man from vishnu purana book one the eighth creation mentioned is no creation at all it is a blind again for it refers to a purely mental process the cognition of the ninth creation which in its turn is an effect manifesting in the secondary of that which was a creation in the primary prakrita creation note these notions remarks dr wilson the birth of rudra and the saints seem to have been borrowed from the saivas and to have been awkwardly engrafted upon the vaishnava system the esoteric meaning ought to have been consulted before venturing such a hypothesis End of note the eighth then called anugraha the pratyaya sarga or the intellectual creation of the sankhyas explained in karika verse forty six page one four six is that creation of which we have a perception in its esoteric aspect and to which we give intellectual assent anugraha in contradistinction to organic creation it is the correct perception of our relations to the whole range of quote, gods unquote, and especially of those we bear to the kumaras the so-called ninth creation which is in reality an aspect of or reflection of the sixth in our manvantara the vaivashvata there is a ninth the kumara creation which is both primary and secondary says vishnu purana the oldest of such texts note parasara the vedic rishi who received the vishnu purana from pulastya and taught it to maitreya is placed by the orientalists at various epochs as correctly observed in the hindu class their speculations as to his era differ widely from 575 bc to 1391 bc and cannot be trusted quite so but no less however than any other date as assigned by the sanskritists so famous in this department of arbitrary fancy End of note. the kumaras explains an esoteric text are the dhyanis derived immediately from the supreme principle who reappear in the vaivasvata manu period for the progress of mankind 
note. They may indeed mark a special or extra creation, since it is they who, by incarnating themselves within the senseless human shells of the two first root races, and a great portion of the third root race, create, so to speak, a new race, that of thinking, self-conscious, and divine men. End of note. The commentator of the Vishnu Purana corroborates it by remarking that these sages live as long as Brahma, and they are only created by him in the first Kalpa, although their generation is very commonly and inconsistently introduced in the Varaha, or Padma Kalpa, the secondary. Thus, the Kumaras are exoterically the creation of Rudra, or Nila Loita, a form of Shiva, by Brahma, and of certain other mind-born sons of Brahma. But, in the esoteric teaching, they are the progenitors of the true spiritual self in the physical man, the high prajapati, while the pitris, or lower prajapati, are no more than the fathers of the model, or type of his physical form, made in their image. Four, and occasionally five, are mentioned freely in the exoteric texts, three kumaras being secret. Compare what is said of the fallen angels in Book 2. Note. The four Kumaras are the mind-born sons of Brahma. Some specify seven. All these seven Vaidhatra, the patronymic of the Kumaras, the maker's sons, are mentioned and described in Ishvara Krishna's Sankhya Karika, with the commentary of Gaudapadakarya, Sankhya Karas Paraguru, attached to it. It discusses the nature of the Kumaras, though it refrains from mentioning by name all the seven Kumaras, but calls them instead the seven sons of Brahma, which they are, as they are created by Brahma in Rudra. The list of names it gives us is Sanaka, Sanandana, Sanatana, Kapila, Ribu, and Pankashika. But these are again all aliases. End of note. The exoteric four are Sanat Kumara, Sananda, Sanaka, and Sanatana, and the esoteric three are Sana, Kapila, and Sanatsuyata. Special attention is once more drawn to this class of Giancochans, for herein lies the mystery of generation and heredity hinted at in Book One. See the four orders of angelic beings. Comment on Astanza seven. Book two explains their position in their divine hierarchy. Meanwhile, let us see what the exoteric texts say about them. They do not say much, nothing to him who fails to read between the lines. Quote, we must have recourse here to other Puranas for the elucidation of this term, unquote, remarks Wilson, who does not suspect for one moment that he is in the presence of the, quote, angels of darkness, unquote, the mythical great enemy of his church. Therefore, he contrives to elucidate no more than that these divinities, declining to create progeny, and thus rebelling against Brahma, remained, as the name of the first implies, ever boys, kumaras, that is, ever pure and innocent, whence their creation is also called the kumara. Book 1, Chapter 5, Vishnu Purana. Note. So untrustworthy are some translations of the Orientalists that in the French translation of Hadivamsa it is said the seven Prajapati, Rudra, Skanda, his son, and Asanat Kumara proceeded to create beings. Whereas, as Wilson shows, the original is these seven created progeny, and so did Rudra, but Skanda and Sanat Kumara restraining their power, abstained from creation. The four orders of beings are referred to sometimes as Abhamsi, which Wilson renders literally waters, and believes it a mystic term. It is one, no doubt, but he evidently failed to catch the real esoteric meaning. Waters and water stand as the symbol for Akasha, the primordial ocean of space, on which Narayana, the self-born spirit moves, reclining on that which is its progeny. See Manu. Water is the body of Nara. Thus we have heard the name of water explained. Since Brahma rests on the water, therefore he is termed Narayana. 
Linga, Vayu and Markandiya Puranas. Pure Purusha created the waters pure. At the same time, water is the third principle in material cosmos and the third in the realm of the spiritual. Spirit of fire, flame, akasha, ether, water, air, earth are the cosmic, sidereal, psychic, spiritual and mystic principles, preeminently occult. In every plane of being, gods, demons, pitris and men are the four orders of beings to whom the term ambamsi is applied. In the Vedas it is a synonym of gods, because they are all the product of waters, mystically, of the akashic ocean and of the third principle in nature. Petris and men on earth are the transformations, rebirths, of gods and demons, spirits, on a higher plane. What is, in another sense, the feminine principle? Venus Aphrodite is the personified sea and the mother of the god of love, the generator of all the gods as much as the Christian Virgin Mary is Mara, the sea the mother of the western god of love, mercy and charity. If the student of esoteric philosophy thinks deeply over the subject, he is sure to find out all the suggestiveness of the term Abhamsi in its manifold relations to the Virgin in heaven, to the celestial Virgin of the alchemists, and even to the waters of grace of the modern Baptist. End of note. The Puranas, however, may afford a little more light being ever as he was born, he is here called a youth, and hence his name is well known as Sanat Kumara, Linga Purana, Prior Section, 70, 174. In the Saiva Purana, the Kumaras are always described as yogins. The Kurma Purana, after enumerating them, says, These five, O Brahmans, were yogins, who acquired entire exemption from passion. They are five because two of the Kumaras fell. Of all the seven great divisions of Dhyankohans, or Divas, there is none with which humanity is more concerned than with the Kumaras. Imprudent are the Christian theologians who have degraded them into fallen angels, and now call them Satan and demons, as among these heavenly denizens who refuse to create the Archangel Michael, the greatest patron saint of Western and Eastern churches, under his double name of Saint Michael and his supposed copy on earth, Saint George conquering the dragon, has to be allowed one of the most prominent places. See Book 2, The Sacred Dragons and Their Slayers. The Kumaras, the mind-born sons of Brahma Rudra, or Shiva, the howling and terrific destroyer of human passions and physical senses, which are ever in the way of the development of the higher spiritual perceptions and the growth of the inner eternal man mystically, are the progeny of Shiva, the Mahayogi, the greatest patron of all the yogis and mystics of India. Note, Shiva Rudra is the destroyer as Vishnu is the preserver and both are the regenerators of spiritual as well as of physical nature. To live as a plant, the seed must die. To live as a conscious entity in the eternity, the passions and senses of man must first die before his body dies. To live is to die, and to die is to live, has been too little understood in the West. Shiva, the destroyer, is the creator and the savior of spiritual man, as he is the good gardener of nature. He weeds out the plants, human and cosmic, and kills the passions of the physical to call to life the perceptions of the spiritual man. End of note. They themselves, being the virgin ascetics, refuse to create the material being man. Well may they be suspected of a direct connection with the Christian archangel Michael, the virgin combatant of the dragon Apophis whose victim is every soul united too loosely to its immortal spirit. The angel who, as shown by the Gnostics, refused to create just as the Kumaras did. See Book 2, The Mystic Dragons and Their Slayers. Does not that patron angel of the Jews preside over Saturn, Shiva or Rudra, and the Sabbath, 
the day of Saturn? Is he not shown of the same essence with his father, Saturn, and called the son of time, Kronos or Kala, time, a form of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva? And is not old time of the Greeks, with its scythe and sand glass, identical with the ancient of days of the Kabbalists, the latter ancient being one with the Hindu ancient of days, Brahma in his triune form, whose name is also Sanat, the ancient. Every Kumara bears the prefix of Sanat and Sana, is Saturn the planet, Sani and Sara, the king Saturn, whose secretary in Egypt was Tot Hermes I. They are thus identified both with the planet and the god Shiva, who are in their turn shown the prototypes of Saturn, who is the same as Bel, Baal, Shiva, and Jehovah Sabaoth, the angel of whose face is Michael, in Hebrew, who is as God. He is the patron and guardian angel of the Jews, as Daniel tells us, verse 21. And before the Kumaras were degraded by those who were ignorant of their very name into demons and fallen angels, the Greek Ophites, the occultly inclined predecessors and precursors of the Roman Catholic Church after its succession and separation from the primitive Greek Church, had identified Michael with the Ophiomorphos, the rebellious and opposing spirit. This means nothing more than the reverse aspect, symbolically, of Ophis, divine wisdom or Christos. In the Talmud, Michael, Michael, is a prince of water, and the chief of the seven spirits, for the same reason that his prototype, among many others, Sanat Sujata, the chief of the Kumaras, is called Ambhamsi, waters according to the commentary on Vishnu Purana. Why? Because the waters is another name of the great deep, the primordial waters of space or chaos, and also means mother, Amba, meaning Aditi and Akasha, the celestial virgin mother of the visible universe. Furthermore, the waters of the flood are also called the great dragon, or Ophis, Ophiomorphos. The Rudras will be noticed in the septenary character of fire spirits and the symbolism attached to the stanzas in Book 2. There we shall also consider the cross, 3 plus 4, and its primeval and later forms, and shall use for purposes of comparison the Pythagorean numbers side by side with Hebrew metrology. The immense importance of the number seven would thus become evident as a root number of nature. We shall examine it from the standpoints of the Vedas and the Chaldean scriptures, as it existed in Egypt thousands of years before Christ, and as treated in the Gnostic records. We shall show how its importance as a basic number has gained recognition in physical science, and we shall endeavor to prove that the importance attached to the number seven throughout all antiquity was due to no fanciful imaginings of uneducated priests, but to profound knowledge of natural law. Next section is section 14, The Four Elements. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Part 2, The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order, with Explanatory Sections. Section 14, The Four Elements. Metaphysically and esoterically, there is but one element in nature, and at the root of it is the deity, and the so-called seven elements, of which five have already manifested and asserted their existence, are the garment, the veil, of that deity, direct from the essence whereof comes man, whether physically, psychically, mentally, or spiritually considered. Four elements only are generally spoken of in late antiquity, five admitted only in philosophy, for the body of ether is not fully manifested yet, and its noumenon is still the omnipotent father, aether, the synthesis of the rest. 
But what are these elements whose compound bodies have now been discovered by chemistry and physics to contain numberless sub-elements, even the sixty or seventy of which no longer embrace the whole number suspected? Vida Addenda, sections 11 and 12, quotations from Mr. Crook's lectures. Let us follow their evolution from the historical beginnings at any rate. The four elements were fully characterized by Plato when he said that they were that which composes and decomposes the compound bodies. Hence cosmolatry was never, even in its worst aspect, the fetishism which adores or worships the passive external form and matter of any object, but looked ever to the noumenon therein. Fire, air, water, earth were but the visible garb, the symbols of the informing, invisible souls of spirits, the cosmic gods to whom worship was offered by the ignorant and simple, respectful recognition by the wiser. In their turn, the phenomenal subdivisions of the numeral elements were informed by the elementals, so-called, the nature spirits of lower grades. In the Theogony of Muscus, we find ether first, and then the air, the two principles from which Ulum, the intelligible, Nuetos, God, the visible universe of matter, is born. Note. Movers. Foinizer. 282. End of note. In the Orphic hymns, the Eros Fanes evolves from the spiritual egg, which the aetheral winds impregnate, wind being the spirit of God, who is said to move in aether, brooding over the chaos, the divine idea. In the Hindu Katakupanishad, Purusha, the divine spirit already stands before the original matter, from whose union springs the great soul of the world. Maha equals Atma, Brahm, the spirit of life. These latter appellations being again identical with the universal soul, or Anima Mundi, the astral light of the theurgists and Kabbalists, being its last and lowest division. Note. See Weber, Academian Folles, two uh, pages two one three, two one four, etc. End of note. The Stoicheia elements of Plato and Aristotle were thus the incorporeal principles attached to the four great divisions of our cosmic world, and it is with justice that Kreutzer defines those primitive beliefs as a species of magism, a psychic paganism, and a derification of the potencies a spiritualization which placed the believers in a close community with these potencies. From Book 9, page 850. So close, indeed, that the hierarchies of those potencies or forces have been classified on a graduated scale of seven, from the ponderable to the imponderable. They are septenary, not as an artificial aid to facilitate their comprehension, but in their real cosmic gradation, from their chemical or physical to their purely spiritual composition. Gods with the ignorant masses, gods independent and supreme, demons with the fanatics, who, intellectual as they often may be, are unable to understand the spirit of the philosophical sentence in pluribus unum. With the hermetic philosopher, they are forces relatively blind or intelligent, according to which of the principles in them he deals with. It required long millenniums before they found themselves in our cultured age finally degraded into simple chemical elements. At any rate, good Christians, and especially the biblical Protestants, ought to show more reverence for the four elements if they would show any for Moses. For the Bible manifests the consideration and mystic significance in which they were held by the Jewish lawgiver on every page of the Pentateuch. The tent which contained the Holy of Holies was a cosmic symbol, sacred in one of its meanings, to the elements, the four cardinal points, and ether. Eusephus shows it built in white, the color of ether, and this explains also why, in the Egyptian and the Hebrew temples, according to Clement Alexandrinus, a gigantic curtain supported by five pillars separated the Sanctum Sanctorum, now represented by the altar in Christian churches, wherein the priests alone were permitted to enter from the part accessible to the profane. 
By its four colors, the curtain symbolized the four principal elements, and signified the knowledge of the divine that the five senses of men can enable man to acquire with the help of the four elements. See Stromata, Book 1, Chapter 5, Section 6. In Cora's ancient fragments, one of the Chaldean oracles expresses ideas about the elements and ether in language singularly like that of the unseen universe, written by two eminent scientists of our day. Now a quote from Isis Unveiled. It states that from ether have come all things, and to it all will return, that the images of all things are indelibly impressed upon it, and that it is the storehouse of the germs or of the remains of all visible forms, and even ideas. It appears as if this case strangely corroborates our assertion that whatever discoveries may be made in our days will be found to have been anticipated by many thousand years by our simple-minded ancestors. From Isis Unveiled Whence came the four elements and the Malachim of the Hebrews? They have been made to emerge by a theological slate of hand on the part of the rabbins and the later fathers of the church into Jehovah, but their origin is identical with that of the cosmic gods of all other nations. Their symbols, whether born on the shores of the Oxus, on the burning sands of Upper Egypt, or in the wild forests, weird and glacial, which covers the slopes and peaks of the sacred snow mountains of Thessaly, or again in the pampas of America, their symbols, we repeat, when traced to their source, are ever one and the same. Whether Egyptian or Pulaskian, Aryan or Semitic, the genius Loki, the local god, embraced in its unity all nature, but not especially the four elements any more than one of their creations, such as trees, rivers, mounds, or stars. The genius Loki, a very late afterthought of the last sub-races of the fifth root race, when the primitive and grandiose meaning had become nearly lost, was ever the representative in his accumulated titles of all his colleagues. It was the god of fire, symbolized by thunder, as Jove or Agni, the god of water, symbolized by the fluvial bull or some sacred river or fountain, as Varunya, Neptune, etc., the god of air, manifesting in the hurricane and tempest, as Vayu and Indra, and the god of spirit of the earth, who appeared in earthquakes, like Pluto, Yama, and so many others. These were the cosmic gods, ever synthesizing all in one, as found in every cosmogony or mythology. Thus the Greeks had the Dodonian Jupiter, who included in himself the four elements and the four cardinal points, and who was recognized, therefore, in all Rome under the pantheistic title of Jupiter Mundus, and who now, in modern Rome, has become the Deus Mundus, the one mundane god who is made to swallow all other, in the latest theology, by the arbitrary decision of his special ministers. As gods of fire, air, water, they were celestial gods. As gods of the lower region, they were infernal deities, the latter adjective applying simply to the earth. They were spirits of the earth under their respective names of Yama, Pluto, Osiris, the lord of the lower kingdoms, etc., etc., and their tellurial character proves it sufficiently. Note, the Gehenna of the Bible was a valley near Jerusalem, where the monotheistic Jews emulated their children to Moloch, if the prophet Jeremiah is to be believed on his word. The Scandinavian Hel, or Hela, was a frigid region, again Kamaloka, and in Egyptian Amenti, a place of purification. See Isis Unveil, Volume 2, page 11. End of note. The ancients knew of no worse abode after death than the Kamaloka, the limbus on this earth. If it is argued that the Dodonian Jupiter was identified with Adonius, the king of the subterranean world, and Dis, or the Roman Pluto and the Dionysius, Ctonius, the subterranean wherein, according to Kreutzer, Book 1, Volume 6, Chapter 1, oracles were rendered, then it would become the pleasure of the occultists to prove that both Adonius and Dionysius 
are the basis of Adonai or Jurbo Adonai, as Jehovah is called in Codex Nazareus. Thou shalt not worship the son who is named Adonai, whose name is also Kadush and El El, from Codex Nazareus 1.47. See also Psalm 89, verse 18, and also Lord Bacchus. Baladonis of the Sods, or mysteries of the pre-Babylonian Jews, became Adonai by the Masra, the late avowed Jehovah. Hence the Roman Catholics are right. All these Jupiters are of the same family, but Jehovah has to be included therein to make it complete. Jupiter Aerius or Pan, the Jupiter Ammon, and the Jupiter Belmolo are all correlations and one with Yurbo Adonai because they are all one cosmic nature. It is that nature and power which create the specific terrestrial symbol, and the physical and material fabric of the latter which proves the energy manifesting through it as extrinsic. For primitive religion was something better than a simple preoccupation about physical phenomena, as remarked by Schelling and principles more elevated than we modern Sadducees know of were hidden under the transparent veil of such merely natural divinities as thunder, the winds, and rain. The ancients knew and could distinguish the corporeal from the spiritual elements in the forces of nature. The fourfold Jupiter, as the four-faced Brahma, the aerial, the fulgurant, the terrestrial, and the marine god, the lord and master of the four elements, may stand as a representative for the great cosmic gods of every nation. While passing power over the fire to Hephaestus Vulcan, over the sea to Poseidon Neptune, and over the earth to Pluto Aidonius, the aerial Jove was all these, for Aether from the first had a pre-eminence over and was the synthesis of all the elements. Tradition points to a grotto, a vast cave in the deserts of Central Asia, wherein light pours through its four seemingly natural apertures of clefts placed crossways at the four cardinal points of the place. From noon till an hour before sunset, that light streams in of four different colours, as avert red, blue, orange, gold, and white, owing to some either natural or artificially prepared conditions of vegetation and soil, the light converges in the centre around a pillar of white marble with a globe upon it, which represents our earth. It is named the Grotto of Zarathustra. When included under the arts and sciences of the fourth race, the Atlanteans, the phenomenal manifestation of the four elements justly attributed by the believers in cosmic gods to the intelligent interference of the latter, assumed a scientific character. The magic of the ancient priests consisted in those days in addressing their gods in their own language. The speech of the men of the earth cannot reach the lords. Each must be addressed in the language of his respective element, is a sentence which will be shown pregnant with meaning. The Book of Rules cited adds an explanation of the nature of that element language. It is composed of sounds, not words of sounds, numbers, and figures. He who knows how to blend the three will call forth the response of the superintending power, the regent god of the specific element needed. Thus this language is that of incantations, of mantras, as they are called in India, sound being the most potent and effectual magic agent, and the first of the keys which opens the door of communication between mortals and the immortals. He who believes in the words and teachings of St. Paul has no right to pick out from the latter those sentences only that he chooses to accept to the rejection of others. And St. Paul teaches most undeniably the existence of cosmic gods and their presence among us. Paganism preached a dual and simultaneous evolution. Creation, spiritualum ac mundanum, as the Roman Church has it, ages before the advent of the Roman Church. Exoteric phraseology has changed little with respect to divine hierarchies since the most palmy days of paganism or idolatry. Names alone have changed, along with claims which have now become false pretenses. For when Plato put in the mouth of the highest principle, 
Father Aether, or Jupiter, these words, for instance, the gods of the gods of whom I am the maker, opifex, as I am the father of all their works, operum caparans. He knew the spirit of this sentence as fully, we suspect, as did St. Paul, when saying, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, etc., First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, note, we cannot be taken to task by the Protestants for interpreting the verse from the Corinthians as we do. For if the translation in the English Bible is made ambiguous, it is not so in the original text, and the Roman Catholic Church accepts the words of the Apostle in their true sense. For a proof, see the commentaries on St. Paul's Epistles by St. John Chrysostom, directly inspired by the Apostle and who wrote on his dictation, as we are assured by the Marquis de Mervie, whose works are approved by Rome. And St. Chrysostom says, commenting on that spiritual verse, and although there are in fact they who are called gods, for it seems there are really several gods, worthy, and for all that the god principle, and the superior god ceasing to remain essentially one and indivisible, Thus spoke the old initiates also, knowing that worship of minor gods could never affect the god principle. See de Merville, Des Esprits, Volume 2, page 322. End of note. Both knew the sense and the meaning of what they put forward in such guarded terms. Says Sir W. Grove, F.R.S., speaking of the correlation of forces, the ancients when they witnessed a natural phenomenon removed from ordinary analogies and unexplained by any mechanical action known to them referred it to a soul a spiritual or pre-natural power air and gases were also at first deemed spiritual but subsequently they became invested with a more material character and the same words pneuma spirit etc were used to signify the soul or a gas the very word gas, from geist, a ghost or spirit, affords us an instance of the gradual transmutation of a spiritual into a physical conception. From page 89. This, the great man of science, in his preface to the fifth edition of Correlation of Physical Forces, considers as the only concern of exact science, which has no business to meddle with the causes. Cause and effect, he explains, are therefore, in the abstract relation to these forces, words solely of convenience. We are totally unacquainted with the ultimate generating power of each and all of them, and probably shall ever remain so. We can only ascertain the norma of their actions. We must humbly refer their causation to one omnipresent influence, and content ourselves with studying their effects and developing, by experiment, their mutual relations. Page 14. This policy once accepted and the system virtually admitted in the above quoted words, namely the spirituality of the ultimate generating power, it would be more than illogical to refuse to recognize this quality which is inherent in the material elements, or rather in their compounds, as present in the fire, air, water, or earth. The ancients knew these powers so well that, while concealing their true nature under various allegories for the benefit or to the detriment of the uneducated rabble, they never departed from the multiple object in view while inverting them. They contrived to throw a thick veil over the nucleus of truth concealed by the symbol, but they ever tried to preserve the latter as a record for future generations, sufficiently transparent to allow their wise men to discern that truth behind the fabulous form of their glyph or allegory. They are accused of superstition and credulity, those ancient sages, and this by those very nations which learned in all the modern arts and sciences, cultured and wise in their generation, accept to this day as their one living and infinite God, the anthropomorphic Jehovah of the Jews. What were some of the alleged superstitions? Hesiod believed, for instance, that the winds were the sons of the giant Typhoeus, 
who were chained and unchained at will by Aeolus, and the polytheistic Greeks accepted it along with Hesiod. Why should not they, since the monotheistic Jews had the same beliefs with other names for their dramatis personae, and since Christians believe in the same to this day, the Hesiodic Aeolus, Boreas, etc., were named Kadim, Tsaphon, Daron, and Ruach Hajan by the quote, chosen people unquote, of Israel. What is then the fundamental difference? Why the Hellenes were taught that Aeolus tied and untied the winds, the Jews believed as fervently that their Lord God, with smoke coming out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth, rode upon the cherub and did fly, and was seen upon the wings of the wind. 2 Samuel uh, 22, 9 and 11 The expressions of the two nations are either both figures of speech, or both superstitions. We think they are neither, but only arise from a keen sense of oneness with nature, and a perception of the mysterious and the intelligent behind every natural phenomenon which the moderns no longer possess. Nor was it superstitious in the Greek pagans to listen to the oracle of Delphi, when at the approach of the fleet of Circes, that oracle advised them to sacrifice to the winds, if the same has to be regarded as divine worship in the Israelites, who sacrificed as often to the wind and fire, especially to the latter element. Do they not say that their God is a consuming fire? Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, who appeared generally as fire, and encompassed by fire, and did not Elias seek for him the Lord in the great strong wind and in the earthquake? Do not the Christians repeat the same after them? Do not they, moreover, sacrifice to this day to the same God of wind and water? They do, because special prayers for rain, dry weather, trade winds, and the calming of storms on the seas exist to this hour in the prayer books of the three Christian churches. And the several hundred sects of the Protestant religion offer them to their God upon every threat of calamity. The fact that they are no more answered by Jehovah than they were probably by Jupiter Pluvius does not alter the fact of these prayers being addressed to the power of powers supposed to rule over the elements, or of these powers being identical in paganism and Christianity, or have we to believe that such prayers are crass idolatry and absurd superstition only when addressed by a pagan to his idol, and that the same superstition is suddenly transformed into praiseworthy piety and religion whenever the name of the celestial addressee is changed. But the tree is known by its fruit, and the fruit of the Christian tree being no better than that of the tree of paganism, why should the former command more reverence than the latter? Thus, when we are told by the Chevalier Drac, a converted Jew, and the Marquis de Merville, a Roman Catholic fanatic of the French aristocracy, that in Hebrew lightning is a synonym of a fury, and is always handled by an evil spirit, that Jupiter Fulgu, or Fulgurans, is also called by the Christian Elysius, and denounced as the soul of lightning, the demon. We have either to apply the same explanation and definitions to the Lord God of Israel under the same circumstances, or renounce our right of abusing the gods and creeds of other nations. Note on its daemon, Cosmolatry, page 415. The foregoing statements, emanating as they do from the two ardent and learned Roman Catholics, are, to say the least, dangerous in the presence of the Bible and its prophets. Indeed, if Jupiter, the chief daemon of the pagan Greeks, hurled his deadly thunderbolts and lightnings at those who excited his wrath, so did the Lord God of Abraham and Jacob. We find in the second book of Samuel that uh, the Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows, thunderbolts, and scattered them, Saul's armies, with lightning, and discomforted them. Chapter 22, verse 14 and 15. The Athenians are accused of having sacrificed to Boreas, and this, quote, demon, unquote, is charged with having submerged and wrecked four hundred ships of the Persian fleet on the rocks of Mount Pelion, and of having become so furious that all the Magi of Circus could hardly counteract it by offering contra-sacrifices to Tetis. 
from Herodotus, Polymander. Um, let's see now. 190. Very fortunately, no authenticated instance is on the records of Christian wars showing a like catastrophe on the same scale happening to one Christian fleet owing to the, quote, prayers, unquote, of its enemy, another Christian nation. But this is from no fault of theirs, for each prays as ardently to Jehovah for the destruction of the other as the Athenians prayed to Boreas. Both resorted to a neat little piece of black magic, con amore, such abstinence from divine interference being hardly due to lack of prayers sent to a common almighty god for mutual destruction where then shall we draw the line between pagan and christian and who can doubt that all protestant england would rejoice and offer thanks to the lord if during some future war four hundred ships of the hostile fleet were to be wrecked owing to such holy prayers what is, then, the difference, we ask again, between a Jupiter, a Boreas, and a Jehovah? No more than this. The crime of one's own next of kin, say one's father, is always excused and often exalted, whereas the crime of our neighbor's parent is ever gladly punished by hanging. Yet the crime is the same. So far the, quote, blessings of Christianity, unquote do not seem to have made any appreciable advance on the morals of the converted pagans. The above is not a defense of pagan gods, nor is it an attack on the Christian deity, nor does it mean belief in either. The writer is quite impartial and rejects the testimony in favor of either, neither praying to, believing in, or dreading any such personal and anthropomorphic god. The parallels are brought forward simply as one more curious exhibition of the illogical and blind fanaticism of the civilized theologian. For, so far, there is not a very great difference between the two beliefs, and there is none in their respective effects upon morality or spiritual nature. The, quote, light of Christ, unquote, shines upon as hideous features of the animal man now as the, quote, light of Lucifer, unquote, did in days of old. Quote, Those unfortunate heathens, in their superstition, regard even the elements as something that has a comprehension. They still have faith in their idol vine, the god or rather demon of the wind and air. They firmly believe in the efficiency of their prayers, and in the powers of their Brahmins over the winds and storms. Unquote from the missionary Le Voyager of Cochin in the Journal des Colonies. In reply to this, we may quote from Luke 8, verse 27, no, verse 24. And he, Jesus, arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And here is another quotation from a prayer book. O Virgin of the Sea, blessed Mother and Lady of the Waters, stay thy waves, etc., etc. Pray of the Neapolitan and Provencal sailors, copied textually from that of the Phoenician mariners to their Virgin Goddess Astarte. The logical and irrepressible conclusion arising from the parallels brought forward and the denunciation of the missionary is this. The commands of the Brahmins to their element gods not remaining ineffectual, the power of the Brahmins is thus placed on a par with that of Jesus. Moreover, Astarte is shown not a whit weak in potency than the Virgin of the Sea, or Christian sailors. It is not enough to give a dog a bad name, and then hang him. The dog has to be proven guilty. Boreas and Astarte may be devils in theological fancy, but, as just remarked, the tree has to be judged by its fruit. And once the Christians are shown as immoral and wicked, as the pagans ever were, what benefit has humanity derived from its change of gods and idols? That, however, which God and the Christian saints are justified in doing becomes a crime if successful in simple mortals. Sorcery and incantations are regarded as fables now, yet from the day of the Institutes of Justinian, 
down to the laws against witchcraft of England and America, obsolete but not repealed to this day. Such incantations, even when only suspected, were punished as criminal. Why punish a chimera? And still we read of Constantine, the emperor, sentencing to death the philosopher Sopatrus for unchaining the winds, and thus preventing ships loaded with grain from arriving in time to put an end to famine. Pausanians, when affirming that he saw with his own eyes men who by simple prayers and incantations stopped a strong hailstorm is derided. This does not prevent modern Christian writers from advising prayer during a storm and danger, and believing in its efficiency. Hoppo and Stadlein, two magicians and sorcerers, were sentenced to death for throwing charms on fruit and transferring a harvest by magic arts from one field to another hardly a century ago, if we can believe Sprenger, the famous writer who vouches for it. Qui fruges ex cantassent segetem pelicentes incantando. Let us close by reminding the reader that, without the smallest shadow of superstition, one may believe in the dual nature of every object on earth, and that science virtually proves this while denying its own demonstration. For if, as Sir William Grove has it, the electricity we handle is but the result of ordinary matter affected by something invisible, the quote, ultimate generating power unquote, of every force, the quote, one omnipresent influence, unquote, then it only becomes natural that one should believe as the ancients did, namely, that every element is dual in its nature. Quote, Ethereal fire is the emanation of the Kabir proper, the aerial is but the union, correlation, of the former with terrestrial fire, and its guidance and application on our earthly plane belongs to a kabir of a lesser dignity, unquote. an elemental, perhaps, as an occultist would call it, and the same may be said of every cosmic element. No one will deny that the human being is possessed of various forces, magnetic, sympathetic, antipathetic, nervous, dynamical, occult, mechanical, mental, every kind of force, and that the physical forces are all biological in their essence, seeing that they intermingle with and often merge into those forces that we have named intellectual and moral, the first being the vehicles, so to say, the upadi of the second. No one who does not deny soul in man would hesitate in saying that their presence and commingling are the very essence of our being, that they constitute the ego in man, in fact. These potencies have their psychological, physical, mechanical, as well as their nervous, ecstatic, clairaudient and clairvoyant phenomena, which are now regarded and recognized as perfectly natural even by science. Why should man be the only exception in nature, and why cannot even the elements have their vehicles, their vahans, in what we call the physical forces? And why, above all, should such beliefs be called superstition, along with the religions of old? Next section is section 15, on Quan Chi Yin and Quan Yin. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Part 2, The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order, with Explanatory Sections. Section 15, on Quan Chi Yin and Quan Yin. Like Avalokiteshvara, Quan Chi Yin has passed through several transformations, but it is an error to say of him that he is a modern invention of the northern Buddhists, for under another appellation he has been known from the earliest times. The secret doctrine teaches that, quote, he who is the first to appear at renovation will be the last to come before reabsorption, pralaya, 
Unquote. Thus, the Logui of all nations, from the Vedic Visva Karma of the mysteries down to the saviour of the present civilised nations, are the quote, word unquote, who was quote, in the beginning, unquote, or the reawakening of the energising powers of nature with the one absolute. Born of fire and water, before these became distinct elements, it was the maker, fashioner, or modeller of all things. Without him was not anything made that was made, in whom was life, and the life was the light of man, and who finally may be called, as he ever has been, the Alpha and the Omega of manifested nature. The great dragon of wisdom is born of fire and water, and into fire and water will all be reabsorbed with him. From Fawakin as this bodhisattva is said to assume any form he pleases, from a beginning of a manvantara to its end, though his special birthday, memorial day, is celebrated according to the Queen Kwang Ming King, that is luminous sutra of golden light, in the second month of the nineteenth day, and that of Maitreya Buddha in the first month on the first day, yet the two are one, he will appear as Maitreya Buddha, the last of the avatars and Buddhas, in the seventh rays. This belief and expectation are universal throughout the East, only it is not in the Kali Yuga, or present terrifically a materialistic age of darkness, the black age, that a new saviour of humanity can ever appear. The Kali Yuga is large d'or only in the mystic writings of some French pseudo-occultists. See La Mission des Juifs. Hence the ritual in the exoteric worship of this deity was founded on magic. The mantras are all taken from special books kept secret by the priests, and each is said to work a magical effect, as the reciter or reader produces, by simply chanting them, a secret causation which results in immediate effects. Kwan Chi Yin is Avalokiteshvara, and both are forms of the seventh universal principle. While in its highest metaphysical character this deity is the synthetic aggregation of all the planetary spirits, Diani Kokans. He is the, quote, self-manifested, unquote, in short, the son of the father. Crowned with seven dragons, above his statue there appears the inscription, Puti Kyunling, the universal saviour of all living beings. Of course the name given in the archaic volume of the stanzas is quite different, but Kuan Yin is a perfect equivalent. In a temple of Puchu, the sacred island of the Buddhists in China, Kuan Chi Yin is represented floating on a back aquatic bird, Kalahansa, and pouring on the heads of mortals the elixir of life, which as it flows is transformed into one of the chief Jiani Buddhas the regent of a star called the Star of Salvation. In his third transformation, Kuan Yin is the informing spirit or genius of water. In China, the Dalai Lama is believed to be an incarnation of Kuan Shi Yin, who in his third terrestrial appearance was a bodhisattva, while the Teshu Lama is an incarnation of Amitabha Buddha, or Gautama. It may be remarked en pensant, that a writer must indeed have a deceased imagination to discover phallic worship everywhere, as do the authors of China Revealed, McClatchy, and Phallicism. The first discovers the old phallic gods represented under two evident symbols, the Khan or Yang, which is the Membrum Virile, and the Quan or Yin, the Pudendum Muliebre. See Phallicism, page 273. Such a rendering seems the more strange as Kuan Xin Yin, Avalokiteshvara, and Kuan Yin, besides being now the patron deities of the Buddhist ascetics, the yogis of Tibet, are the gods of chastity, and are in their esoteric meaning not even that which is implied in the rendering of Mr. Rise David's Buddhism, page 202. Quote, the name Avalokiteshvara means the Lord who looks down from on high. Unquote. Nor is Quan Shi Yin, quote, the spirit of the Buddhas present in the church, unquote. But literally interpreted, it means 
the Lord that is seen, and in one sense, the divine self perceived by self, the human, the Atman or seventh principle merged in the universal perceived by or the object of perception to Buddhi, the sixth principle or divine soul in man. In a still higher sense, Avalokiteshvara, Kuan Chi Yin, referred to as the seventh universal principle, is the Logos perceived by the universal Buddhi or soul as the synthetic aggregate of the Dhyani Buddhas, and is not the spirit of Buddha present in the church, but the omnipresent universal spirit manifested in the temple of cosmos or nature. This orientalistic etymology of Kuan and Jin is on a par with that of Yogini, which we are told by Mr. Hargrave Jennings is a Sanskrit word in the dialects pronounced Yogi or Zogi in brackets exclamation mark and is equivalent to Sena and exactly the same as Duti or Dutitka, that is, a sacred prostitute of the temple worshipped as Yoni or Shakti. Page 60. The books of morality in India direct a faithful wife to shun the society of yogini or females who have been adored as shakti amongst their votaries of a most licentious description nothing should surprise us after this and it is therefore with hardly a smile that we find another preposterous absurdity quoted about bud as being a name which signifies not only the sun as the source of generation, but also the male organ, Roundhouse of Ireland, quoted by Mr. Hargrave Jennings in Phallicism, page 264. Max Müller, in his False Analogies, says that the most celebrated Chinese scholar of his time, Abel Remusa, maintains that the three syllables, I, he, ve, in the fourteenth chapter of the Tao Te Ching, were meant for Jehovah, Science of Religion, page 332, and again for the Amyot, who, quote, feels certain that the three persons of the Trinity could be recognized, unquote, in the same work. And if Abel Remusson, why not Hargrave Jennings? Every scholar will recognize the absurdity of ever seeing in Bud the enlightened and the awakened a phallic symbol. Quan Chi Yin, then, is the son identical with his father mystically, or the Logos, the Word. He is called the Dragon of Wisdom in stanza 3, as all the Logui of all the ancient religious systems are connected with and symbolized by serpents. In old Egypt, the god Nabkun, he who unites the doubles, astral light reuniting by its dual physiological and spiritual potency the divine human to its purely divine monad, the prototype in heaven or nature, was represented as a serpent on human legs, either with or without arms. It was the emblem of the resurrection of nature, as also of Christ with the Ophites, and of Jehovah as the brazen serpent healing those who have looked at him, the serpent being an emblem of Christ with the Templars also, See the Templar degree in masonry. The symbol of Knupf, Knum also, or the soul of the world, says Campolion, Pantheon, text 3, quote, is represented, among other forms, under that of a huge serpent on human legs, this reptile being the emblem of the good genius and the virtual Agatodaemon is sometimes bearded, unquote. The sacred animal is thus identical with the serpent of the Ophites, and is figured on a great number of engraved stones, called Gnostic or Basilidean gems. This serpent appears with various heads, human and animal, but its gems are always found inscribed with the name Knotbis or Knubis. This symbol is identical with one which, according to Jamblicus and Campolion, was called the first of the celestial gods, the god Hermes, or Mercury with the Greeks, to which God Hermes Trismegistus attributes the invention of and the first initiation of men into magic. And Mercury is Bud, wisdom, enlightenment, or reawakening into the divine science. To close, Quan Shi Yin and Quan Yin 
are the two aspects, male and female, of the same principle in cosmos, nature, and man, of divine wisdom and intelligence. They are the Christos Sophia of the mystic Gnostics, the Logos and its Sakti. In their longing for the expression of some mysteries never to be wholly comprehended by the profane, the ancients, knowing that nothing could be preserved in human memory without some outward symbol, have chosen the to us often ridiculous images of the Kuan Yin's to remind man of his origin and inner nature. To the impartial, however, the Madonnas in crinolines and the Christs in white kid gloves must appear far more absurd than the Quan Shi Yin and Quan Yin in their dragon garb. The subjective can hardly be expressed by the objective. Therefore, since the symbolic formula attempts to characterize that which is above scientific reasoning, and is often far beyond our intellect, it must needs go beyond that intellect in some shape or other, or else it will fade out from human remembrance. This concludes Book 1, Part 2 of the Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, Cosmogenesis, on the evolution of symbolism in its approximate order with the explanatory sections. Next up is Book 1, Part 3, from Volume 1, Cosmogenesis, Addenda, Science, and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3, Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Quote, the Knowledge of this Netherworld. Say, friend, what is it, false or true? The false... What mortal cares to know? The true, what mortal ever knew? End of quote. Addenda to Book 1 1. Reasons for these addenda Many of the doctrines contained in the foregoing seven stanzas and commentaries having been studied and critically examined by some Western theosophists, Certain of the occult teachings have been found wanting from the ordinary standpoint of modern scientific knowledge. They seem to encounter insuperable difficulties in the way of their acceptance, and to require reconsideration in view of scientific criticism. Some friends have already been tempted to regret the necessity of so often calling in question the assertions of modern science. It appeared to them, and I here repeat only their arguments, that, quote, to run counter to the teachings of its most eminent exponents was to court a premature discomfiture in the eyes of the Western world, unquote. It is, therefore, desirable to define once and for all the position which the writer, who does not agree in this with a friend's, intends to maintain so far as science remains what in the words of professor huxley it is meaning quote, organized common sense unquote, so far as its interferences are drawn from accurate premises its generalizations resting on a purely inductive basis every theosophist and occultist welcomes respectfully and with due admiration its contributions to the domain of cosmological law. There can be no possible conflict between the teachings of occult and so-called exact science, where the conclusions of the latter are grounded on a substratum of unassessable fact. It is only when its more ardent exponents overstepping the limits of observed phenomena in order to penetrate into the arcana of being, attempt to wrench the formation of cosmos and its living forces from spirit, and attribute all to blind matter, that the occultists claim the right to dispute and call in question their theories. Science cannot, owing to the very nature of things, unveil the mystery of the universe around us. 
Science can, it is true, collect, classify, and generalize upon phenomena. But the occultists, arguing from admitted metaphysical data, declares that the daring explorer who would probe the inmost secrets of nature must transcend the narrow limitations of sense and transfer his consciousness into the region of noumena and the sphere of primal causes. To effect this, he must develop faculties which are absolutely dormant, save in a few rare and exceptional cases in the constitution of the offshoots of our present fifth root race in Europe and America. He can in no other conceivable manner collect the facts on which to base his speculations. Is this not apparent on the principles of inductive logic and metaphysics alike? On the other hand, whatever the writer may do, she will never be able to satisfy both truth and science. To offer the reader a systematic and uninterrupted version of the archaic stanzas is impossible. A gap of forty-three verses or slokas has to be left between the seventh already given and the fifty-first, which is the subject of Book Two, though the latter are made to run from one at sequence for easy reading and reference. The appearance of man on earth alone occupies as many stanzas which describe minutely his primal evolution from the human Dianchochans, the state of the globe at that time, etc., etc. A great number of names referring to chemical substances and other compounds which have now ceased to combine together and are therefore unknown to the later offshoots of our fifth race occupy a considerable space. As they are simply untranslatable, and would remain in every case inexplicable, they are omitted, along with those which cannot be made public. Nevertheless, even the little that is given will irritate any follower and defender of dogmatic materialistic science who happens to read this. Before proceeding to other stanzas, it is proposed, therefore, to defend those already given. They are not in perfect accord or harmony with modern science, this we all know. Had they been, however, as much in agreement with the views of modern knowledge as a lecture by Sir W. Thompson, they would have been rejected all the same. For they teach belief in conscious powers and spiritual entities, in terrestrial, semi-intelligent, and highly intellectual forces on other planes and in beings that dwell around us in spheres imperceptible whether through telescope or microscope. Note, their intellection, of course, being of quite a different nature to any we can conceive of on earth. End of note. Hence the necessity of examining the beliefs of materialistic science, of comparing its views about the, quote, elements, unquote, with the opinions of the ancients, and of analyzing the physical forces as they exist in modern perception before the occultists admit themselves to be in the wrong. We shall touch upon the constitution of the sun and planets, and the occult characteristics of what are called devas and genii, and are now termed by science force or modes of motion, and see whether esoteric belief is defensible or not. Vide infra gods, monads, and atoms. Notwithstanding the efforts made to the contrary, an unprejudiced mind will discover under Newton's agent material or immaterial of his third letter to Bentley, the agent which causes gravity. And in his personal working god one finds just as much of the metaphysical divas and genii as in Kepler's Angelus Rector, conducting each planet and the species immateriata by which the celestial bodies were carried along in their courses, according to that astronomer. We shall have in Book Two to openly approach dangerous subjects. We must bravely face science and declare in the teeth of materialistic learning, of idealism, hilo idealism, positivism, and all denying modern psychology that the true occultist believes in lords of light, that he believes in a sun 
which far from being simply a lamp of day moving in accordance with physical law and far from being merely one of those suns which according to richter are sunflowers of a higher light is like milliards of other suns the dwelling or the vehicle of a god and a host of gods in this question of cause it is the occultists who will be worsted they will be considered on the prima facie aspect of the dispute to be ignoramuses and labelled with more than one of the usual epithets given to those whom the superficially judging public itself ignorant of the great underlying truths in nature accuses of believing in medieval superstitions let it be so submitting beforehand to every criticism in order to go on with their task they only claim the privilege of showing that the physicists are as much at loggerheads among themselves in their speculations as the latter are with the teachings of occultism the sun is matter and the sun is spirit our ancestors the quote heathen unquote, along with their modern successors the passes were and are wise enough in their generation to see in it the symbol of divinity and at the same time to sense within concealed by the physical symbol the bright god of spiritual and terrestrial light such belief is now regarded as a superstition only by rank materialism which denies deity spirit soul and admits no intelligence outside the mind of man but if too much of wrong superstition bred by quote, churchianity unquote, as lawrence oliphant calls it quote, renders a man a fool unquote, too much scepticism makes him mad we prefer the charge of folly in believing too much to that of a madness which denies everything as do materialism and idealism hence the occultists are full prepared to receive their dues from materialism and to meet the adverse criticism which will be poured on this work not for writing it but for believing in that which it contains therefore the discoveries hypotheses and unavoidable objections which will be brought forward by the scientific critics must be anticipated and disposed of it has also to be shown how far the occult teachings depart from real science and whether the ancient or the modern theories are the most logically and philosophically correct the unity and mutual relations of all parts of cosmos were known to the ancients before they became evident to modern astronomers and philosophers and if even the external and visible portions of the universe and their mutual relations cannot be explained in any other terms than those used by the adherents in mechanical theory of the universe and physical science it follows that no materialist who denies that the soul of cosmos which appertains to the metaphysical philosophy exists has the right to trespass upon the metaphysical domain that physical science is trying to and actually does encroach upon it is only one more proof that quote, might is right unquote, and no more another good reason for these addenda is this since only a certain portion of the secret teachings can be given out in the present age if they were published without any explanations or commentary the doctrines would never be understood even by theosophists therefore they must be contrasted with the speculations of modern science archaic axioms must be placed side by side with modern hypotheses and comparison left to the sagacious reader on the question of the quote, seven governors unquote, as hermes calls the quote, seven builders unquote, the spirits which guide the operations of nature the animated atoms of which are the shadows in their world of their primaries in the astral realms this work will of course besides the men of science have every materialist against it but this opposition can at most be only temporary people have laughed at everything and scouted every unpopular idea at first and then ended by accepting it materialism and scepticism are evils that must remain in the world as long as man has not quitted his present gross form to don the one he had during the first and second races of this round 
unless scepticism and our present natural ignorance are equilibrated by intuition and natural spirituality every being afflicted with such feelings will see himself no better than a bundle of flesh bones and muscles with an empty garret inside him which serves the purpose of storing his sensations and feelings sir humphrey davy was a great scientist as deeply versed in physics as any theorist of our day yet he loathed materialism quote, i heard with disgust he says in the dissecting rooms the plan of the physiologists of the gradual secretion of matter and its becoming endued with irritability ripening into sensibility and acquiring such organs as were necessary by its own inherent forces and at last rising into intellectual existence unquote. nevertheless physiologists are not the most to be blamed for speaking of that only which they can see and estimate on the evidence of their physical senses astronomers and physicists are we consider far more illogical in their materialistic views than even physiologists and this has to be proved milton's light ethereal first of things quintessence pure has become with the materialists only prime cheerer light of all material beings first and best for the occultists it is both spirit and matter behind the quote, mode of motion unquote, now regarded as quote, the property of matter unquote, and nothing more they perceive the radiant noumenon it is the quote, spirit of light unquote, the first born of the eternal pure element whose energy or emanation is stored in the sun the great life-giver of the physical world as the hidden concealed spiritual sun is the light and life-giver of the spiritual and psychic realms bacon was one of the first to strike the keynote of materialism not only by his inductive method renovated from ill-digested aristotle but by the general tenor of his writings he inverts the order of mental evolution when saying that quote, the first creation of god was the light of the sands and his sabbath work ever since is the illumination of the spirit unquote. it is just the reverse the light of spirit is the eternal sabbath of the mystic or occultist and he pays little attention to that of mere sense that which is meant by the allegorical sentence quote, fiat lux unquote, is when esoterically rendered quote, let there be the sons of light unquote or the noumena of all phenomena. Thus Roman Catholics rightly interpret the passage as referring to angels, and wrongly as meaning powers created by an anthropomorphic god, whom they personify in the ever-thundering and punishing Jehovah. These beings are the, quote, sons of light, unquote, because they emanate from and are self-generated in that infinite ocean of light whose one pole is pure spirit lost in the absoluteness of non-being and the other the matter in which it condenses crystallizing into a more and more gross type as it descends into manifestation therefore matter though it is in one sense but the elusive dregs of that light whose limbs are the creative forces yet has in it the full presence of the soul thereof of that principle which none not even the quote, sons of light unquote, evolved from its absolute darkness will ever know the idea is as beautifully as it is truthfully expressed by milton who hails the holy light which is the quote, offspring of heaven firstborn and of the eternal co-eternal being since god is light and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity dwelt then in thee bright effluence of bright essence inserate Unquote. next is chapter two modern physicists are playing at blind man's buff The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. 
Volume One, Cosmogenesis. Book One, Part Three: Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book One. Chapter Two: Modern Physicists Are Playing at Blind Man's Buff. And now occultism puts to science the question: Is light a body or is it not? Whatever the answer of the latter, the form is prepared to show that to this day. The most eminent physicists know neither one way nor the other. To know what is light and whether it is an actual substance or a mere undulation of the quote, ethereal medium, unquote, science has first to learn what are in reality matter, atom, ether, force. Now the truth is that it knows nothing of any of these and admits it. It has not even agreed what to believe in, as dozens of hypotheses emanating from various and very eminent scientists on the same subject are antagonistic to each other and often self-contradictory. Thus, their learned speculations may, with a stretch of good will, be accepted as working hypotheses in a secondary sense, as Stahler puts it. But being radically inconsistent with each other, they must finally end by mutually destroying themselves, as declared by the author of Concepts of Modern Physics. Quote, It must not be forgotten that the several departments of science are simply arbitrary divisions of labor. In these several departments, the same physical object may be considered under different aspects. The physicist may study its molecular relations, while the chemist determines its atomic constitution. But when they both deal with the same element or agent, it cannot have one set of properties in physics and another set contradictory of them in chemistry. If the physicist and chemist alike assume the existence of ultimate atoms absolutely invariable in bulk and weight, the atom cannot be a cube or oblate spheroid for physical and a sphere for chemical purposes. A group of constant atoms cannot be aggregate of extended and absolutely inert and impenetrable masses in a crucible or retort, and a system of mere centers of force as part of a magnet or of a Clermont battery. The universal ether cannot be soft and mobile to please the chemist, and rigid elastic to satisfy the physicist. It cannot be continuous at the command of Sir William Thomson, and discontinuous on the suggestion of Cauchy or Fresnel. End of quote. Note: Concepts of Modern Physics, page eleven to twelve, introduction to the second edition. End of note. The eminent physicist. G. A. Erne may likewise be quoted saying the same in the forty-third volume of the Memoirs de l'Académie royale de Belgique, which we translate from the French as cited. Quote, when one sees the assurance with which are today affirmed doctrines which attribute the collectivity, the universality of the phenomena to the motions alone of the atom, one has a right to expand to find likewise anonymity on the qualities described of this unique being, the foundation of all that exists. Now, from the first examination of the particular systems proposed, one feels the strangest deception. One perceives that the atom of the chemist, the atom of the physicist, that of the metaphysician, and that of the mathematician, have absolutely nothing in common but the name. The inevitable result is the existing subdivision of our sciences, each of which, in its own little pigeonhole, constructs an atom which satisfies the requirements of the phenomena it studies, without troubling itself in the least about the requirements proper to the phenomena of the neighboring pigeonhole. The metaphysician banishes the principles of attraction and repulsion as dreams. The mathematician, who analyzes the laws of elasticity and those of the propagation of light, admits them implicitly without even naming them. The chemist cannot explain the grouping of the atoms in his often complicated molecules without attributing to his atoms specific distinguishing qualities. For the physicist and the metaphysician, partisans of the modern doctrines, the atom is, on the contrary, always and everywhere the same. What am I saying? 
There is no agreement even in one and the same science as to the properties of the atom. Each constructs an atom to suit his own fancy, in order to explain some special phenomenon with which he is particularly concerned. Note. Recherche expérimentale sur la relation qui existe entre la résistance de l'air et sa température. Page 68. The above is the photographically correct image of modern science and physics. The, quote, prerequisite of that incessant play of the scientific imagination, unquote, which is so often found in Professor Tyndall's eloquent discourses, is vivid indeed, as shown by Stalo, and for contradictory variety leaves far behind it any, quote, fantasies, unquote, of occultism. However it may be, if physical theories are confessedly, quote, mere formal, explanatory, didactic devices, unquote, and if, quote, atomism is only a symbolical graphic system, unquote, then the occultist can hardly be regarded as assuming too much when he places alongside of these devices and, quote, symbolical systems, unquote, of modern science the symbols and devices of archaic teachings. Note on atomism is only a symbolical graphic system. From the criticism of concepts of modern physics in nature, see Stahler's work, page 16 of the introduction. End of note. Next chapter is chapter 3, On Lumen Sit Corpus. Nick non. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1 Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3 Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Chapter 3 Unlumen sit corpus nec non. Most decidedly, light is not a body, we are told. Physical sciences say light is a force, a vibration, the undulation of ether. It is the property or quality of matter, or even an affection thereof, never a body. Just so. For this discovery, the knowledge, whatever it may be worth, that light or caloric is not a motion of material particles. Science is chiefly indebted, if not solely, to Sir William Grove. It was he who was the first in a lecture at the London Institution in 1842 to show that light, heat, etc., etc., are affections of matter itself and not a distinct, ethereal, imponderable fluid, a state of matter now permeating it. Note. Mr. Robert Ward, discussing the questions of heat and light in the November Journal of Science, 1881, shows us how utterly ignorant is a science about one of the commonest facts of nature, the heat of the sun. He says, The question of the temperature of the sun has been the subject of investigation with many scientists. Newton, one of the first investigators of this problem, tried to determine it and after him all the scientists who have been occupied with calorimetry have followed his example. All have believed themselves successful and have formulated their results with great confidence. The following, in the chronological order of the publication of the results, are the temperatures in centigrade degrees found by each of them. Newton, 1,699,300 degrees. Pouillet, 1,461 degrees. Tolner, 102,200 degrees. Secchi, 5,344,840 degrees. Bell, 1,746,700 degrees. Fitzhugh, 7,500 degrees. Waterston, 9 million degrees. Spoerum, 
27,000 degrees, Devi, 9,500 degrees, Suri, 5,801,846 degrees, Vicar, 1,500 degrees, Rossetti, 20,000 degrees. The difference is as 1,400 degrees against 9 million degrees, or no less than 8,998,600 degrees. There probably does not exist in science a more astonishing uh, contradiction than that revealed in these figures. And yet, without doubt, if an occultist were to give out an estimate, each of these gentlemen would vehemently protest in the name of exact science at the rejection of his special result. From the Theosophist. End of note. See Correlation of the Physical Forces. Preface. Yet perhaps for some physicists, as for Erstedt, a very eminent scientist, force and forces were tacitly spirit and hence spirits in nature. What several rather mystical scientists taught was that light, heat, magnetism, electricity and gravity, etc., were not the final causes of the visible phenomena, including planetary motion, but themselves the secondary effects of other causes, for which science in our day cares very little, but in which occultism believes. For the occultists have exhibited proofs of the validity of their claims in every age. And in what age were there no occultists and no adepts? Sir Isaac Newton held to the Pythagorean corpuscular theory, and was also inclined to admit its consequences, which made the Comte de Maistre hope, at one time, that Newton would ultimately lead science back to the recognition of the fact that forces and the celestial bodies were propelled and guided by intelligences. See Soiré, Volume 2. But de Maistre countered without his host. The innermost thoughts and ideas of Newton were perverted, and of his great mathematical learning only the mere physical husk was turned to account. Had poor Sir Isaac foreseen to what use his successors and followers would apply his quote, gravity, unquote, that pious and religious man would surely have quietly eaten his apple and never breathed a word about any mechanical ideas connected with its fall. Note, according to one atheistic idealist, Dr. Lewins, when Sir Isaac in 1687 showed mass an atom acted upon by innate activity he effectually disposed of spirit anima or divinity as supererogatory End of note. great contempt is shown for metaphysics generally and for ontological metaphysics especially but we see whenever the occultists are bold enough to raise their diminished heads that materialistic physical science is honeycombed with metaphysics, that its most fundamental principles, while inseparately wedded to transcendentalism, are nevertheless in order to show modern science divorced from such, quote, dreams, unquote, tortured and often ignored in the maze of contradictory theories and hypotheses. Note on honeycombed with metaphysics. Stahler's above-cited work, Concepts of Modern Physics, is a volume which has called forth the liveliest protests and criticisms, is recommended to anyone inclined to doubt this statement. Quote, the professed antagonism of science to metaphysics, he writes, has led the majority of scientific specialists to assume that the methods and results of empirical research are wholly independent of the control of the laws of thought. They either silently ignore or openly repudiate the simplest canons of logic, including the laws of non-contradiction, and resent with the utmost vehemence every application of the rule of consistency to their hypotheses and theories, and they regard an examination of these in the light of these laws as an impertinent intrusion of a priori principles and methods into the domains of empirical science. Persons of this cast of mind find no difficulty in holding that atoms are absolutely inert, and at the same time asserting that these atoms are perfectly elastic, 
or in maintaining that the physical universe, in its last analysis, resolves itself into dead matter and motion, and yet denying that all physical energy is in reality kinetic, or in proclaiming that all phenomenal differences in the objective world are ultimately due to the various motions of absolutely simple material units, and nevertheless repudiating the proposition that these units are equal. Page 19. Quote, the blindness of eminent physicists to some of the most obvious consequences of their own theories is marvellous. When Professor Tate, in conjunction with Professor Stewart, announces that matter is simply passive, from the Unseen Universe, section 104, and then, in connection with Sir W. Thompson, declares that matter has an innate power of resisting external influences, Treatise on Natural Philosophy, Volume 1, section 216, it is hardly impertinent to inquire how these statements are to be reconciled when Professor dubois Raymond insists upon the necessity of reducing all the processes of nature to motions of a substantial, indifferent substratum, wholly destitute of quality, taken from Euber, Die Grenzen des Naturerkennens, page 5, having declared shortly before in the same lecture that resolution of all changes in the material world into motions of atoms caused by their constant central forces would be the completion of natural science. We are in a perplexity from which we have to be relieved. Preface, page 43. End of note. A very good corroboration of this charge lies in the fact that science finds itself absolutely compelled to accept the, quote, hypothetical, Unquote, ether and to try to explain it on the materialistic grounds of atomic mechanical laws. This attempt has led directly to the most fatal discrepancies and radical inconsistencies between the assumed nature of ether and its physical actions. A second proof is found in the many contradictory statements about the atom, the most metaphysical object in creation. Now, what does the modern science of physics know of ether, the first concept of which belongs undeniably to ancient philosophers, the Greeks having borrowed it from the Aryans, and the origin of modern ether being found in it, and disfigured from Akasha? This disfigurement is claimed to be a modification and refinement of the idea of Lucretius, let us then examine the modern concept from several scientific volumes containing the admissions of the physicists themselves. The existence of ether is accepted by physical astronomy in ordinary physics and in chemistry. Astronomers who first began by regarding it as a fluid of extreme tenuity and mobility, offering no sensible resistance to the motions of celestial bodies, never gave a thought to its continuity or discontinuity. Quote, its main function in modern astronomy has been to serve as a basis for hydrodynamical theories of gravitation. In physics, this fluid appeared for some time in several roles in connection with the imponderables, unquote, so cruelly put to death by Sir W. Grove. Some physicists have even identified the ether of space with those, quote, imponderables, unquote. Then came their kinetic theories, and from the date of the dynamical theory of heat, it was chosen in optics as a substratum for luminous undulations. Then, in order to explain the dispersion and polarization of light, physicists had to resort once more to their, quote, scientific imagination, unquote, and forthwith endowed the ether with a, atomic or molecular structure, and b, with an enormous elasticity, Quote, so that its resistance to deformation far exceeded that of the most rigid elastic bodies. Quoted from Stalo. This necessitated the theory of the essential discontinuity of matter, hence of ether. After having accepted this discontinuity in order to account for dispersion and polarization, theoretical impossibilities were discovered with regard to such dispersions. Cauchy's scientific imagination saw in atoms material points without extension, and he proposed in order to obviate the most formidable obstacles to the undulatory theory 
namely some well-known mechanical theorems which stood in the way to assume that the ethereal medium of propagation instead of being continuous should consist of particles separated by sensible distances fresnel rendered the same service to the phenomena of polarization ibi hunt upset the theories of both see silliman's journal volume eight page three six four at sequence there are now men of science who proclaim them quote, materially fallacious, unquote, while others, the atomo mechanicalists, cling to them with desperate tenacity. The supposition of an atomic or molecular constitution of ether is upset, moreover, by thermodynamics, for Clerk Maxwell showed that such a medium would be simply gas. Note, see Clerk Maxwell's Treatise on Electricity of Magnetism and compare with the Cauchy's Memoir sur la dispersion de la lumière. End of note. The hypothesis of, quote, finite intervals, unquote, is thus proven of no avail as a supplement to the undulatory theory. Besides, eclipses fail to reveal any such variation of color supposed by Cauchy, on the assumption that the chromatic rays are propagated with different velocities, Astronomy has pointed out more than one phenomenon absolute at variance with this doctrine. Thus, while in one department of physics the atomomolecular constitution of the ether is accepted in order to account for one set of special phenomena, in another department such a constitution is found quite subversive of a number of well ascertained facts, Hearn's charges being thus justified, vide supra chemistry deemed it impossible to concede enormous elasticity to the ether without depriving it of other properties upon the assumption on which the construction of its modern theories depended this ended in a final transformation of ether the exigences of the atomomechanical theory have led distinguished mathematicians and physicists to attempt to substitute for the traditional atoms of matter peculiar forms of vortical motion in a quote, universal, homogeneous, incompressible, and continuous material medium, or aether. See Stallo. The present writer, claiming not great scientific education, but only tolerable acquaintance with modern theories, and a better one with occult sciences, picks up weapons against the detractors of the esoteric teaching in the very arsenal of modern science. The glaring contradictions, the mutually destructive hypotheses of world-renowned scientists, the mutual accusations, denunciations, and disputes, show plainly that, whether accepted or not, the occult theories have as much right to a hearing as any of the so-called learned and academical hypotheses. Thus, whether the followers of the Royal Society choose to accept ether as a continuous or a discontinuous fluid matters little, and is indifferent to the present purpose. It simply points to the one certainty. Official science knows nothing to this day of the constitution of ether. Let science call it matter if it likes, only neither as Akasha nor the one sacred aether of the Greeks. Is it to be found in any of the states of matter known to modern physics? It is matter on quite another plane of perception and being, and it can neither be analysed by scientific apparatus, appreciated, nor even conceived by, quote, scientific imagination, unquote, unless the possessors thereof study the occult sciences. That which follows proves this statement. It is clearly demonstrated by Stahle, as regards the crucial problems of modern physics, as was done by de Quatrefages and several others in those of anthropology, biology, etc., etc., that in their efforts to support their individual hypotheses and systems, the majority of the eminent and learned materialists very often utter the greatest fallacies. Let us take the following case. Most of them reject actu in distance one of the fundamental principles in the question of aether or kasha in occultism. While, as Ashtala just observes, there is no physical action, quote, which, on close examination, does not resolve itself into actio in distance. And he proves it. Now, metaphysical arguments, according to Professor Large, Nature, 
volume 27, page 304, are, quote, unconscious appeals to experience, unquote. And he adds that if such an experience is not conceivable, then it does not exist, etc. In his own words, quote, if a highly developed mind or set of minds find a doctrine about some comparatively simple and fundamental matter absolutely unthinkable, it is an evidence that the unthinkable state of things has no existence, etc. Unquote. And thereupon, toward the end of his lecture, Professor Large indicates that the explanation of cohesion as well as of gravity quote, is to be looked for in the vortex atom theory of Sir William Thomson. See Stallo. It is needless to stop to inquire whether it is to this vortex theory also that we have to look for the dropping down on Earth of the first life germ by passing meteor comet, Sir W. Thompson's hypothesis. But Mr. Lodge might be reminded of the wise criticism on his lecture in the same concepts of modern physics, noticing the above-quoted declaration by the London professor the author asks whether the elements of the vortex theory are familiar or even possible facts of experience. For, if they are not, clearly that theory is obnoxious to the same criticism which is said to invalidate the assumption of actu in distant. Page 24. And then the able critic shows clearly what the ether is not, nor can ever be, notwithstanding all scientific claim to the contrary, and thus he opens widely, if unconsciously, the entrance door to our occult teachings, for, as he says, quote, the medium in which the vortex movements arise is, according to Professor Lodge's own express statement, in Nature, volume 26, page 305, a perfect, homogeneous, incompressible, continuous body incapable of being resolved into simple elements or atoms. It is, in fact, continuous, not molecular. And after making this statement, Professor Lodge adds, There is no other body of which we can say this, and hence the properties of the aether must be somewhat different from those of ordinary matter. It appears, then, that the whole vortex atom theory which is offered to us as a substitute for the metaphysical theory of actu in distant rests upon the hypothesis of the existence of a material medium which is utterly unknown to experience, and which has properties somewhat different from those of ordinary matter. Note. Somewhat different, exclaims Stallo. The real import of this somewhat is that the medium in question is not in any intelligible sense material at all, having none of the properties of matter. All the properties of matter depend upon differences and changes, and the hypothetical aether here defined is not only destitute of differences, but incapable of difference and change. In the physical sense, let us add, this proves that if aether is matter, it is so only as something visible, tangible, and existing for spiritual senses alone, that it is a being indeed, but not of our plane, parter ether, or akasha. End of note. Hence this theory, instead of being, as is claimed, a reduction of an unfamiliar fact of experience to a familiar fact, is, on the contrary, a reduction of a fact which is perfectly familiar, to a fact which is not only unfamiliar, but wholly unknown, unobserved and unobservable. Furthermore, the alleged vortical motion of, or rather in, the assumed ethereal medium is impossible because motion in a perfectly homogeneous, incompressible and therefore continuous fluid is not sensible motion. It is manifest, therefore, that wherever the vortex atom theory may lead us, it certainly does not lead us anywhere in the region of physics, or in the domain of vere cause. Note, vere cause for physical science are myavic or illusionary causes to the occultist, and vice versa. End of note. And I may add that, inasmuch as the hypothetical undifferentiated and undifferentiable medium is clearly an involuntary reification of the old ontological concept pure being, the theory under discussion has all the attributes of an inapprehensible metaphysical phantom." Unquote. A phantom, indeed, 
which can be made apprehensible only by occultism. From such scientific metaphysics to occultism there is hardly one step. Those physicists who hold the view that the atomic constitution of matter is consistent with its penetrability need not go far out of their way to be able to account for the greatest phenomena of occultism, now so derided by physical scientists and materialists. Cauchy's material points without extension are Leibniz's monads, and at the same time the materials out of which the gods and other invisible powers clothe themselves in bodies, vide infra gods, monads, and atoms. The disintegration and reintegration of material particles without extension as a chief factor in phenomenal manifestations ought to suggest themselves very easily as a clear possibility, at any rate to those few scientific minds which accept M. Cauchy's views. For disposing of that property of matter, which they call impenetrability, by simply regarding the atoms as material points exerting on each other attractions and repulsions which vary with the distances that separate them, the French theorist explains that, from this it follows that, if it pleased the author of nature simply to modify the laws according to which the atoms attract or repel each other, we might instantly see the hardest bodies penetrating each other, the smallest particles of matter occupying immense spaces, or the largest masses reducing themselves to the smallest volumes, the entire universe concentrating itself, as it were, to a single point. Cette leçon de physique générale, page 38, its sequence, more new edition, and that point, invisible on our plane of perception and matter, is quite visible to the eye of the adept, who can follow and see it present on other planes. Notes Note on the hypothetical undifferentiated and undifferentiable medium. Very much differentiated, on the contrary, since the day it left its liar condition. End of note. Note on, if it pleased, the author of nature. For the occultists who say that the author of nature is nature itself, something indistinct and inseparable from the deity, it follows that those who are conversant with the occult laws of nature and know how to change and provoke new conditions in ether may not modify the laws, but work and do the same in accordance with those immutable laws. End of note. And next chapter, chapter 4, is Gravitation, a Law. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3, Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Chapter 4. Is Gravitation a Law? The corpuscular theory has been unceremoniously put aside. But gravitation, the principle that all bodies attract each other with a force proportional directly to their masses, and inversely to the squares of the distances between them, survives to this day and reigns supreme as ever in the alleged ethereal waves of space. As a hypothesis, it had been threatened with death for its inadequacy to embrace all the fact presented to it, as a physical law, it is the king of the late and once all-potent, quote, imponderables, unquote. Quote, it is a little short of blasphemy, an insult to Newton's grand memory to doubt it, is the exclamation of an American reviewer of Isis Unveiled. Well, what is final that invisible and intangible God in whom we should believe in blind faith? Astronomers who see in gravitation an easy-going solution for many things and a universal force which allows them to calculate thereby planetary motions, care little about the cause of attraction. They call gravity a law, a cause in itself. 
we call the forces acting under that name effects, and very secondary effects too. One day it will be found that the scientific hypothesis does not answer after all, and then it will follow the corpuscular theory of light and be consigned to rest for many scientific aeons in the archives of the all exploded speculations. Has not Newton himself expressed grave doubt about the nature of force and the corporeality of the agents, as they were then called? So has Cuvier, another scientific light shining in the night of research. He warns his readers in the Révolution du Globe about the doubtful nature of the so-called forces, saying that it is not so sure whether those agents were not spiritual powers after all, des agents spirituels. At the outset of his Principia, Sir Isaac Newton took the greatest care to impress upon his school that he did not use the word attraction with regard to the mutual attraction of bodies in a physical sense. To him it was, he said, a purely mathematical conception involving no consideration of real and primary physical causes. In one of the passages of his Principia, definition 8, B, I, proposition 69, scolium, he tells us plainly that, physically considered, attractions are rather impulses. In section 11, introduction, he expresses the opinion that there is some subtle spirit by the force and action of which all movements of matter are determined. See Modern Materialism by Reverend W. F. Wilkinson. And in his third letter to Bentley he says, It is inconceivable that inanimate brute matter should without the mediation of something else which is not material, operate upon and affect other matter, without mutual contact, as it must do if gravitation in the sense of Epicurus be essential and inherent in it. That gravity should be innate, inherent and essential to matter, so that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum, without the mediation of anything else by and through which their action may be conveyed from one to another, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws. But whether this agent be material or immaterial, I have left to the consideration of my readers. Unquote. At this, even Newton's contemporaries got frightened, at the apparent return of occult courses into the domain of physics. Leibniz called his principle of attraction, quote, an incorporeal and inexplicable power, unquote. The supposition of an attractive faculty and a perfect void was characterized by Bernoulli, as, quote, revolting, unquote. The principle of actual indistin finding thus no more favor then than it does now. Euler, on the other hand, thought the action of gravity was due to either spirit or some subtle medium, and yet Newton knew of, if he did not accept, the ether of the ancients. He regarded the intermediate space between the sidereal bodies as vacuum, Therefore, he believed in subtle spirit and spirits, as we do, guiding the so-called attraction. The above-quoted words of the great man had produced poor results. The, quote, absurdity, unquote, has now become a dogma in the case of pure materialism, which repeats, no matter without force, no force without matter, matter and force are inseparable, eternal and indestructible. In brackets, true. There can be no independent force, since all force is an inherent and necessary property of matter. In brackets, false. Consequently, there is no immaterial creative power. Oh, poor Sir Isaac. If, leaving aside all the other eminent men of science who shared in the same opinion as Euler and Leibniz, the occultists claim as their authorities and supporters only Sir Isaac Newton and Cuvier, as above cited. They need fear little from modern science, and may loudly and proudly proclaim their beliefs. 
but the hesitation and doubts of the two before cited authorities and of many others too who we could name did not in the least prevent scientific speculation from wool gathering on the fields of brute matter just as before first it was matter and an imponderable fluid distinct from it then came the imponderable fluid so much criticized by grove and aether which was at first discontinuous and then became continuous after which came the mechanical forces these have now settled in life as modes of motion and the aether has become more mysterious and problematical than ever more than one man of science object to such crude materialistic views but then since the days of plato who repeatedly asks his readers not to confuse incorporeal elements with their principles transcendental or spiritual elements from those of the great alchemists who like paracelsus made a great difference between phenomenon and its cause or the noumenon and grove who thought he sees no reason to divest universally diffused matter of the functions common to all matter yet uses the term forces where his critics who do not attach to the word any idea of a specific action say force from those days to this nothing has proved competent to stem the tide of brutal materialism gravitation is the sole cause the acting god and matter is its prophet said the men of science only a few years ago they have changed their views several times since then but do the men of science understand the innermost thought of newton one of the most spiritual-minded and religious men of his day any better now than they did then it is certainly to be doubted newton is credited with having given the death-blow to the elemental vortices of descartes the idea of anaxagoras resurrected by the by though the last modern vortical atoms of sir w thompson do not in truth differ much from the former nevertheless when his disciple forbes wrote in the preface of the chief work of his master a sentence declaring that attraction was the cause of the system newton was the first to solemnly protest that which in the mind of the great mathematician assumed the shadowy but firmly rooted image of god as the noumenon of all was called more philosophically by the ancient and modern philosophers and occultists gods or the creative fashioning powers note attraction le couturier a materialist writes has now become for the public that which it was for newton himself a simple word an idea stated in panorama des mondes since its cause is unknown herschel virtually says the same when remarking that whenever studying the motion of the heavenly bodies and the phenomena of attraction he feels penetrated at every moment with the idea of the existence of causes that act for us under a veil distinguishing their direct action from musee de sciences august eighteen fifty six end of note the modes of expression may have been different and the ideas more or less philosophically enunciated by all sacred and profane antiquity but the fundamental thought was the same note if we are taken to task for believing in operating gods and spirits while rejecting a personal god we answer to the thesis of monotheists admit that your jehovah is one of the elohim and we are ready to recognize him make for him as you do the infinite the one and the eternal god and we will never accept him in this character of tribal gods there were many the one universal deity is a principle an abstract root idea which has naught to do with the unclean work of a finite form we do not worship the gods we only honor them as beings superior to ourselves in this we obey the mosaic injunction while christians disobey their bible missionaries foremost of all thou shalt not revile the gods says one of them jehovah in exodus chapter twenty two verse twenty eight but at the same time in verse twenty it is commented he that sacrificeth to any god save unto the lord 
he shall be utterly destroyed. Now, in the original text, it is not God, but Elohim, and we challenge contradiction. And Jehovah is one of the Elohim, as proved by his own words in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, when the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, etc. Hence both those who worship and sacrifice to the Elohim, the angels, and to Jehovah, those who revile the gods of their fellow men, are far greater transgressors than the occultists or any theosophist. Meanwhile, many of the latter prefer believing in some one lord or other, and are quite welcome to do as they like. End of note. For Pythagoras, the forces were spiritual entities, gods independent of planets and matter as we see and know them on earth, who are the rulers of the sidereal heaven. Plato represented the planets as moved by an intrinsic rector, one with his dwelling, like a boatman in his boat. As for Aristotle, he called those rulers immaterial substances, though as one who had never been initiated, he rejected the gods as entities. See Vossius, Volume 2, page 528. Note on immaterial substances. To liken the immateriate species to wood and iron, and laugh at Spiller, referring to them as incorporeal matter, does not solve the mystery. Z Concepts of Modern Physics, page 165, et infra. But this did not prevent him from recognizing the fact that the stars and planets were not inanimate masses, but acting and living bodies indeed, as if sidereal spirits were the divine portion of their phenomena. Ta philotera ton phaneron, de Caelo, 1, 9. If we look for corroboration in more modern and scientific times, we find Tycho Brahe recognizing in the stars a triple force, divine, spiritual, and vital. Kepler putting together the Pythagorean sentence, the sun, guardian of Jupiter, and the verses of David, he placed his throne in the sun, and the Lord is the sun, etc., said that he understood perfectly how the Pythagoreans could believe that all the globes disseminated through space were rational intelligences, facultates raciocinative, circulating around the sun, in which resides a pure spirit of fire, the source of the general harmony. See De Mortibus Planetarum Harmonicis, page 248. When an occultist speaks of Forhat, the energizing and guiding intelligence in the universal electric or vital fluid, he is laughed at. Withal, as now shown, neither the nature of electricity, nor of life, nor even of light, are to this day understood. The occultist sees in the manifestation of every force in nature the action of the quality, or the special characteristic of its noumenon, which noumenon is a distinct and intelligent individuality on the other side of the manifested mechanical universe. Now the occultist does not deny, on the contrary he will support the claim, that light, heat, electricity, and so on, are affections, not properties or qualities, of matter. To put it more clearly, matter is the condition, the necessary basis or vehicle, a uh, sine qua non, for the manifestation of these forces, or agents, on this plane. But in order to gain the point, the occultists have to examine the credentials of the law of gravity, first of all, of gravitation, the king and ruler of matter under every form. To do so effectually, the hypothesis in its earliest appearance has to be recalled to mind. To begin with, is it Newton who was the first to discover it? The Athenaeum of January 26, 1867, has some curious information upon this subject. It says that, quote, Positive evidence can be adduced that Newton derived all his knowledge of gravitation and its laws from Burma, with whom gravitation or attraction is the first property of nature, for which him, his, Burma's system, shows us the inside of things while modern physical science is content with looking at the outside." End of quote. Then again, quote, the science of electricity, when was not yet in existence, when he, Burma, wrote, is there anticipated in his writings, 
and not only does Burma describe all the now known phenomena of that force, but he even gives us the origin, generation, and birth of electricity itself, etc. End of quote. Thus Newton, whose profound mind read easily between the lines and fathomed the spiritual thought of the great seer in his mystic rendering, owes his great discovery to Jakob Böhme, the nursling of the genii, near Manakayas, who watched over and guided him, of whom the author of the article in question so truly remarks that every new scientific discovery goes to prove his profound and intuitive insight into the most secret workings of nature and having discovered gravity newton in order to render possible the action of attraction in space had so to speak to annihilate every physical obstacle capable of impeding its free action either among others though he had more than a presentiment of its existence advocating the corpuscular theory he made an absolute vacuum between the heavenly bodies whatever may have been his suspicion and inner convictions about ether however many friends he may have unbosomed himself to as in the case of his correspondence with bentley his teachings never showed that he had any such belief if he was persuaded that the power of attraction could not be exerted by matter across a vacuum how is it that so late as eighteen sixty french astronomers le couturier for instance combated the disastrous results of the theory of vacuum established by the great man notes note in the statement of attraction across a vacuum see world life professor winchell LLD pages fifty nine and fifty no pages forty nine and fifty end of note note on le couturier il n'est plus possible aujourd'hui de soutenir comme newton que le corps céleste se mouve au milieu de vide monstre de ce espace parmi les conséquences de la théorie du vide établie par ce grand homme il ne reste plus de beau que le mot traction et nous verrons le jour où ce dernier mot disparaîtra du vocabulaire scientifique from Paranormal de Monde, pages 47 and 53. End of note. Professor Winchell writes, These passages, a letter to Bentley, show what were his views respecting the nature of the interplanetary medium of communication. Though declaring that the heavens are void of sensible matter, he elsewhere accepted perhaps uh, some very thin vapours streams and effluvia arising from the atmospheres of the earth planets and comets and from such an exceedingly rare ethereal medium as we have elsewhere described newton optics volume three query twenty eight in seventeen o four quoted in world life this only shows that even such great men as newton have not always the courage of their opinions Dr. T. S. Hunt called attention to some long-neglected passages in Newton's works, from which it appears that a belief in such universal intercosmical medium gradually took root in his mind, from the same source. But such attention was never called to the said passages before November 28, 1881, when Dr. Head read his Celestial Chemistry from the time of Newton. Quote, Till then the idea was universal, even among the men of science, that Newton had, while advocating the corpuscular theory, preached a void, as Le Coutier says. The passages had been long neglected, no doubt, because they contradicted and clashed with the preconceived pet theories of the day, till finally the undulatory theory imperiously required the presence of an ethereal medium to explain it. This is the whole secret. Anyhow, it is from that theory of Newton's of a universal void, thought, if not believed in by himself, that dates the immense scorn now shown by modern, for ancient physics. The old sages had maintained that nature abhorred vacuum, and the greatest mathematicians of the world, read of the Western races, had discovered the antiquated, quote, fallacy, unquote, and exposed it. And now modern science vindicates, however ungracefully, archaic knowledge, having, moreover, to vindicate Newton's character and powers of observation at this late hour, 
after having neglected for one century and a half to pay any attention to such very important passages, perchance because it was wiser not to attract any notice to them, better late than ever. And now Father Ether is re-welcomed with open arms, and wedded to gravitation, linked to it for weal or woe, until the day when it, or both, shall be replaced by something else. Three hundred years ago it was plenum everywhere, then it became one dismal vacuity. Later still, the sidereal ocean beds, dried up by science, rolled onward once more their ethereal waves. Recede ut procedes must become the motto of exact science, exact chiefly, in finding itself inexact every leap year. But we will not quarrel with the great men. They had to go back to the earliest gods of Pythagoras and old Canada for the very backbone and marrow of their correlations and newest discoveries, and this may well afford good hope to the occultists, for their minor gods. For we believe in Le Coutier's prophecy about gravitation. We know the day is approaching when an absolute reform would be demanded in the present modes of science by the scientists themselves, as was done by Sir W. Grove, F.R.S. Till that day there is nothing to be done, for if gravitation were dethroned to-morrow, the day after, the scientists would discover some other new mode of mechanical motion. Note. When read in a fair and unprejudiced spirit, Sir Isaac Newton's works are an ever-ready witness to show how he must have hesitated between gravitation and attraction, impulse, and some other unknown cause to explain the regular course of the planetary motion. But see Treatise on Colour, Volume 3, Question 31. We are told by Herschel that Newton left with his successors the duty of drawing all the scientific conclusions from his discovery. How modern science abused the privilege of building its newest theories upon the law of gravitation may be realized when one remembers how profoundly religious was that great man. End of note. Rough and uphill is the path of true science, and its days are full of vexation of spirit. But in the face of its, quote, thousand, unquote, contradictory hypotheses to explain physical phenomena, there never was yet a better one than that of motion, however paradoxically interpreted by materialism. As may be found in the first pages of Book One, occultists have nothing surely against motion the great breadth of Mr. Herbert Spencer's unknown. Note, the materialistic notion that because in a physics real or sensible motion is impossible in pure space or vacuum, therefore the eternal motion of an in cosmos, regarded as infinite space, is a fiction, only shows once more that such words as pure space, pure being, the absolute, etc., of Eastern metaphysics have never been understood in the West. End of note. But believing that everything on earth is the shadow of something in space, they believe in smaller breaths, which, living, intelligent, and independent of all but law, blow in every direction during manumentary periods. These signs will reject. But whatever replaces attraction, alias gravitation, the result will be the same. Science will be as far from the solution of its difficulties as it is now, unless it comes to some compromise with occultism and even with alchemy, which supposition will be regarded as an impertinence, but remains a fact nevertheless. As Fayet says, Il manque quelque chose au géologue pour faire la géologie de la lune, c'est d'être astronome. À la vérité, il manque aussi quelque chose aux astronomes pour aborder avec fruit cette étude, c'est d'être géologue. But he might have added, with a still more pointedness, ce qui manque à tous les deux, c'est l'intuition du mystique. Let us remember Sir William Grove's wise concluding remarks on the ultimate structure of matter or the minutiae of molecular actions, which, he thought, man will never know. Quote, much harm has already been done by attempting hypothetically 
to dissect matter and to discuss the shapes sizes and numbers of atoms and their atmospheres of heat ether or electricity whether the regarding electricity light magnetism etc as simple emotions of ordinary matter be or be not admissible certain it is that all past theories have resolved and all existing theories do resolve the action of these forces into motion whether it be that on account of our familiarity with motion we refer other affections to it as to a language which is most easily construed and most capable of explaining them or whether it be that it is in reality the only mode in which our minds as a country distinguished from our senses are able to conceive material agencies certain it is that since the period at which the mystic notions of spiritual or or preternatural powers were applied to account for physical phenomena all hypotheses framed to explain them have resolved them into motion unquote. and the learned gentleman states a purely occult tenet quote, the term perpetual motion which i have not infrequently used in these pages is itself equivocal if the doctrines here advanced be well founded all motion is in one sense perpetual in masses whose motion is stopped by mutual or concussion heat or motion of the particles is generated and thus the motion continues so that if we could venture to extend such thoughts to the universe we should assume the same amount of motion affecting the same amount of matter for ever Unquote. Note. See Correlation of Physical Forces, page 173. This is precisely what occultism maintains, and on the same principle that where force is made to oppose force and produce static equilibrium, the balance of pre-existing equilibrium is affected, and fresh motion is started equivalent to that which is withdrawn into a state of abeyance. This process finds intervals in the paralaya, but is eternal and ceaseless as the breath, even when the manifested cosmos rests. End of note. Thus, supposing attraction or gravitation should be given up in favor of the sun being a huge magnet, which is a theory already accepted by some physicists, a magnet that acts on the planets as attraction is now supposed to do, where to, or how much farther, would it lead the astronomers from where they are now? Well, not an inch farther. Kepler came to this, quote, curious hypothesis, unquote, nearly three hundred years ago. He had not discovered the theory of attraction and repulsion in cosmos, for it was known from the days of Empedocles, the two opposite forces being called by him hate and love which comes to the same thing. But Kepler gave a pretty fair description of cosmic magnetism. That such magnetism exists in nature is as certain as that gravitation does not. Not at any rate in the way in which it is taught by science, which never took into consideration the different modes in which the dual force that occultism calls attraction and repulsion may act within our solar system the earth's atmosphere and beyond in the cosmos note transsolar space writes the great humboldt does not hitherto show any phenomenon analogous to our solar system it is a peculiarity of our system that matter should have condensed within it in nebulous rings, the nuclei or which condense into earths and moons. I say again heretofore, nothing of the kind has ever been observed beyond our planetary system. See Revue Germanique of the 31st of December, 1860, article Lettres et Conversations d'Alexandre Humboldt. True, that since 1860, the nebula theory has sprung up, and, being better known, a few identical phenomena were supposed to be observed beyond the solar system. Yet the great man is quite right, and no earths or moons can be found except in appearance, beyond or of the same order of matter as found in our system. 
Such is the occult teaching. End of note. Now back to the main text, the following referring to uh, the passage on Kepler. This was proven by Newton himself, for there are many phenomena in our solar system which he confessed his inability to explain by the law of gravitation. Quote, Such were the uniformity in the directions of planetary movements, the nearly circular forms of the orbits, and their remarkable conformity to one plane, unquote, from Professor Winkel. And if there is one single exception, then the law of gravitation has no right to be referred to as a universal law. These adjustments, we are told, Newton, in his general scolium, pronounces to be the work of an intelligent and all-powerful being. Intelligent that being may be, as to all-powerful, uh, there would be every reason to doubt the claim a poor god he uh, who would work upon minor details and leave the most important to secondary forces the poverty of the argument and logic in this case is surpassed only by that of laplace who seeking very correctly to substitute motion for newton's all-powerful being and ignorant of the true nature of that eternal motion saw in it a blind physical law might not those arrangements be an effect of the laws of motion, he asks, forgetting, as all our modern scientists do, that this law and this motion are a vicious circle, so long as the nature of both remains unexplained. His famous answer to Napoleon, Dieu est devenu une hypothèse intuile, would be correctly stated only by one who had heard to the philosophy of the Vedantins. It becomes a pure fallacy if we exclude the interference of operating intelligent powerful, never all powerful, beings who are called gods. But we would ask the critics of the medieval astronomers why should Kepler be denounced as most unscientific for offering just the same solution as Newton did, only showing himself more sincere, more consistent, and even more logical? Where may be the difference between Newton's all-powerful being and Kepler's erectores, his sidereal and cosmic forces, or angels? Kepler is again criticized for his curious hypothesis which made use of a vortical movement within the solar system, for his theories in general, for his favoring Empedocles idea of attraction and repulsion, and solar magnetism in particular. Yet several modern men of science, as will be shown, Hunt, if Metcalf is to be excluded, Dr. Richardson, etc., favour the idea very seriously. He is half excused, however, on the plea that, to the time of Kepler, no interaction between masses of matter had been distinctly recognised, which was generically different from magnetism, from world life. Is it distinctly recognised now? Does Professor Winkel claim for science any serious knowledge whatever of the natures of either electricity or magnetism, except that both seem to be the effects of some result arising from an undetermined cause? The ideas of Kepler, weeded from their theological tendencies, are purely occult. He saw that, one, the sun is a great magnet, this is what some eminent modern scientists and also occultists believe in. Note, but see Astronomie du Moyen Âge by Delambre. End of note. 2. The solar substance is immaterial. See Isis Unveiled, Volume 1, pages 270 to 271. Note, in the sense, of course, of matter existing in states unknown to science. End of note. 3. He provided for the constant motion and restoration of the sun's energy and planetary motion the perpetual care of a spirit or spirits. The whole of antiquity believed in this idea. The occultists do not use the word spirit, but say creative forces which they endow with intelligence. But we may call them spirits also. This theory is tabooed a great deal 
more on account of the spirit that is given room to it than of anything else. Herskel, the elder, believed in it likewise, and so do several modern scientists also. Nevertheless, Professor Winkel declares that a hypothesis more fanciful and less in accord with the requirements of physical principles has not been offered in ancient or modern times. See World Life, page 554. The same was said once upon a time of the universal ether, and now it is not only accepted perforce, but advocated as the only possible theory to explain away certain mysteries. Gross ideas, when he first enunciated them in London about 1840, were called as unscientific as the above. Nevertheless, his views on the correlation of forces are now universally accepted. It would, very likely, require one more conversant with science than is the writer to combat with any success some of the now prevailing ideas about gravitation and other similar, quote, solutions, unquote, of cosmic mysteries. But let us recall a few objections that came from recognized men of science, from astronomers and physicists of eminence, who rejected the theory of rotation as well as that of gravitation. Thus one reads in the French Encyclopedia that science agrees, in the face of all its representatives, that it is impossible to explain the physical origin of the rotary motion of the solar system. If the question is asked, what causes rotation, we answered, it is the centrifugal force. And this force, what is it that produces it? The force of rotation, is the grave answer. See Godfrey, Cosmogonie de la Révélation. Note, we shall be taken to task for contradiction. It will be said that while we deny God, we admit souls and operative spirits, and quote from Roman Catholic begotted writers in support of our argument. To this we reply, we deny the anthropomorphic God of the monotheists, but never the divine principle in nature. We combat Protestants and Roman Catholics on a number of dogmatic theological beliefs of human and sectarian origin. We agree with them in their belief in spirits and intelligent operative powers, though we do not worship angels as Roman Latinists do. End of note. It will be well, perhaps, to examine both these theories as being directly or indirectly. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3, Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Addenda Chapter 5 The Theories of Rotation in Science Considering that the, quote, final cause is pronounced a chimera, and the first great cause it remanded to the sphere of the unknown, unquote, as a reverend gentleman justly complains, the number of hypotheses put forward, a nebula in itself, is most remarkable. The profane student is perplexed and does not know in which of the theories of exact science he has to believe. Here we have hypotheses enough for every taste and power of brain. They are all extracted from a number of scientific volumes. Current Hypotheses Explaining the Origin of Rotation Rotation has originated either A by the collision of nebular masses wandering aimlessly in space, or by attraction, in cases where no actual impact takes place. b. by the tangential action of currents of nebulous matter, in the case of an amorphous nebula, descending from higher to lower levels, or simply by the action of the central gravity of the mass. It is a fundamental principle in physics that no rotation could be generated in such a mass by the action of its own parts, as well attempt to change the course of a steamer by pulling at the deck railing, remarks to this Professor Winkel in World Life. Notes Note on descending from higher to lower levels. 
the terms high and low being only relative to the position of the observer in space, any use of those terms tending to convey the impression that they stand for abstract realities is necessarily fallacious. End of note. Note on simple by the action of the central gravity of the mass. Jacob Ennis, The Origin of the Stars, page 221, its sequence. End of note. Hypotheses of the origin of the seven planets and comets. A. We owe the birth of the planets, one, to an explosion of the sun, a parturition of its central mass, or two, to some kind of disruption of the nebular rings. Note on its central mass. If such is the case, how does science explain the comparatively small size of the planets nearest the sun? The theory of meteoric aggregation is only a step farther from truth than the nebula conception, and has not even the quality of the latter, its uh, metaphysical element. End of note. B. The comets are strangers to our planetary system. Laplace. The comets are undeniably generated in our solar system. Faye. C. The fixed stars are motionless, says one authority. All the stars are actually in motion, answers another authority. Undoubtedly, every star is in motion. Wolf. D. For over 350 million years, the slow and majestic movement of the sun around its axis has never for a moment ceased. Panorama du monde, le couturier. E. And the sun having Alcyone in the Pleiades for the center of its orbit consumes 180 million of years in completing its revolution. Madly. And also F that the sun has existed no more than fifteen million of years, and will emit heat for no longer than ten million years more. Sir William Thomson's lecture on the latent dynamical theory regarding the probable origin, total amount of heat, and duration of the sun, eighteen eighty seven. A few years ago this eminent scientist was telling the world that the time required for the earth to cool from incipient incrustation to its present state could not exceed eighty million years. Thompson and Tate, Natural Philosophy, Note. And even on these figures, Bischoff disagrees with Thompson and calculates that three hundred and fifty million years would be required for the Earth to cool from a temperature of twenty thousand degrees to two hundred degrees centigrade. This is also the opinion of Helmholtz. End of note. If the encrusted age of the world is only forty millions, or the half the duration once allowed, and the sun's age only fifteen millions. Have we to understand that the earth was at one time independent of the sun? Since the ages of the sun, planets, and the earth, as stated in the many scientific hypotheses of the astronomers and physicists, are given elsewhere, infer, we have said enough to show the disagreement between the ministers of modern science. Whether we accept the fifteen million years of Sir W. Thompson, or the thousand millions of Mr. Huxley for the rotational evolution of our solar system, it will always come to this. By accepting self-generated rotation for the heavenly bodies composed of inert matter, and yet moved by their own internal motion for millions of years, this teaching of science amounts to A an evident denial of that fundamental physical law which states that a body in motion tends constantly to inertia that is to continue in the same state of motion or rest unless it is stimulated into further action by a superior active force Unquote. b to an original impulse which culminates in an alternable motion within a resisting ether 
that Newton had declared incompatible with that motion. C. Universal gravity, which, we are taught, always tends to center in rectilinear descent, alone the cause of the revolution of the whole solar system, which is performing an eternal double gyration, each body around its axis and orbit. Another occasional version is D, a magnet in the sun, or the said revolution due to magnetic force, which acts, just as gravitation does, in a straight line, varying inversely as the square of the distance. Coulomb's law. E. The whole acting under invariable and changeless laws, which are, nevertheless, often shown variable, as during some well-known freaks of planets and other bodies, as also when the comets approach to or recede from the sun. F. A motive force always proportionate to the mass it is acting upon, but independent of the specific nature of that mass to which it is proportionate, which amounts to saying, as Le Couturier does, that, quote, without that force, independent from and of quite another nature than the said mass, the latter, were it as huge as Saturn or as tiny as Ceres, would always fall with the same rapidity. Monsieur de Sillon's 15th of August, 1857. A mass, furthermore, which derives its weight from the body on which it weighs. Thus, neither Laplace's perceptions of a solar atmospheric fluid, which would extend beyond the orbits of the planets, nor Le Couturier's electricity, nor, for course, heat, see Panorama du Monde, page 55, nor this nor the other can ever help any of the numerous hypotheses about the origin and permanency of rotation to escape from this squirrel's wheel any more than the theory of gravity itself this mystery is the procrustrean bed of physical science if matter is as now taught passive the simplest movement cannot be said to be an essential property of matter if the latter is simply an inert mass how then can uh, such a complicated movement compound and multiple harmonious and equilibrated lasting in the eternities for millions and millions of years be attributed simply to its own inherent force unless the latter is an intelligence a physical will is something new a conception that the ancients would have never entertained indeed Note. For over a century, all distinction between body and force is made away with. Quote, force is but the property of a body in motion, says the physicists, and life, the property of our animal organs, is but the result of their molecular arrangement, answered the psychologists. Quote, in the bosom of that aggregate which is named planet, teaches Littré, are developed all the forces imminent to matter. That is, that matter possesses in itself, and through itself, the forces that are proper to it, and which are primary, not secondary. Such forces are the property of weight, the property of electricity, of terrestrial magnetism, the property of life. Every planet can develop life, as earth, for instance, which had not always mankind on it, and now bears produit men. Unquote. Evie de Deux Monde, July 15th, 1860. End of note. Talk of the weight of the heavenly bodies, says an astronomer, but since it is recognized that weight decreases in proportion to the distance from the center, it becomes evident that, at a certain distance, that weight must be forcibly reduced to zero. Question mark. Were there any attraction, there would be equilibrium, and since the modern school recognizes neither a beneath nor an above in universal space, it is not clear what should cause the earth to fall, were there even no gravitation nor attraction. Unquote from cosmographie methinks the count de maistre was right in solving the question in his own theological way he cuts the gordian knot by saying quote, the planets rotate because they are made to rotate 
and the modern physical system of the universe is a physical impossibility. Unquote. From Soiree. For did not Herschel say the same thing when he remarked that there is a will needed to impart a circular motion and another will to restrain it? Discours, page 165. This shows and explains how a retarded planet is cunning enough to calculate so well its time as to hit off its arrival at the fixed minute. For if science sometimes succeeds with its great ingenuity in explaining some of such stoppages, retrograde motions, angles outside the orbits, etc., etc., by appearances resulting from the inequality of their progress and ours in the course of our mutual and respective orbits, we still know that there are others and, quote, very real and considerable deviations, unquote, according to Herschel, which cannot be explained except by the mutual and irregular action of those planets and by the perturbing influences of the sun. Unquote. We understand, however, that there are, besides those little and accidental perturbations, continuous perturbations called secular because of the extreme slowness with which the irregularity increases and affects the relations of the elliptic movement, and that these perturbations can be corrected. From Newton, who found that this world needed repairing very often, down to Renan, all say the same. In his Ciel de Terre, page 28, the latter speaks of, quote, the orbits described by the planets as being very far from immutable. On the contrary, subject to a perpetual mutation in their position and form, all prove gravitation and the peripatetic laws to be as negligent as they are quick to repair their mistakes. The charge as it stands seems to be that they, the orbits, are alternately widening and narrowing their great axis lengthens and diminishes, or oscillates at the same time from the right to the left around the sun, the plane itself, in which they are situated, raising and lowering itself periodically while pivoting around itself with a kind of tremor." Unquote. To this, de Merville, who believed an intelligent, quote, workman, unquote, ruling invisibly the solar system, as we do, observes very wittily, quote, Voilà certes, a voyage which has a little in it of mechanical rigueur. At the utmost, one could compare it to a steamer, pulled to and fro and tossed on the waves, retarded or accelerated, all and each of which impediments might put off its arrival indefinitely, were there not the intelligences of a pilot and engineers to catch up the lost time and to repair the damages. Unquote. Note Deuxième Memoire Manifestation Historique, page two seven two. End of note. The law of gravity, however, seems to become an obsolete law in story heaven. At any rate, those long haired sidereal radicals called comets, appear to be very poor respecters of the majesty of the law, and to beard it quite impudently. Nevertheless, and though presenting in nearly every respect phenomena not yet fully understood, comets and meteors are accredited by believers in modern science with obeying the same laws and consisting of the same matter as the suns, stars, and nebulae, and even the earth and its inhabitants. See Laying's Modern Science and Modern Thought. This is what one might call taking things on trust, eh, even to blind faith. But exact science is not to be questioned, and he rejects the hypotheses imagined by her students, gravitation for instance, would be regarded as an ignorant fool for it. Yet we are told by the just-cited author and queer legend from the scientific annals, quote, the comet of 1811 had a tail 120 millions of miles in length and 25 millions of miles in diameter at the widest part, while the diameter of the nucleus was about 
127,000 miles, more than ten times that of the Earth. Unquote. He tells us, in order that bodies of this magnitude passing near the Earth should not affect its motion or change the length of the year by even a single second, their actual substance must be inconceivably rare. Unquote. It must be so indeed, yet. Quote, the extreme tenuity of a comet's mass is also proved by the phenomenon of the tail, which, as the comet approaches the sun, is thrown out sometimes to a length of ninety millions of miles in a few hours. And what is remarkable, this tail is thrown out against the force of gravity, by some repulsive force, probably electrical, so that it always points away from the sun, triple exclamation mark, within brackets, and yet, thin as the matter of comets must be, it obeys the common law of gravity, within brackets, exclamation mark, question mark, and whether the comet revolves in an orbit within that of the outer planets, or shoots off into the abysses of space, and returns only after hundreds of years, its path is, at each instant, regulated by the same force as that which causes an apple to fall to the ground. Unquote. Ebed, page 17. Science is like Caesar's wife or Caesar's wife, and must not be suspected. This is evident. But it can be respectfully criticized, nevertheless. At all events, it may be reminded that, quote, the apple, unquote, is a dangerous fruit. For the second time in the history of mankind, it may become the cause of the fall, this time, of exact science. A comet whose tail defies the law of gravity right in the sun's face can hardly be credited with obeying that law. In a series of scientific works on astronomy and the nebular theory written between 1865 and 1866, the present writer, a poor tyro in science, has counted in a few hours no less than Thirty-nine contradictory hypotheses offered as explanations for the self-generated primitive rotary motion of the heavenly bodies. The writer is no astronomer, no mathematician, no scientist, but was obliged to examine these errors in defense of occultism, in general, and what is still more important, in order to support the occult teachings concerning astronomy and cosmology. Occultists were threatened with terrible penalties for questioning scientific truths. But now they feel braver. Science is less secure in its impregnable position than they were led to expect. And many of its strongholds are built on very shifting sands. Thus, even this poor and unscientific examination of it was useful, and it was certainly very instructive. We have learned a good many things, in fact, having studied with particular care, especially those astronomical data that would be the most likely to clash with our heterodox and, quote, superstitious, unquote, beliefs. So, for instance, we have found there, concerning gravitation, the actual and orbital motions, that synchronous movement having been once overcome in the early stage, it was enough to originate a rotary motion till the end of Manvantara. We have also come to know, in all the aforesaid combinations of possibilities with regard to incipient rotation, most complicated in every case, some of the causes to which it may have been due as well as some others to which it ought and should have been due, but in some way or other, was not. Among other things, we were informed that incipient rotation may be provoked with equal ease in a mass in Inius fusion, and in one that is characterized by glacial opacity, heaven and earth. The gravitation is a law which nothing can overcome, but which, nevertheless, is overcome in and out of season 
by the most ordinary celestial or terrestrial bodies the tales of impudent comets for instance that we owe the universe to the holy creative trinity called inert matter senseless force and blind chance of the real essence and nature of any of these three science knows nothing but this is a trifling detail ergo we are told that when a mass of cosmic or nebular matter whose nature is unknown entirely so and which may be in a state of fusion according to laplace or dark and cold according to thomson for this intervention of heat itself is a pure hypothesis according to fay decides to exhibit its mechanical energy under the form of rotation it acts in this wise it the mass either bursts into spontaneous conflagration or it remains inert tenebrous and frigid both states being equally capable of sending it without any adequate cause spinning through space for millions of years its movement may be retrograde and they may be direct about a hundred various reasons being offered for both motions in about as many hypotheses anyhow joining the maze of stars whose origin belongs to the same miraculous and spontaneous order for quote, the nebula theory does not profess to discover the origin of things but only a stadium in material history unquote, from winchell world life those millions of suns planets and satellites composed of inert matter will whirl on in most impressive and majestic symmetry around the firmament moved and guided only their inertia notwithstanding quote, by their own internal motion Unquote. Shall we wonder after this if learned mystics, pious Roman Catholics, and even such learned astronomers as were Schobart and Godfrey, have preferred the Kabbalah and the ancient systems to the modern dreary and contradictory exposition of the universe? The Sohar makes a distinction, at any rate, between quote, the Hajaskar, the light forces, the Hakosher, reflected lights and the simple phenomenal exteriority of their spiritual types see cabala denudata volume two sixty seven the question of quote, gravity unquote, may now be dismissed another hypothesis examined that physical science knows nothing of forces is clear we may close the argument, however, by calling to our help one more man of science, Professor John, member of the Academy of Médecins at Montpellier. Says this learned man, speaking of forces, quote, A cause is that which is essentially acting in the genealogy of phenomena, in every production as in every modification. I said that activity, or force, was invisible, to suppose its corporeal and residing in the properties of matter would be a gratuitous hypothesis. To reduce all the causes to God would amount to embarrassing oneself with a hypothesis hostile to many varieties. But to speak of a plurality of forces proceeding from the deity and possessing inherent powers of their own is not unreasonable, and I am disposed to admit phenomena produced by intermediate agents called forces or secondary agents. The distinction of forces is the principle of the division of sciences. So many real and separate forces, so many mother sciences. No, forces are not superstitions and abstractions, but realities and the only acting realities whose attributes can be determined with the help of direct observation and induction." Unquote. Sur la distinction de force, published in the Mémoire de l'Académie de Sciences de Montpellier, Volume 2, Facsimile 1, 1854. This ends Chapter 5 of the Addenda, Volume 1, and The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, 
facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3, Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Addenda, Chapter 6, The Masks of Science. Physics or Metaphysics? Question mark. If there is anything on earth like progress, science will some day have to give up. Nolens volens. Such monstrous ideas as her physical self-guiding laws, void of soul and spirit, and then turn to the occult teachings. It has done so already, however altered are the title page and revised editions of the scientific catechism. It is now over half a century since, in comparing modern with ancient thought, it has been found that, however different our philosophy may appear from that of our ancestors, it is, nevertheless, composed only of additions and subtractions, taken from the old philosophy and transmitted drop by drop through the filter of antecedents. This fact was well known to Faraday and other eminent men of science. Atoms, ether, evolution itself, all comes to modern science from ancient notions. All is based on the conceptions of the archaic nations. Conceptions for the profane, under the shape of allegories, plain truths taught during the initiations to the elect, which truths have been partially divulged through Greek writers and have descended to us. This does not mean that occultism has ever had the same views on matter, atoms, and ether as found in the exotericism of the classical Greek writers. Yet, if we believe Mr. Tyndall, even Faraday was an Aristotelian and an agnostic more than a materialist. In his Faraday, The Discoverer, page 123, the author shows the great physicists using old reflections of Aristotle, which are concisely found in some of his works. Faraday, Boscovich, and all others, however, who see in the atoms and molecules centers of force, and in the corresponding element force, an entity by itself, are far nearer the truth, perchance, than those who, denouncing them, denounce at the same time the old corpuscular Pythagorean theory, one, by the way, which has never passed to posterity as the great philosopher really taught it, on the grounds of its delusion that the conceptual elements of matter can be grasped as separate and real entities. The chief and most fatal mistake and fallacy made by science in the view of the occultists lie in the idea of the possibility of such a thing as inorganic or dead matter in nature. Is anything dead or inorganic capable of transformation or change? Occultism asks. And is there anything under the sun which remains immutable or changeless? This fallacy is nowhere better illustrated than in the scientific work of a German savant, Professor Philipp Spiller, in Der Weltalter als kosmische Kraft. In this cosmological treatise, the author attempts to prove that no material constituent of a body, no atom, is in itself originally endowed with force, but that every such atom is absolutely dead and without any power to act at a distance. See page 4. Note. Something dead implies that it has been at some time living. When? At what period of cosmogony? Occultism says that in all cases, when matter appears inert, it is the most active. A wooden or a stone block is motionless and impenetrable to all intents and purposes. Nevertheless and de facto, its particles are in ceaseless eternal vibration, which is so rapid that to the physical eye the body seems absolutely devoid of motion and the spatial distance between those particles in their vibratory motion is, considered from another plane of being and perception, as great as that which separates snowflakes or drops of rain. But to physical science this will be an absurdity. End of note. This statement, however, does not prevent Spiller from enunciating an occult doctrine and principle. He asserts the independent substantiality of force, and shows it as an incorporeal stuff un körperlicher Stoff, or substance. Now, substance is not matter in metaphysics, and for argument's sake it may be granted that it is a wrong expression to use. 
but this is due to the poverty of European languages and especially to that of scientific terms. Then this stuff is identified and connected by Spiele with the aether. Expressed in occult language, it might be said with more correctness that this force substance is the ever-active phenomenal positive aether, prakriti, while the omnipresent or pervading ether is the noumenon of the former, the substratum of all, or akasha. Nevertheless, Stalo falls foul of Spiller, as it does of the materialists. He is accused of utter disregard of the fundamental correlation of force and matter, of neither of which science knoweth anything certain. For this hypostasized half-concept is, in the view of all other physicists, not only imponderable, but destitute of cohesive, chemical, thermal, electric, and magnetic forces, of all of which forces, according to occultism, aether is the source and cause. Therefore Spiller, with all his mistakes, exhibits more intuition than any other modern scientist, with the exception of Dr. Richardson, perhaps, the theorist on the nerve force, or nervous ether, also on sun force and earth force. Note. See Popular Science Review, Volume 5, pages 329 to 334. End of note. For aether, in esotericism, is the very quintessence of all possible energy, and it is certainly to this universal agent, composed of many agents, that all the manifestations of energy in the material, psychic and spiritual worlds are due. What are electricity and light, in fact? And how can science know that one is a fluid and the other a mode of motion? Why is it not made clear why a difference should be made between them, since both are considered force correlations? Electricity is a fluid, we are told, immaterial and non-molecular, though Helmholtz thinks otherwise and the proof of it is that we can bottle it up, accumulate, and store it away. Then it must be simply matter, and no peculiar fluid. Nor is it only a mode of motion, for motion could hardly be stored in a laden jar. As for light, it is a still more extraordinary mode of motion, since, marvellous as it may appear, light also can actually be stored up for use, as demonstrated by Professor Grove nearly half a century ago. Take an engraving, on which has been kept for some days in the dark, expose it to full sunshine, that is, insulate it for fifteen minutes, lay it on sensitive paper in a dark place, and at the end of twenty-four hours it will have left an impression of itself on the sensitive paper, the white coming out as blacks. There seems to be no limit for the reproduction of engravings, etc., etc. What is it that remains fixed, nailed, so to say, on the paper? It is a force, certainly, that fixed the thing. But what is that thing, the residue on which remains on the paper? Our learned men will get out of this through some scientific technicality. But what is it that is intercepted, so as to imprison a certain quantity of it on glass, paper, or wood? Is it motion, or is it force? Or shall we be told that what remains behind is the effect only of the force of motion? Then what is this force? Force or energy is a quality, but every quality must belong to a something, or a somebody. In physics, force is defined as that which changes or tends to change any physical relation between bodies, whether mechanical, thermal, chemical, electrical, magnetic, etc. But it is not that force or that motion which remains behind on the paper when the force of motion has ceased to act, and yet something which our physical senses cannot perceive has been left there to become a cause in its turn and produce effects. What is it? It is not matter as defined by science, that is, matter in any of its known states. An alchemist would say it was a spiritual secretion, and would be laughed at. But yet, when the physicist said that electricity stored up was a fluid, or that light fixed on paper is still sunlight, this is science. Note, the newest authorities have rejected these explanations as exploded theories, and have now deified motion as their sole idol. But surely they and their idol will one day share the fate of their predecessors. End of note. In the opinion of an experienced occultist, one who has verified the whole series of Nidanas, 
of causes and effects that finally project their last effect onto this our plane of manifestations, one has traced matter back to its noumenon. The explanation of the physicist is like calling anger, or its effect, the exclamation provoked by it, a secretion or a fluid, and man, the cause of it, its material conductor. But as Grove prophetically remarked, that day is fast approaching when it will be confessed that the forces we know of are but the phenomenal manifestations of realities we know nothing about, but which were known to the ancients and by them worshipped. He made one still more suggestive remark, however, which ought to have become the motto of science, but has not. Sir W. Grove said that science should have neither desires nor prejudices. Truth should be her sole aim. Meanwhile, in our days, scientists are more self-opinionated and begotted than even the clergy, for they minister too, if they do not actually worship, force matter, which is their unknown God. And how unknown it is may be inferred from the many confessions of the most eminent physicists and biologists with Faraday at their head. Not only, he said, could he never presume to pronounce whether force was a property or function of matter, but he actually did not know what was meant by the word matter. There was a time, he added, when he believed he knew something of matter, but the more he lived and the more carefully he studied it, the more he became convinced of his utter ignorance of the nature of matter. See Buckwell's Electric Science. Note, this ominous confession was made, we believe, at a scientific congress at Swansea. Faraday held a similar opinion, however, as stated by Tyndall. Quote, what do we know of the atom apart from its force? You imagine a nucleus which may be called A, and surrounded by forces which may be called M. To my mind the A, or nucleus, vanishes, and the substance consists of the powers M. And indeed, what notion can we form? of the nucleus independent of its powers. What thought remains on which to hang the imagination of an A independent of the acknowledged forces? Unquote. End of note. The occultists are often misunderstood because, for lack of better terms, they apply to the essence of force under certain aspects the descriptive epithet of substance. Now the names for the varieties of substance on different planes of perception and being are legion eastern occultism has a special appellation for each kind but science like uh, england in the recollection of a witty frenchman blessed with thirty-six religions and only one fish sauce has but one name for all namely substance moreover neither the orthodox physicists nor their critics seem to be very certain of their premises, and are as apt to confuse the effects as they do the causes. It is incorrect, for instance, to say, as Staller does, that, quote, matter can no more be realized or conceived as mere spatial presence than as a concretion of forces, unquote. Or that, quote, force is nothing without mass, and mass is nothing without force, unquote for one is the noumenon, and the other the phenomenon. Again, Schelling, when saying that, quote, it is a mere delusion of the fantasy that something, we know not what, remains after we have denuded an object of all the predicates belonging to it, unquote, could never have applied the remark to the realm of transcendental metaphysics. Note, see Schelling, Ideen, etc., page 18. End of note. It is true that pure force is nothing in the world of physics. It is all in the domain of spirit. Says Stahler, quote, If we reduce the mass upon which a given force, however small, acts to its limit zero, or mathematically expressed until it becomes infinitely small, the consequence is that the velocity of the resulting motion is infinitely great, and that the thing is at any given moment neither here nor there but everywhere that there is no real presence it is impossible therefore to construct matter by a synthesis of forces unquote. from page one six one 
This may be true in the phenomenal world, inasmuch as the illusive reflection of the one reality of the supersensual world may appear true to the dwarfed conceptions of materialist. It is absolutely incorrect when the argument is applied to things in what the Kabbalists call the supermundane spheres. Inertia, so called, is force according to Newton. Principle definitions three, and for the student of esoteric sciences. The greatest of the occult forces, a body may be considered divorced from its relations with other bodies, which, according to physical and mechanical sciences, give rise to its attributes, only conceptually, only on this plane of illusion. In fact, it can never be so detached. Death itself being unable to detach it from its relation with the universal forces. Or which the one force or life is the synthesis, but simply continues such interrelation on another plane. But what, if Stahler is right, can Dr. James Crowell mean when, in speaking on the transformation of gravity in Philosophical Magazine, Volume Two, page two five two, he brings forward the views advocated by Faraday, Waterston, and others? For his says very plainly that gravity. Quote, Is a force pervading space external to bodies, and that on the mutual approach of the bodies, the force is not increased as is generally supposed, but the bodies merely pass into a place where the force exists with greater intensity. Unquote. No one will deny that a force, whether gravity, electricity, or any other force which exists outside of the bodies and in open space. Be it ether or vacuum, must be something, and not a pure nothing, when conceived apart from a mass. Otherwise, it could hardly exist in one place with a greater, in another with reduced quote, intensity. G. R. Ernst declares the same in his Theorie Mécanique de l'Univers. He tries to demonstrate that the atom of the chemists is not an entity of pure convention or simply an explicative device. But that it exists really, that its volume is unalterable, and that consequently it is not elastic. Within brackets, double exclamation mark. Force, therefore, is not in the atom; it is in the space which separates the atoms from each other.、Unquote. The above cited views, expressed by two men of science of great eminence in their respective countries, show that it is not in the least unscientific to speak of the substantiality of the so-called forces. Subject to some future specific name, this force is a substance of some kind and can be nothing else. And perhaps one day science will be the first to re-adopt the derided name of phlogiston. Whatever may be the future name given to it. To maintain that force does not reside in the atoms, but only in space between them, may be scientific enough. Nevertheless, it is not true. To the mind of an occultist, it is like saying that water does not reside in the drops of which the ocean is composed, but only in the space between those drops. The objection made that there are two distinct schools of physicists, by one of which the force is assumed to be an independent, substantial entity which is not a property of matter, nor is it essentially related to matter, is hardly likely to help the profane to any clear understanding. Note: See Concepts of Modern Physics, thirty-one, introductory to the second edition. End of note. It is, on the contrary, still more calculated to throw the question into greater confusion than ever. For force is then neither this nor the other. By viewing it as an independent, substantial entity, the theory extends the right hand of fellowship to occultism, while the strange, contradictory idea that it is not related to matter otherwise than by its power to act upon it leads physical science to the most absurd, contradictory hypotheses. With the force of motion. Archetism, seeing no difference between the two, never attempts to separate them. It cannot act for the adherents of the atomo-mechanical theory one way, and for those of the rival school in another way. Nor can the atoms be in one case absolutely uniform in size and weight, and in another vary in their weight, according to Avogadro's law. For, in the words of the same able critic, quote, 
while the absolutely equality of the primordial units of mass is thus an essential part of the very foundations of the mechanical theory the whole modern science of chemistry is based upon a principle directly subversive of it a principle of which it has recently been said that it holds the same place in chemistry that the law of gravitation does in astronomy this principle is known as the law of avogadro or ampere notes see j p cook the new chemistry page thirteen and note it imports that equal volumes of all substances when in the gaseous state and under like conditions of pressure and temperature contain the same number of molecules whence it follows that the weights of the molecules are proportional to the specific gravities of the gases that therefore these being different the weights of the molecules are different also and inasmuch as the molecules of certain elementary substances are monatomic consist of but one atom each while the molecules of various other substances contain the same number of atoms that the ultimate atoms of such substances are of different weights see concepts of modern physics page thirty four as shown further on in the same volume this cardinal principle of modern theoretical chemistry is in utter and irreconcilable conflict with the first proposition of the atomo mechanical theory namely the absolute equality of the primordial units of mass End of notes. this shows that either modern chemistry or modern physics is entirely wrong in its respective fundamental principles for if the assumption of atoms of different specific gravities on the basis of the atomic theory in physics is deemed absurd and chemistry meets nevertheless on its opposite basis in the question of the formation and transformation of chemical compounds with quote, unfailing experimental verification unquote, then it becomes apparent that it is the atomic mechanical theory which is untenable the explanations of the latter that the differences of weight are only differences of density and differences of density are differences of distance between the particles contained in a given space are not really valid because before a physicist can argue in his defense that as in the atom there is no multiplicity of particles and no void space hence differences of density or weight are impossible in the case of atoms he must first know what an atom is in reality, and that he cannot know. He must bring it at under the observation of at least one of his physical senses, and that he cannot do for the simple reason that no one has ever seen, smelt, heard, touched, or tasted an quote, atom. Unquote. The atom belongs wholly to the domain of metaphysics. It is an entified abstraction at any rate for physical science, and has naught to do with physics, strictly speaking, as it can never be brought to the test of retort or balance. The mechanical conception, therefore, becomes a jumble of the most conflicting theories and dilemmas in the minds of the many scientists who disagree on this, as on other subjects. The evolution of which the Eastern occultist, who follows this scientific strife, beholds in the greatest bewilderment. To conclude on the question of gravity, how can science presume to know anything certain of it? How can it maintain its position and its hypotheses against those of the occultists who see in gravity only sympathy and antipathy, or attraction and repulsion, caused by physical polarity on our terrestrial plane and by spiritual causes outside of its influence? How can they disagree with the occultists before they agree among themselves? Indeed, one hears of the conversation of energy, and in the same breath, of the perfect hardness and inelasticity of the atoms, of the kinetic theory of gases being identical with potential energy, so-called, and at the same time, of the elementary units of mass being absolutely hard and inelastic. An occultist opens a scientific work and reads as follows. Quote, physical atomism derives all the qualitative properties of matter from the forms of atomic motion. The atoms themselves remain as elements utterly devoid of property. Unquote. See Wundt, Die Theorie der Materie, page 381, and further, chemistry in its ultimate form must be atomic mechanics. 
see Nazisman, Termokimi, page 150, and a moment after he is told that gases consist of atoms which behave like solid, perfectly elastic spheres, see Kronik, Clausius, Maxwell, etc., in Philosophical Magazine, volume 19, page 18. Finally, to crown all, Sir W. Thompson is found declaring that we are forbidden by the modern theory of the conservation of energy to assume inelasticity or anything short of perfect elasticity of the ultimate molecules, whether of ultramundane or mundane matter. Triple exclamation mark within brackets. See Philosophical Magazine, page 321. But what do the men of true science say to all this? By the men of true science whom we mean and those who care too much for truth and too little for their personal vanity to dogmatize on anything, as the majority do. There are several among them, perhaps more than dare publish openly their secret conclusions for fear of the cry, Stone him to death! Men whose intuitions have made them span the abyss that lies between the terrestrial aspect of matter and the to us, on our plane of illusion, subjective, that is, transcendentally objective substance, and led them to proclaim the existence of the latter. Matter, to the occultist, it must be remembered, is that totality of existences in the cosmos, which falls within any of the planes of possible perception. We are but too well aware that the orthodox theories of sound, heat and light are against the occult doctrines. But it is not enough for the men of science or their defenders to say that they do not deny dynamic power to light and heat, and urge as a proof the fact that Mr. Crook's radiometer has unsettled no views. If they would fathom the ultimate nature of these forces, they have first to admit their substantial nature, however supersensus. Neither do the occultists deny the correctness of the vibratory theory. Note, referring to the aura, one of the masters says in the occult world, how could you make yourself understood by command, in fact, those semi-intelligent forces, whose means of communication with us are not through spoken words, but through sounds and colors, in correlation between the vibrations of the two. It is this correlation that is unknown to modern science. It was many times explained by the alchemists. End of note. Only they limit its function to our earth declaring its inadequacy on other planes than ours, since masters in the occult sciences perceive the causes that produce ethereal vibrations. Were all these only the fictions of the alchemists, or dreams of the mystics, such men as Paracelsus, Philalethes, Van Helmont, and so many others, would have to be regarded as worse than visionaries, they would become impostors and deliberate mystificators. The occultists are taken to task for calling the course of light, heat, sound, cohesion, magnetism, etc., etc., a substance. Note. The substance of the occultist, however, is the most refined substance of the physicist. What radiant matter is to the leather of the chemist's boots? End of note. Mr. Clerk Maxwell has stated that the pressure of strong sunlight on a square mile is about three and a quarter pounds. It is, they are told, the energy of the myriad ether waves. And when they call it a substance impinging on that area, their explanation is proclaimed unscientific. There is no justification for such an accusation. In no way, as stated more than once before now, do the occultists dispute the explanations of science as affording a solution of the immediate objective agencies at work? Science only errs in believing that because it has detected in vibratory waves the proximate cause of these phenomena, it has therefore revealed all that lies beyond the threshold of sense. It merely traces the sequence of phenomena on a plane of effects, illusory projections from the region that occultism has long since penetrated. 
and the latter maintains that those etheric tremors are not as asserted by science set up by the vibrations of the molecules of known bodies the matter of our terrestrial objective consciousness but that we must seek for the ultimate causes of light heat etc etc in matter existing in supersensive states states however as fully objective to the spiritual eye of man as a horse or a tree is to the ordinary mortal light and heat are the ghost or shadow of matter in motion such states can be perceived by the seer or the adept during the hours of trance under the sushumna rav the first of the seven mystic rays of the sun note the names of the seven rays which are sushumna harikesa vishvakarman vishvatriarkas sanada sarvarvasu and svaraj are all mystical and each has its distinct application in a distinct state of consciousness for occult purposes the sushuma as said in the nirukta eleven six is only to light up the moon is the ray nevertheless cherished by the initiated yogis the totality of the seven rays spread through the solar system constitutes so they say the physical upadi basis of the ether of science in which upadi light heat electricity etc etc the forces of orthodox science correlate to produce their terrestrial effects as psychic and spiritual effects they emanate from and have their origin in the suprasolar upadi in the ether of the occultist or akasha End of note. thus we have put forward the occult teaching which maintains the reality of a supersubstantial and supersensible essence of that akasha not ether which is only an aspect of the latter the nature of which cannot be inferred from its remote manifestations its merely phenomenal phalanx of effects on this terrene plane science on the contrary informs us that heat can never be regarded as matter in any conceivable state note to cite a most impartial critic one whose authority no one can call in question as a reminder to western dogmatists that the question cannot be in any way considered as settled Quote, there is no fundamental difference between light and heat each is merely a metamorphosis of the other heat is light in complete repose light is heat in rapid motion directly light is combined with a body it becomes heat but when it is thrown off from that body it again becomes light leslie's fluid theory of light and heat whether this is true or false we cannot tell and many years perhaps many generations will have to elapse before we shall be able to tell see buckle's history of civilization volume three page three eight four end of note we are also told that the two great obstacles to the fluid within brackets a question mark theory of heat undoubtedly are one the production of heat by friction excitation of molecular motions two the conversion of heat into mechanical motion the answer given is there are fluids of various kinds electricity is called a fluid and so was heat quite recently but it was on the supposition that heat was some imponderable substance this was during the supreme and autocratic reign of matter when the latter was dethroned and motion was proclaimed the sole sovereign ruler of the universe heat became a mode of motion we need not despair it may become something else tomorrow like the universe itself science is ever becoming and can never say i am that i am on the other hand occult science has its changeless traditions from prehistoric times it may err in particulars it can never become guilty of a mistaken question of universal laws simply because that science justly referred to by philosophy as the divine was born on higher planes and was brought on earth by beings who were wiser than man will be even in the seventh race of his seventh round and that science maintains that forces are not what modern learning would have them for example magnetism is not a mode of motion and in this particular case at least 
exact modern science is sure to come to grief some day. Nothing at the first blush can appear more ridiculous, more outrageously absurd than to say, for instance, the Hindu initiated yogi knows really ten times more than the greatest European physicist of the ultimate nature and constitution of light, both solar and lunar. Yet why is the Sushumna ray believed to be that ray which furnishes the moon with its borrowed light? Why is it the ray cherished by the initiated yogi? Why is the moon held as the deity of the mind by those yogis? We say, because light, or rather all its occult properties, every combination and correlation of it with other forces, mental, psychic, and spiritual, were perfectly known to the old adepts. Therefore, although in its knowledge of the ultimate constitution of matter, or in the so-called ultimate analysis, as opposed to the proximate in chemistry, occult science may be less well informed as to the behavior of compound elements in various cases of physical correlations, still it is immeasurably higher in its knowledge of the ultimate occult states of matter, and of the true nature of matter, than all the physicists and chemists of our modern day put together. Now, if we state the truth openly and in full sincerity, namely that the ancient initiates had a far wider knowledge of physics as a science of nature than our academies of science all taken together possess, the statement will be characterized as an impertinence and an absurdity, for physical sciences are considered to have been carried in our age to the apex of perfection. Hence the twitting query. Can the occultists meet successfully the two points, namely a. the production of heat by friction, excitation of molecular motions, and b. the conversion of heat into mechanical force, if they hold to the old exploded theory of heat being a substance or a fluid? To answer the question, it must first be observed that the occult sciences do not regard either electricity or any of the forces supposed to be generated by it as matter in any of the states known to physical science. To put it more clearly, none of these forces, so-called, are either solids, gases, or fluids. If it did not look pedantic, an occultist would even object to electricity being called a fluid as it is an effect and not a cause. But its noumenon, he would say, is a conscious cause. The same in the case of force and the atom. Let us see what an eminent academician, Butarov, the chemist, had to say about these two abstractions. What is force, argues this great man of science? What is it, from a strictly scientific standpoint, and not warranted by the law of conservation of energy. Conceptions of force are assumed by our conceptions of this, that, or another mode of motion. Force is thus simply the passage of one state of motion into another state of the same, of electricity into heat and light, of heat into sound or some mechanical function, and so on. Note. On the plane of manifestation and illusionary matter it may be so, not that it is nothing more, for it is vastly more. End of note. The first time electric fluid was produced by man on earth, it must have been by friction. Hence, as well known, it is heat that produces it by disturbing its lyre state, and electricity exists no more on earth per se than heat or light or any other force. Note on the lyre state, neutral or zero. End of note. They are all correlations, as science says. When a given quantity of heat, assisted by a steam engine, is transformed into mechanical work, we speak of steam power or force. When a falling body strikes an obstacle in its way, thereby generating heat and sound, we call it the power of collision. When electricity decomposes water or heats a platinum wire, we speak of the force of the electric fluid. When the rays of the sun are intercepted by the thermometer bulb and its quicksilver expands, we speak of the calorific energy of the sun. In short, when one state of a determined quantity of motion ceases, 
another state of motion equivalent to the preceding takes its place, and the result of such a transformation or correlation is force. In all cases where such a transformation or the passage of one state of motion into another is entirely absent, there no force is possible. Let us admit for a moment an absolutely homogeneous state of the universe, and our conception of force falls down to naught. Therefore it becomes evident that the force which materialism considers as the cause of the diversity that surrounds us is in sober reality only an effect, a result of that diversity. From such point of view, force is not the cause of motion, but a result, while the cause of that force, or forces, is not the substance or matter, but motion itself. Matter thus must be laid aside, and with it the basic principle of materialism, which has become unnecessary, as force brought down to a state of motion can give no idea of the substance. If force is the result of motion, then it becomes incomprehensible why that motion should become witness to matter and not to spirit or spiritual essence. True, our reason cannot conceive of a motion minus something moving, and our reason is right. But the nature or esse of that something moving remains to science entirely unknown, and the spiritualist in such case has as much right to attribute it to a spirit as a materialist to creative and all potential matter. A materialist has no special privileges in this instance, nor can he claim any. The law of the conservation of energy, as thus seen, is shown to be illegitimate in its pretensions and claims in this case. The great dogma, no force without matter and no matter without force, falls to the ground and loses entirely the solemn significance with which materialism has tried to invest it. The conception of force still gives no idea of matter and compels us in no way to see in it the origin of all origins. From Scientific Letters by Professor Butluff We are assured that real science is not materialistic, and our own conviction tells us that it cannot be so when its learning is real. There is a good reason for it, well defined by some physicists and chemists themselves. Natural sciences cannot go hand in hand with materialism. To be at the height of their calling, men of science have to reject the very possibility of materialistic doctrines having aught to do with the atomic theory. And we find that Lange, Butlouf, Dubois, Raymond, the latter probably unconsciously, and several others have proved it, and it is furthermore demonstrated by the fact that Canada in India, and Leokippus, Democritus, and after them Epicurus, the earliest atomists in Europe, while propagating their doctrine of definite proportions, believed in gods or supersensuous entities at the same time. Their ideas upon matter thus differed from those now prevalent. We must be allowed to make our statement clearer in a short synopsis of the ancient and modern views of philosophy upon atoms, and thus prove that the atomic theory kills materialism. From the standpoint of materialism, which reduces the beginnings of all to matter, the universe consists, in its fullness, of atoms and vacuity. Even leaving aside the axiom now absolutely demonstrated by telescope and microscope, taught by the ancients, that nature abhors vacuum, what is an atom? It is, we are answered by science, writes Professor Butlov, the limited division of substance, the indivisible particle of matter. To admit the divisibility of the atom amounts to an admission of an infinite divisibility of substance which is equivalent to reducing substance to nihil, a nothingness. Owing to a feeling of self-preservation alone, materialism cannot admit infinite divisibility. Otherwise it would have to bid farewell forever to its basic principle and thus sign its own death warrant. Buchner, for instance, like a true dogmatist in materialism, declares that to accept infinite divisibility is absurd and amounts to doubting the very existence of matter. The atom is indivisible, then, saith materialism. 
Very well. Quote, See now what a curious contradiction this fundamental principle of the materialists is leading them into, writes Butleroff. The atom is indivisible, and at the same time we know it to be elastic. An attempt to deprive it of elasticity at the same time is unthinkable. It would amount to an absurdity. Absolutely non-elastic atoms could never exhibit a single one of those numerous phenomena that are attributed to their correlations. Without an elasticity, the atoms could not manifest their energy, and the substance of the materialists would remain weeded of every force. Therefore, if the universe is composed of atoms, then those atoms must be elastic. It is here that we meet with an insuperable obstacle. For what are the conditions requisite for the manifestation of elasticity? An elastic ball, when striking against an obstacle, is flattened and contracts, which it would be impossible for it to do were not that ball to consist of particles, the relative position of which experiences at the same time of the blow a temporary change. This may be said of elasticity in general. No elasticity is possible without change with respect to the position of the compound particles of an elastic body. This means that the elastic body is changeful and consists of particles, or, in other words, that elasticity can pertain only to those bodies that are divisible, and the atom is elastic." Unquote. This is sufficient to show how absurd are the simultaneous admissions of the non-divisibility and elasticity of the atom. The atom is elastic, ergo, the atom is divisible, and must consist of particles, or of sub-atoms. And the sub-atoms? They are either non-elastic, and in such case they represent no dynamic importance, or they are elastic also, and in that case they too are subject to divisibility, and thus ad infinitum. But infinite divisibility of atoms resolves matter into simple centers of force, that is, precludes the possibility of conceiving matter as an objective substance. This vicious circle is fatal to materialism. It finds itself caught in its own nets, and no issue is possible for it out of the dilemma. If it says that the atom is indivisible, then it will have mechanics asking it the awkward question, how does the universe move in this case, and how do its forces correlate? A world built on absolutely non-elastic atoms is like an engine without steam. It is doomed to eternal inertia. Note. See Scientific Letters by Butlerov. End of note. Accept the explanations and teachings of occultism and the blind inertia of physical science being replaced by the intelligent active powers behind the veil of matter, motion and inertia becomes subservient to those powers. It is on the doctrine of the elusive nature of matter and the infinite divisibility of the atom that the whole science of occultism is built. It opens limitless horizons to substance informed by the divine breath of a soul in every possible state of tenuity, states still undreamt of by the most spiritually disposed chemists and physicists. The above views were enunciated by an academician, the greatest chemist in Russia, and a recognized authority even in Europe, the late Professor Butlerov. True, he was defending the phenomena of the spiritualists, the materializations, so-called, in which he believed as Professor Zöllner and Hare did, as Mr. A. Russell Wallace, Mr. W. Crookes, and many another fellow of the Royal Society do still, whether openly or secretly, but his argument with regard to the nature of the essence that acts behind the physical phenomena of light, heat, electricity, etc., is no less scientific and authoritative for that and apply admirably to the case in hand. Science has no right to deny to the occultists their claim to a more profound knowledge of the so-called forces, which, they say, are only the effects of causes generated by powers, substantial, 
yet supersensus, and beyond any kind of matter with which they, the scientists, have hitherto become acquainted. The most science can do is to assume the attitude of agnosticism and to maintain it. Then it can say, Your case is no more proven th than is ours, but we confess to knowing nothing in reality either about force or matter, or that which lies at the bottom of the so-called correlations of forces. Therefore time alone can prove who is right and who is wrong. Let us wait patiently, and meanwhile show curtsy instead of scoffing at each other. But to do this requires a boundless love of truth, and the surrender of that prestige, however false, of infallibility, which the men of science have acquired among the ignorant and flippant, though cultured, masses of the profane. To blend the two sciences, the archaic and the modern, requires first of all the abandonment of the actual materialistic lines. It necessitates a kind of religious mysticism, and even the study of old magic, which our academicians will never take up. The necessity is easily explained. Just as in old alchemical works the real meaning of the substances and elements meant are concealed under the most ridiculous metaphors, so are the physical, psychic and spiritual natures of the elements, say of fire, concealed in the Vedas, and especially in the Puranas, under allegories comprehensible only to the initiates. Had they no meaning, then indeed all those long legends and allegories about the sacredness of the three types of fire and the forty-nine original fires, personified by the sons of Daksha's daughters and the Rishis, their husbands, who, with the first son of Brahma and his three descendants, constitute the forty-nine fires, would be idiotic verbiage, and no more. But it is not so. Every fire has a distinct function and meaning in the worlds of the physical and the spiritual. It has, moreover, in its essential nature, a corresponding relation to one of the human psychic faculties. Besides its well-determined chemical and physical potencies, when coming in contact with the terrestrially differentiated matter, science has no speculations to offer upon fire per se. Occultism and ancient religious science have. This is shown even in the meagre and purposely veiled phraseology of the Puranyas, where, as in the Vayu Purana, many of the qualities of the personified fires are explained. Thus. Pavaka is electric, or Vajuta, fire, Pavamanya, the fire produced by friction, or Nimatya, and Suki is Sola, or Saura, fire, and all these three, being the sons of Abhimanyin, the Agni, fire, eldest son of Brahma, and of Swaha. Note on Suki is Sola, or Saura, fire, called the drinker of waters, Solar heat causing water to evaporate. End of note. Pavaka, moreover, is made parent to Kavyavahana, the fire of the Pitris, Suki to Havyavahana, the fire of the gods, and Pavamana to Saharaksha, the fire of the Asuras. Now all this shows that the writers of the Puranyas were perfectly conversant with the forces of science and their correlations. Moreover, with various qualities of the latter in their bearing upon those psychic and physical phenomena which receive no credit and are unknown to physical science now. Very naturally, when an Orientalist, especially one with materialistic tendencies, reads that these are only appellations of fire employed in the invocations and rituals, he calls this tantrika superstition and mystification, and he becomes more careful to avoid errors in spelling than to give attention to the secret meaning attached to the personifications, or to seek their explanation in the physical correlations of forces, so far as known. So little credit indeed is given to the ancient Aryans for knowledge, that even such glaring passages as in Book 1, Chapter 2, Vishnu Puranya, are left without any notice. Nevertheless, what can this sentence mean? Quote, the ether, air, light, water, and earth, servilely united with the properties of sound and other qualities, existed as distinguishable according to their properties, but possessing many and various energies, and being unconnected, they could not without combination create living beings, not having blended with each other. 
Having combined, they assumed through mutual association the character of one mass of entire unity and directed by spirit. Unquote, etc. This means, of course, that the writers were perfectly acquainted with correlation and were well posted about the origin of cosmos from the undiscreet principle of Yaktanun Grahena as applied to Parabraham and Mulaprakriti conjointly, either first cause or matter, unquote, as Wilson gives it. The old initiates knew of no miraculous creation but taught the evolution of atoms on our physical plane, and their first differentiation from Laia into protile, as Mr. Crookes has suggestively named matter, or primordial substance beyond the zero line. There were the place Mulaprakriti, the root principle, of the world stuff, and of all in the world. This can be easily demonstrated. Take, for instance, the newly published catechism of the Vishistadvaita Vedantins, an orthodox and exoteric system, yet fully enunciated and taught in the 11th century, its founder, Ramanu Yakarya, being born in A.D. 1017, at a time when European science still believed in the squareness and flatness of the earth, of Cosmas Indicoplestes of the 7th century. It teaches that, before evolution began, Prakriti, nature, was in a condition of laya, or absolute homogeneity, as matter exists in two conditions, the sukshma, or latent and undifferentiated, and the shula, or differentiated condition. Then it became anu, atomic. It teaches of sudasattva, a substance not subject to the qualities of matter from which it is quite different, and adds that out of that substance the bodies of the inhabitants of Vaikuntha Loka, the heaven of Vishnu, the gods, are formed, that every particle or atom of Prakriti contains Jiva, divine life, and is the Sarira, body, of that Jiva which it contains, while every Jiva is in its turn the Sarira of the Supreme Spirit, as Parabrahm pervades every jiva as well as every particle of matter. Dualistic and anthropomorphic as may be the philosophy of the Vishistadvaita, when compared with that of the Advaita, the non-dualists, it is yet supremely higher in logic and philosophy than the cosmogony accepted by either Christianity or its great opponent, modern science. The followers of one of the greatest minds that ever appeared on earth, the Advaita Vedantins, are called atheists because they regard all save Parabrahm, the secondless or absolute reality, as an illusion. Yet the wisest initiates came from their ranks, as also the greatest yogis. The Upanishads show that they most assuredly knew not only what is the causal substance in the effects of friction, and that their forefathers were acquainted with the conversion of heat into mechanical force, but that they were acquainted with the noumena of every spiritual as well as of every cosmic phenomenon. Truly the young Brahmin who graduates in the universities and colleges of India with the highest honours, who starts in life as an M.A. and an L.L.B., with the tail initial from Alpha to Omega after his name, and a contempt for his national gods proportioned to the honours received in his education in physical sciences, truly he has but to read in the light of the latter, and with an eye to the correlation of physical forces, certain passages in his Puranias, if he would learn how much more his ancestors knew than he will ever know, unless he becomes an occultist. Let him turn to the allegory of Pururavas and the celestial Gandharva, who furnished the former with a vessel full of heavenly fire. Note on Gandharva. The Gandharva of the Veda is the deity who knows and reveals the secrets of heaven and divine truths to mortals. Cosmically, the Gandharvas are the aggregate powers of the solar fire and constitute its forces. Physically, the intelligence residing in the Sushumana, solar ray, the highest of the seven rays, Mystically, the occult force in the Soma, the moon or lunar plant, 
and the drink made of it. Physically, the phenomenal and spiritually the noumenal causes of sound and the voice of nature. Hence they are called the 6,333 heavenly singers and musicians of Indra's Loka, who personify, even in number, the various and manifold sounds in nature, both above and below. In the latter allegories they are said to have mystic power over women, and to be fond of them. The esoteric meaning is plain. They are one of the forms, if not the prototypes, of Enoch's angels, the sons of God, who saw that the daughters of men were fair, in Genesis chapter 6, who married them and taught the daughters of the earth the secrets of heaven. End of note. The primeval mode of obtaining fire by friction has its scientific explanation in the Vedas and is pregnant with meaning for him who reads between the lines. The Tretanyi, sacred triad of fires, obtained by the attrition of sticks made of the wood of the Ashvata tree, the bow tree, of wisdom and knowledge, sticks as many finger-breaths long as there are syllables in the Gayatri, must have a secret meaning, or else the writers of the Vedas and Puranas were no sacred writers but mystificators. That it has such a meaning, the Hindu occultists are a proof, and they alone are able to enlighten science as to why and how the fire that was primarily one was made threefold, treta, in our present Manvantara, by the son of Ila, Vak, the primeval woman after the deluge. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3, Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Addenda, Chapter 7. An Attack on the Scientific Theory of Force by a Man of Science. The wise words of several English men of science have now to be quoted in our favour. Ostracized for principle's sake by the few, they are tacitly approved of by the many. That one of them preaches almost occult doctrines in some things identical with, and often amounting to a public recognition of our Fohat and his seven sons. The occult Gandharva, or the Vedas, will be recognized by every occultist, and even by some profane readers. If the latter open volume 5 of the Popular Science Review, pages 329 to 334, they will find in it an article on Sun Force and Earth Force, by Dr. B. W. Richardson, F.R.S., which reads as follows. Quote, At this moment, when the theory of mer motion as the origin of all varieties of force is again becoming the prevailing thought, it was almost heresy to reopen a debate, which for a period appears, by general consent, to be virtually closed. But I accept the risk, and shall state, therefore, what were the precise views of the immortal heretic, whose name I have whispered to the readers, Samuel Metcalf respecting sun force. Starting with the argument on which nearly all physicists are agreed, that there exist in nature two agencies, matter which is ponderable, visible and tangible, and something which is imponderable, invisible and appreciable only by its influence on matter, Metcalf maintains that the imponderable and active agency which he calls caloric, is not a mere form of motion, not a vibration amongst the particles of ponderable matter, but itself a material substance flowing from the sun through space, filling the void between the particles of solid bodies and conveying by sensation the property called heat. Noton, itself a material substance flowing from the sun through space, not only through space, but filling every point of our solar system, for it is the physical residue, so to say, of ether, its lining on our plane. 
ether having to serve other cosmic and terrestrial purposes besides being the agent for transmitting light. It is the astral fluid or light of the Kabbalists and the seven rays of Sun Vishnu. End of note. The nature of the caloric or sun force is contended for by him on the following grounds. 1. That it may be added to and abstracted from other bodies and measured with mathematical precision. 2. That it augments the volume of bodies, which are again reduced in size by its abstraction. 3. That it modifies the forms, properties and conditions of all other bodies. 4 that it passes by radiation through the most perfect vacuum that can be formed, in which it produces the same effects on the thermometer as in the atmosphere. Note on it passes by radiation through the most perfect vacuum. What need, then, of etheric waves for the transmission of light, heat, etc., if this substance can pass through vacuum? End of note. 5 that it exerts mechanical and chemical forces which nothing can restrain, as in volcanoes, the explosion of gunpowder, and other fulminating compounds. 6. That it operates in a sensible manner on the nervous system, producing intense pain, and when in excess, disorganization of the tissues. As against the vibratory theory, Metcalf further argues that if a caloric were a mere property or quality, it could not augment the volume of the bodies. For this purpose it must itself have a volume. It must occupy space, and it must therefore be a material agent. If caloric were only the effect of vibratory motion amongst the particles of ponderable matter, it could not radiate from hot bodies without a simultaneous transition of the vibrating particles. But the fact stands out that heat can radiate from material ponderable substance without loss of weight of such substance. With this view as to the material nature of caloric or sun force, with the impression firmly fixed in his mind that everything in nature is composed of two descriptions of matter, the one essentially active and ethereal, the other passive and motionless, Metcalf based the hypothesis that the sun force, or caloric, is a self-active principle. Note on two descriptions of matter. And how can it be otherwise? Gross ponderable matter is the body, the shell of matter of substance, the female passive principle, and this phohatic force is the second principle, prana, the male and the active. On our globe this substance is the second principle of the septenary element, earth. In the atmosphere it is that of air, which is the cosmic gross body. In the sun it becomes the solar body and that of the seven rays. In sidereal space it corresponds with another principle, and so on. The whole is a homogeneous unity alone, the part of all differentiations. End of note. For its own particles, he holds, it has repulsion. For the particles of all ponderable matter, it has affinity. It attracts the particles of ponderable matter with forces, which vary inversely as the square of the distance. It thus acts through ponderable matter. If universal space were filled with caloric sun force alone, without ponderable matter, caloric would also be inactive, and would constitute a boundless ocean of powerless or quiescent ether, because it would then have nothing on which to act, while ponderable matter, however inactive of itself, has certain properties by which it modifies and controls the actions of caloric both of which are governed by immutable laws that have their origin in the mutual relations and specific properties of each. And he lays down a law which he believes is absolute and which is thus expressed. By the attraction of caloric for ponderable matter, it unites and holds together all things. By its self-repulsive energy, it separates and expands all things. This, of course, is almost the occult explanation of cohesion. Dr. Richardson continues, quote, As I have said, 
the tendency of modern teaching is to rest upon the hypothesis that heat is motion or as it would perhaps be better stated a specific force or form of motion note or the reverberation and for sound repercussion on our plane of that which is a perpetual motion of that substance on higher planes our world and senses are victims of maya ceaselessly End of note. Quote, but this hypothesis popular as it is is not one that ought to be accepted to the exclusion of the simpler views of the material nature of sun force and of its influence in modifying the conditions of matter we do not yet know sufficient to be dogmatic unquote. note an honest admission that unquote. the hypothesis of metcalf respecting sun force and earth force is not only very simple but most fascinating here are two elements in the universe the one is ponderable matter the second element is the all-pervading ether solar fire it is without weight substance form or color it is matter infinitely divisible and its particles repel each other its rarity is such that we have no word except ether by which to express it it pervades and fills space but alone it too is quiescent dead Note. And so does prana, jiva, pervade the whole living body of man, but alone, without having an atom to act upon, it would be quiescent, dead, that is, it would be in laya, as Mr. Crookes has it, locked in protile. It is the action of forhat upon a compound, or even a simple body, that produces life. When a body dies, it passes into the same polarity as its male energy, and repels, therefore, the active agent which, losing hold of the whole, fastens on the parts or molecules, this action being called chemical. Vishnu, the preserver, transforms himself into Rudra Shiva, the destroyer, a correlation seemingly unknown to science. In a note. We bring together the two elements, the inert matter, the self-repulsive ether, within brackets question mark, and thereupon dead, within brackets question mark, ponderable matter is vivified. Unquote. Ponderable matter may be inert, but never dead. This is occult law. Note by HPB. Quote, Through the particles of the ponderable substance, the ether, note by HPB, ether's second principle, penetrates and so penetrating, it combines with the ponderable particles and holds them in mass, holds them together in bond of union. They are dissolved in the ether. Unquote. Quote, this distribution of solid ponderable matter through ether extends, according to the theory before us, to everything that exists at this moment. The ether is all pervading. The human body itself is charged with the ether. Say astral light. Note by H. P. B. Its minute particles are held together by it. The plant is in the same condition. The most solid earth, rock, adamant, crystal, metal, all are the same. But there are differences in the capacities of different kinds of ponderable matter to receive sun force, and upon this depends the various changing conditions of matter. The solid, the liquid, the gaseous condition. Solid bodies have attracted caloric in excess over fluid bodies, and hence their firm cohesion. When a portion of molten zinc is poured upon a plate of solid zinc, the molten zinc becomes as solid because there is a rush of caloric from the liquid to the solid, and in the equalization of the particles previously loose or liquid are more closely brought together. Metcalf himself dwelling on the above-named phenomena and accounting for them by the unity of principle of action which has already been explained sums up his argument in very clear terms in a comment on the densities of various bodies hardness or softness he says solidity and liquidity are not essential conditions of bodies but depend on the relative proportions of ethereal and ponderable matter of which they are composed the most elastic gas may be reduced to the liquid form by the abstraction of caloric, and again converted into a firm solid. 
the particles of which would cling together with a force proportional to their augmented affinity for caloric. On the other hand, by adding a sufficient quantity of the same principle to the densest metals, their attraction for it is diminished when they are expanded into the gaseous state, and their cohesion is destroyed." Unquote. Having thus quoted at length the heterodox views of the great quote, heretic, unquote, views that need only a little alteration of terms here and there, the same eminent scientist, an original and liberal thinker undeniably, proceeds to sum up those views and continues, quote, I shall not dwell at great length on this unity of sun force on earth which this theory implies, but I may add that out of it, or out of the hypothesis of mere motion as force, and of virtue without substance, we may gather, as the nearest possible approach to the truth on this, the most complex and profound of all subjects, the following inferences. A. Space. Interstellary. Interplanetary. Intermaterial. Interorganic is not a vacuum, but is filled with a subtle fluid or gas, which, for want of a better term, we may still call, as the ancients did, aether, solar fire, aether. Note on which for want on a better term. Verily, unless the occult terms of the Kabbalists are adopted. End of note. This fluid, unchangeable in composition, indestructible, invisible, pervades everything and all. Note by H.P.B. Ponderable Matter Notes Note on unchangeable. Unchangeable only during manventaric periods, after which it merges once more into Mula Prakriti, invisible for ever in its own essence, but seen in its reflected coruscations, called the astral light by the modern Kabbalists. Yet conscience and grand beings clothed in that same essence move in it. End of note. Note on HPB's note on ponderable matter. One has to add ponderable to distinguish it from that ether which is matter still, though a substratum. End of note. The pebble in the running brook the tree overhanging, the man looking on, is charged with the ether in various degree, the pebble less than a tree, the tree less than a man. All in the planet is in like manner so charged. A world is built up in ethereal fluid, and moving through a sea of it. B. The aether, whatever its nature is, is from the sun and from the suns. The suns are the generators of it, the storehouses of it, the diffusers of it. Notes on B. The occult sciences reverse the statement and say that it is the sun and all the suns that are from it which emanate at the manventaric dawn from the central sun. Here we decidedly beg to differ with the learned gentleman. Let us remember that this aether, whether akasha is meant by the term or its lower principle ether, is septenary. Akasha is Aditi in the allegory, and the mother of Martanda, the sun, the Deva Matri, mother of the gods. In the solar system the sun is her buddhi, and Vahan, the vehicle, hence the sixth principle. In cosmos, all the suns are the Kamarupa of Akasha, and so is ours. It is only when regarded as an individual entity in his own kingdom that Surya, the sun, is the seventh principle of the great body of matter. End of note. C. Without the ether, there could be no motion. Without it, particles of ponderable matter could not glide over each other. Without it, there could be no impulse to excite those particles into action. D. Ether determines the constitution of bodies. Were there no ether, there could be no change of constitution in substance. 
Water, for instance, could only exist as a substance, compact and insoluble beyond any conception we could form of it. It could never even be ice, never flint, never vapor, except for ether. E. Ether connects sun with planet, planet with planet, man with planet, man with man. Without ether there could be no communication in the universe, no light, no heat, no phenomenon of motion, no phenomenon of motion, unquote. Thus we find that ether and elastic atoms are, in their legit mechanical conception of the universe, the spirit and soul of cosmos, and that the theory, put it any way and under whatever disguise, always leaves a more widely opened issue for men of science to speculate beyond the line drawn by modern materialism, or call it agnosticism rather, to be more correct, than the majority avails itself of. Now to materialism. Brutable frank materialism is more honest than Janus faced agnosticism in our days. Monism is a pectionary for modern philosophy, turning a farcical face to psychology and idealism, and its natural face of a Roman augur, swelling his cheek with his tongue to materialism. The monists are worse than the materialists, because while looking at the universe and psychospiritual man from the same negative standpoint, the latter put their case far less plausibly than skeptics of Mr. Tyndall's, or even Mr. Huxley's stamp. Herbert Spencer, Bain, and Lewis are more dangerous to universal truths than Buchner. End of note. Atoms, ether, or both, modern speculation cannot get out of the circle of ancient thought, and the latter was soaked through with archaic occultism undulatory or corpuscular theory, it is all one. It is speculation from the aspect of phenomena, not from the knowledge of the essential nature of the cause and causes. When modern science has explained to its audience the late achievements of Bunsen and Kirchhoff, and shown the seven colors, the primary of a ray which is decomposed in a fixed order on a screen, and describe the respective lengths of luminous waves, what has it proved? It has justified its reputation for exactness in mathematical achievement by measuring even the length of a luminous wave, varying from about 760 millionths of a millimeter at the red end of the spectrum to about 393 millionths of a millimeter at the violet end. But when the exactness of the calculation with regard to the effect on the light wave is thus vindicated, science is forced to admit that the force, which is the supposed cause, is believed to produce inconceivably minute undulations in some medium, generally regarded as identical with the ethereal medium, and that medium itself is still only a hypothetical agent. Note. See Geology by Professor A. Winchell. End of note. Auguste Comte's pessimism with respect to the impossibility of knowing some day the chemical composition of the sun has not been belied thirty years later by Kirchhoff as claimed. The spectroscope has helped us to see that the elements with which the modern chemist is familiar must in all probability be present in the sun's outward robes, not in the sun itself. And, taking these robes, the solar cosmic veil, for the sun itself, the physicists have declared its luminosity to be due to combustion and flame, and have mistaken the vital principle of that luminary for a purely material thing, and called it chromosphere. Note. See five years of theosophy. Articles, do the adepts deny the nebular theory, and is the sun merely a cooling mass, for the true cult teaching. End of note. We have hypotheses and theories only so far, not law by any means. Next chapter is chapter 8, Life, Force or Gravity. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, 
Part 3. Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Addenda Chapter 8. Life, Force, or Gravity. The imponderable fluids have had their day. Mechanical forces are less talked about. Science has put on a new face for this last quarter of a century. But gravitation has remained, owing its life to new combinations after the old ones had nearly killed it. It may answer scientific hypotheses very well, but the question is whether it answers as well to truth and represents a fact in nature. Attraction by itself is not sufficient to explain merely planetary motion. How can it presume to explain the rotary motion in the infinitudes of space? Attraction alone will never fill all the gaps unless a special impulse is admitted for every sidereal body, and the rotation of every planet with its satellites is shown to be due to some one cause combined with attraction. And even then, says an astronomer, Philosophie Naturelle, Article 142, science would have to name that cause. Occultism has named it for ages, and so have all the ancient philosophers, but then all such beliefs are now proclaimed exploded superstitions. The extracosmic God has killed every possibility of belief in intracosmic intelligent forces, yet who or what is the original pusher in that motion? Quote, when we have learned the cause, unique et spécial, that pushes, we will be ready to combine it with the one which attracts, says Francoeur, unquote, says Francoeur in Astronomie, page 342. And again, attraction between the celestial bodies is only repulsion. It is the sun that drives them incessantly onward, for otherwise their motion would stop, unquote. If ever this theory of the sun force being the primal cause of all life on earth and motion in heaven is accepted, and if that other far bolder one of Herschel, about certain organisms in the sun, is accepted even as a provincial hypothesis, then will our teachings be vindicated, and esoteric allegory shown to have anticipated modern science by millions of years, probably, for these are the archaic teachings. Martanda the sun watches and threatens without abandoning the central position to which his mother, Aditi, relegated him, his seven brothers, the planets. He pursues them, turning slowly around himself, and follows them from afar, moving in the same direction as they do on the path that encircles their houses, or the orbit. See comment to stanza 4, book 1. It is the sun fluids or emanations that impart all motion and awaken all into life in the solar system. It is attraction and repulsion, but not as understood by modern physics and according to the law of gravity, but in harmony with the laws of manventaric motion designed from the earlier Sandhya, the dawn of the rebuilding and higher reformation of the system. These laws are immutable, but the motion of all the bodies which motion is diverse and alters with every minor culpa, is regulated by the movers, the intelligences within the cosmic soul. Are we so very wrong in believing all this? Well, here is a modern and great man of science who, speaking of vital electricity, uses language far more akin to occultism than to modern materialistic thought. We refer the sceptical reader to an article on The Source of Heat in the Sun by Robert Hunt, F.R.S., in Popular Science Review, Volume 4, page 148, who, speaking of the luminous envelope of the Sun and its, quote, peculiar curdy appearance, unquote, says, quote, Arago proposed that this envelope should be called the photosphere, a name now generally adopted. By the elder Herschel, the surface of this photosphere was compared to Mother of Pearl. It resembles the ocean on tranquil summer day, when its surface is slightly crisped by a gentle breeze. Mr. Nasmith has discovered a more remarkable condition than any that had previously been suspected. 
objects which are peculiarly lens-shaped, like willow leaves, different in size, not arranged in any order, crossing each other in all directions, with an irregular motion among themselves. They are seen approaching to and receding from each other, and sometimes assuming new angular positions, so that the appearance has been compared to a dense shoal of fish, which, indeed, they resemble in shape. The size of these objects gives a grand idea of the gigantic scale upon which the physical, within brackets, question mark, operations are carried out in the sun. They cannot be less than a thousand miles in length, and from two to three hundred miles in breadth. The most probable conjecture which has been offered respecting those leaf or lens-like objects is that the photosphere is an immense ocean of gaseous matter, uh, what kind of matter, in a state of intense apparent incandescence, and that they are perspective projections of the sheets of flame." Unquote. Note on that the photosphere is an immense ocean of gaseous matter, and the central mass too, as will be found, or rather the centre of the reflection. End of note. Solar, quote, flames, unquote, seen through telescopes are reflections, says occultism. But see what occultists have to say to this in Book One. Whatever they may be, those sheets of flame, it is evident they are the immediate sources of solar heat and light. Here we have a surrounding envelope of photogenic matter which pendulates with mighty energies, and by communicating its motion to the ethereal medium in stellar space, produces heat and light in far distant worlds. We have said that those forms have been compared to certain organisms, and Herschel says, though it would be too daring to speak of such organizations as, as partaking of life, within brackets, why not? Yet we do not know that vital action is competent to develop heat, light, and electricity. Can it be that there is truth in this fine thought? May the pulsing of vital matter in the central sun of our system be the source of all that life which crowds the earth, and without doubt overspreads the other planets to which the sun is the mighty minister." Unquote. Note on the speculation of Herschel. See Five Years of Theosophy on page 258, an answer to the speculation of Herschel's. End of note. Occultum answers these queries in the affirmative, and science will find this to be the case one day. Again, on page 156, Mr. Hunt writes, quote, But regarding life, vital force, as a power far more exalted than either light, heat, or electricity, and indeed capable of exerting a controlling power of them all, within brackets, this is absolutely occult. We are certainly disposed to view with satisfaction that speculation which supposes the photosphere to be the primary seat of vital power, and to regard with a poetic pleasure that hypothesis which refers the solar energies to life. Unquote. Thus we have an important scientific corroboration for one of our fundamental dogmas, namely that a. The sun is the storehouse of vital force, which is the noumenon of electricity, and b that it is from its mysterious never-to-be-fathomed depths that issue those life-currents which thrill through space, as through the organisms of every living thing on earth. For see what another eminent physician says, who calls this our life-fluid, nervous ether. Change a few sentences in the article extracts from which now follow, and you have another quasi-occult treatise on life-force. This one's it is again Dr. B. W. Richardson, F.R.S., who gives his views in the Popular Science Review, Volume 10, page 380 to 383, on nervous ether, as he has on sun force and earth force. Quote, the idea attempted to be conveyed by the theory is that between the molecules of the matter, solid or fluid, or which the nervous organisms, and indeed or which all the organic parts of the body are composed, there exists a refined subtle medium, vaporous or gases, which holds the molecules in a condition for motion upon each other, 
and for arrangement and rearrangement of form, a medium by and through which all motion is conveyed by and through which the one organ or part of the body is held in communion with the other parts, by which and through which the outer living world communicates with the living man, a medium which, being present, enables the phenomena of life to be demonstrated, and which, being universally absent, leaves the body actually dead, unquote. And the whole solar system falls into pralaya, the author might have added. But let us read further. Quote, I use the word ether in its general sense as meaning a very light, vaporous or gaseous matter. I use it in short as the astronomer uses it when he speaks of the ether of space, by which he means a subtle but material medium. When I speak of a nervous ether, I do not convey that the ether is existent in nervous structure only. I believe truly that it is a special part of the nervous organization, but as nerves pass into all structures that have capacities for movement and sensibilities, so the nervous ether passes into all such parts. And as the nervous ether is, according to my view, a direct product from blood, so we may look upon it as a part of the atmosphere of the blood. The evidence in favour of the existence of an elastic medium pervading the nervous matter and capable of being influenced by simple pressure is all convincing. In nervous structure there is, unquestionably, a true nervous fluid as our predecessors taught. Note. Paracelsus, for one, who called it liqueur vitae, and Archaeus. End of note. The precise chemical within brackets question mark. Composition of this fluid is not yet well known. The physical characters of it have been little studied. Note. Rather than chemical, alchemical composition. End of note. Whether it moves in currents, we do not know. Whether it circulates, we do not know. Whether it is formed in the centers and passes from them to the nerves, or that it's formed everywhere where blood enters nerve, we do not know. The exact uses of the fluid we do not consequently know. It occurs to my mind, however, that the veritable fluid of nervous matter is not of itself sufficient to act as a subtle medium that connects the outer with the inner universe of man and animal. I think, and this is the modification I suggest to the older theory, there must be another form of matter present during life, a matter which exists in the condition of vapour or gas, which pervades the whole nervous organism, surrounds us as an enveloping atmosphere, each molecule of nervous structure, and is the medium of all motion communicated to and from the nervous centres. Note. This vital force radiates around man like a luminous sphere, says Paracelsus in Paragranum. End of note. When it is once fairly presented to the mind that during life there is in the animal body a finely diffused form of matter, a vapor filling every part, and even stored in some parts, a matter constantly renewed by the vital chemistry, a matter as easily disposed of as the breath, after it has served its purpose, a new flood of light breaks on the intelligence. Unquote. A new flood of light is certainly thrown on the wisdom of ancient and medieval occultism and its votaries, for Paracelsus wrote the same thing more than three hundred years ago, namely in the sixteenth century, as follows, quote, the whole of the microcosm is potentially contained in the liqueur vitae, a nerve fluid, in which is contained the nature, quality, character, and essence of beings. From De Generatione Hominis. The archaeus of liqueur vitae is an essence that is equally distributed in all parts of the human body. The spiritus vitae takes its origin from the spiritus mundi. Being an emanation of the latter, it contains the elements of all cosmic influences, and is therefore the cause by which the action of the stars, cosmic forces, upon the invisible body of man, his vital linga sharira, may be explained, unquote. From De Viribus Membrorum, 
Sea Life of Paracelsus by Franz Hartmann, MD, FTS. Had Dr. Richardson studied all the secret works of Paracelsus, he would not have been obliged to confess so often, we do not know, it is not known to us, etc., etc., nor would he have ever pronounced that following sentence recanting the best portions of his independent rediscovery in which he says, on page 384, quote, It may be urged that in this line of thought is included no more than the theory of the existence of the ether, supposed to pervade space. It may be said that this universal ether pervades all the organism of the animal body as from without, and as part of every organization. This view would be pantheism physically discovered if it were true, within brackets double exclamation mark. It fails to be true because it would destroy the individuality of every individual sense. Unquote. We fail to see it, and we know it is not so. Pantheism may be physically rediscovered. It was known, seen, and felt by the whole of antiquity. Pantheism manifests itself in the vast expanse of the starry heavens, in the breathing of the seas and oceans, and the quiver of life of the smallest blade of grass. Philosophy rejects one finite and imperfect god in the universe, as the anthropomorphic deity of the monotheist is represented by his followers. It repudiates in its name of philotheosophia, the grotesque idea that infinite absolute deity should, or rather could, have any, whether direct or indirect, relation to finite, elusive evolutions of matter, and therefore cannot imagine a universe outside that deity, or the latter absent from the smallest speck of animate or inanimate substance. Note. This does not mean that every bush, tree, or stone is God, or a God, but only that every speck of the manifested material of cosmos belongs to and is the substance of God, however it may have fallen in its cyclic gyration through the eternities of the ever-becoming, and also that every such speck individually and cosmos collectively is an aspect and a reminder of that universal one soul, which philosophy refuses to call God, thus limiting the eternal and ever-present root and essence. End of note. Why either the ether or space or nervous ether should destroy the individuality of every sense seems incomprehensible for one acquainted with the real nature of that nervous ether under its Sanskrit, or rather esoteric and Kabbalistic name. Dr. Richardson agrees that, quote, if we did not individually produce the medium of communication between ourselves and the outer world, if it were produced from without and adapted to one kind of vibration alone, there were fewer sensors required than we possess. For, taking two illustrations only, ether of light is not adapted for sound, and yet we hear as well as see, while air, the medium of motion of sound, is not the medium of light, and yet we see and hear." Unquote. Now this is not so. The opinion that pantheism fails to be true because it would destroy the individuality of every individual sense shows that all the conclusions of the learned doctor are based on the modern physical theories, though he would fain reform them. But he will find it impossible to do this unless he allows the existence of spiritual senses to replace the gradual atrophy of the physical. We see and hear in accordance, of course in Dr. Richardson's mind, with the explanations of the phenomena of sight and hearing by that same materialistic science which postulates that we cannot see and hear otherwise. The occultists and the mystics know better. The Vedic Aryans were as familiar with the mysteries of sound and color as our physiologists on a physical plane, but they had mastered the secrets of both on planes inaccessible to the materialist. They knew of a double set of senses, spiritual and material. In a man who is deprived of one or more senses, the remaining become the more developed. For example, the blind man will recover his sight through the senses of touch, of hearing, etc., and he who is deaf will be able to hear through sight by seeing audibly 
the words uttered by the lips and mouth of the speaker. But these are cases that belong to the world of matter still. The spiritual senses, those that act on a higher plane of consciousness, are rejected a priori by physiology because the latter is ignorant of the sacred science. It limits the action of ether to vibrations, and dividing it from air, though air is simply differentiated and compound ether, makes it assume functions to fit in with the special theories of the physiologist. But there is a more real science in the teachings of the Upanishads, when these are correctly understood, than the Orientalists, who do not understand them at all, are ready to admit. Mental as well as physical correlations of the seven senses, seven on the physical and seven on the mental planes, are clearly explained and defined in the Vedas, and especially in the Upanishad called Agnugita, the indestructible and the destructible, such is the double manifestation of the self. Of these, the indestructible is the existent, the true essence or nature of self, the underlying principles. The manifestation as an individual or entity is called the destructible. Thus speaks the ascetic in Agnugita. And also, everyone who is twice born, initiated, knows such is the teaching of the ancients. Space is the first entity. Now space, akasha, or the numen of ether, has one quality, and that is sound only. And the qualities of sound are shadga, Rishabha, Gandhara, Madhyama, Pankama, and beyond these five, Nishada and Daivata, the Hindu garment. These seven notes of the scale are the principles of sound. See chapter 36 of Anugita. The qualities of every element, as of every sense, are septenary, and to judge and dogmatize on them from their manifestation Likewise sevenfold in itself, on the material or objective plane above is quite arbitrary, for it is only by the self emancipating itself from these seven causes of illusion that one acquires the knowledge, secret wisdom, of the qualities of objects of sense on their dual plane of manifestation, the visible and the invisible. Thus it is said, state this wonderful mystery, hear the assignment of course as exhaustively, the nose and the tongue and the eye and the skin and the ear as the fifth organ of sense, mind and understanding. These seven senses should be understood to be the causes of, that is the knowledge of their qualities. Note the division of the physical senses into five comes to us from great antiquity, but while adopting the number no modern philosopher has asked himself how these senses could exist, that is, be perceived and used in a self-conscious way, unless there was the sixth sense, mental perception, to register and record them, and, this for the metaphysicians and occultists, the seventh, to preserve the spiritual fruition and remembrance thereof, as in a book of life which belongs to karma. The ancients divided the senses into five, simply because their teachers, the initiates, stopped at the hearing, as being that sense which developed in the physical plane, a got dwarfed rather, limited to this plane, only at the beginning of the fifth race. The fourth race already had begun to lose the spiritual condition so preeminently developed in the third race. End of note. Smell and taste and colour sound and touch as the fifth the object of the mental operation and the object of the understanding the higher spiritual sense of perception these seven are causes of action he who smells he who eats he who sees he who speaks and he who hears as the fifth he who thinks and he who understands these seven should be regarded as the causes of the agents the modern commentators failing to comprehend the subtle meaning of the ancient scholiasts take this sentence causes of the agents to mean that the powers of smelling etc when attributed to the self make him appear as an agent as an active principle within brackets exclamation mark which is entirely fanciful 
these seven are understood to be the causes of the agents because the objects are causes as their enjoyment causes an impression it means esoterically that they these seven senses are caused by the agents which are the deities for what does or can the sentence which follows this one mean thus it is said these seven senses are the causes of emancipation that is when these causes are made ineffectual and among the learned the wise initiates who understand the qualities which are in the possession in the nature rather of the deities each in its place means simply that the learned understand the nature of the noumenoi of the various phenomena and that qualities in this instance mean the qualities of the high planetary or elementary gods or intelligences which rule the elements and their products and not at all their senses as the modern commentator thinks for the learned do not suppose their senses to have aught to do with them any more than with their self read pages two seven eight and two seven nine of the eighth volume of the sacred books of the east anugita end of note these the agents being possessed of qualities sattva rajas tamas enjoy their own qualities agreeable and disagreeable from anujita then one reads in the bhagavad gita chapter seven the deity or krishna saying only some know me truly earth water fire air space or akasha aether mind understanding and egoism or the perception of all the former on the elusive plane this is a lower form of my nature know that there is another form of my nature and higher than this which is animate o you mighty arms and by which this universe is upheld all this is woven upon me like numbers of pearls upon a thread mundakopanishad page two nine eight i am the taste in the water o son of kunti i am the light of the sun and moon i am sound that is the occult essence which underlies all these and the other qualities of the various things mentioned in space the fragrant smell in the earth refulgence in the fire etc etc truly then one should study occult philosophy before one begins to verify and seek the mysteries of nature on its surface alone as he alone who knows the truth about the qualities of nature who understands the creation of all entities is emancipated from error says the preceptor accurately understanding the great tree of which the unperceived occult nature the root of all is the sprout from the seed parabrahman which consists of the understanding mahat or the universal intelligent soul as its trunk the branches of which are the great egoism in the holes of which are the sprouts namely the senses of which the great occult or invisible elements are the flower bunches the gross elements the gross objective matter the smaller boughs which are always possessed of leaves always possessed of flowers which is eternal and the seed of which is the brahman the deity and cutting it with that excellent sword knowledge secret wisdom one attains immortality and casts off birth and death notes note in the great egoism ahamkara i suppose that egoship or ahamship which leads to every error end of note and note the elements are the five tanmatras of earth water fire air and ether the producers of the grosser elements End of note. this is the tree of life the ashvakta tree only after the cutting of which the slave of life and death man can be emancipated but the men of science know naught nor will they hear of the sword of knowledge used by the adepts and ascetics hence the one-sided remarks of the most liberal among them based on and flowering from undue importance given to the arbitrary divisions and classification of physical science occultism heeds them very little and nature still less the whole range of physical phenomena proceed from the primary of ether 
akasha. As dual-natured akasha proceeds from undifferentiated chaos, so-called, the latter being the primary aspect of mula prakriti, the root matter and the first abstract idea one can form of parabrahma. Modern science may divide its hypothetically conceived ether in as many ways as it likes. The real ether of space will remain as it is throughout. It has its seven principles, as all the rest of nature has, and where there was no ether, there would be no sound, as it is the vibrating soundboard in nature, in all of its seven differentiations. This is the first mystery the initiates of old have learned. Our present normal physical senses were, from our present point of view, abnormal in those days of slow and progressive downward evolution and fall into matter. And there was a day when all that which in our modern times is regarded as phenomena, so puzzling to the psychologists now compelled to believe in them, such as thought, transference, clairvoyance, clairaudience, etc., in short, all that which is called now, quote, wonderful and abnormal, unquote, all that, and much more, belong to the senses and faculties common to all humanity. All that, and much more, belonged to the senses and faculties common to all humanity. We are, however, cycling back and cycling forward, that is, having lost in spirituality that which we acquired in physical development until almost the end of the fourth race. We, mankind, are as gradually and imperceptibly losing now in the physical all that we regain once more in the spiritual re-evolution. This process must go on until the period which will bring the sixth root rays on a parallel line with the spirituality of the second, long extinct, mankind. But this will hardly be understood at present. We must return to Dr. Richardson's hopeful thought, hopeful though somewhat incorrect hypothesis about nervous ether. Under the misleading translation of the word as space, akasha, it has just been shown in the ancient Hindu system as the firstborn of the one, having but one quality, sound, which is sepsinary. In esoteric language, this one is the father deity, and sound is synonymous with logos, verben, or the son, s-o-n, that is. Whether consciously or otherwise, it must be the latter, and Dr. Richardson, while preaching an occult doctrine, chooses the lowest form of the septenary nature of that sound, and speculates upon it, adding, The theory I offer is that the nervous ether is an animal product. In different classes of animals it may differ in physical quality so as to be adapted to the special wants of the animal, but essentially it plays one part in all animals and is produced in all in the same way." Unquote. Herein lies the nucleus of error leading to all the resultant mistaken views. This nervous ether is the lowest principle of the primordial essence which is life. It is animal vitality diffused in all nature and acting according to the conditions it finds for its activity. It is not an animal product. But the living animal, the living flower or plant, are its products. The animal tissues only absorb it, according to their more or less morbid or healthy state, as do physical materials and structures, in their primogenial state, nota bene, and henceforward, from the moment of the birth of the entity, are regulated, strengthened, and fed by it. It descends in a larger supply to vegetation in the Sushum Nasanre, which lights and feeds the moon, and it is through her beams that it pours its light upon and penetrates man and animal, more during their sleep and rest than when they are in full activity. Therefore, Dr. Richardson errs again in stating that, quote, the nervous ether is not, according to my idea of it, in itself active, nor an excitant of animal motion in the sense of a force, but it is essential as applying the conditions by which the motion is rendered possible, unquote. It is just the reverse. And, quote, it is the conductor of all vibrations of heat, of light, of sound, of electrical action, of mechanical friction. Note, the conductor in the sense of a party, 
a material or physical basis, but as the second principle of the universal soul and vital force in nature, it is intelligently guided by the fifth principle thereof. End of note. It holds the nervous system throughout in perfect tension during states of life. True. By exercise it is deposed of, or rather generated. And when demand for it is greater than the supply, its deficiency is indicated by nervous collapse or exhaustion. Note. And too great an exurbance of it in the nervous system leads as often to disease and death. If it were the animal system which generated it, such would not be the case, surely. Hence the latter emergency shows its independence of the system and connection with the sun force, as Metcalf and Professor Hunt explain it. End of note. It accumulates in the nervous centers during sleep, bringing them, if I may so speak, to their due tone, and therewith raising the muscles to awakening and renewed life, unquote. Just so, this is quite correct and as comprehensible. Therefore, the body, fully renewed by it, presents capacity for motion, fullness of form, life. The body bereft of it presents inertia, the configuration of shrunken death, the evidence of having lost something physical that was in it when it lived. Modern science denies the existence of a vital principle. This extract is a clear proof of its grand mistake. But this physical something, as we call a life fluid, the liqueur vitae of Paracelsus, has not deserted the body, as Dr. Richardson thinks. It has only changed its state from activity to passivity, and become latent owing to the too morbid state of the tissues, on which it has no more hold. Once the rigor mortis absolute, the liqueur vitae will reawaken into action and begin its work on the atoms chemically. Brahma Vishnu, the creator and the preserver of life, will have transformed himself into Shiva, the destroyer. Lastly, he writes on page 387, The nervous ether may be poisoned. It may, I mean, have diffused through it. A simple gas is diffusion. Are the gases or vapors derived from without? It may derive from within products of substances swallowed and ingested, or gases of decomposition produced during disease in the body itself, unquote. And the learned gentleman might have added on the same occult principle that the nervous ether or one person can be poisoned by that nervous ether of another person or his auric emanations. But see what Paracelsus said of nervous ether, quote, the archaeus is of a magnetic nature, and attracts or repels other sympathetic or antipathetic forces belonging to the same plane. The less power of resistance for astral influences a person possesses, the more he will be subject to such influences. The vital force is not enclosed in man, but radiates within and around him like a luminous sphere, aura, and it may be made to act at a distance. It may poison the essence of life, blood and cause diseases, or it may purify it after it has been made impure and restore the health. From Paragranum, Life of Paracelsus by Dr. F. Hartman. That the two, Orcaeus and Nervous Ether, are identical is shown by the English scientist who says that the tension of it generally may be too high or too low, that it may be so owing to local changes in the nervous matter it invests. Under sharp excitation it may vibrate as if in a storm and plunge every muscle under cerebral spinal control into uncontrolled motion, unconscious convulsions. This is called nervous excitation, but no one except occultists knows the reason of such nervous perturbation or explains the primary causes of it. The principle of life may kill when too exuberant, as also when there is too little of it. But this principle on the manifested, or our plane, is but the effect and the result of the intelligent action of the host's collectively principle, the manifesting life and light. It is itself subordinate to and emanates from the ever-invisible, eternal and absolute one life in a descending and reascending scale of hierarchic degrees, a true septenary ladder with the sound, or the logos, at the upper end, and the vidyadharas, the inferior pities. At the lower. Note on Viryadharas. 
In a recent work on the symbolism in Buddhism and Christianity, in Buddhism and Roman Catholicism rather, many later rituals and dogmas in Northern Buddhism, in its popular exoteric form, being identical with those of the Latin Church, some curious facts are to be found. The author of this volume, with more pretensions than erudition, has indiscriminately crammed into his work ancient and modern Buddhist teachings, and sorely confused Lamaism with Buddhism. On page 404 of this volume called Buddhism in Christendom, or Jesus the Essene, our pseudo-orientalist devotes himself to criticizing the seven principles of the esoteric Buddhists, and attempts to ridicule them. On page 405, the closing page, he speaks enthusiastically of the Vidyadharas. The seven great legions of dead men made wise. Now these Vidyadharas, whom some Orientalists call demigods, are in fact exoterically a kind of Siddhas. Affluent in devotion and esoterically, they are identical with the seven classes of Petris, one class of which endow man in the third race with self-consciousness by incarnating in the human shells. The hymn to the sun at the end of his queer volume of mosaic, which endows Buddhism with a personal god, with in brackets double exclamation mark, is an unfortunate thrust at the very proofs so elaborately collected by the unlucky author. Theosophists are fully aware that Mr. Rice Davids has expressed his opinion on their beliefs likewise. He said that the theories propounded by the author of Esoteric Buddhism were not Buddhism. The remark is the result of A, an unfortunate mistake of writing Buddhism instead of Buddhism, or Buddhism, that is, of connecting the system with Gautama's religion, instead of with the secret wisdom taught by Krishna, Sankarasharya, and by many others, as much as by Buddha and b of the impossibility of mr rice davis knowing anything of true esoteric teachings but he is at all events the greatest pali and buddhist scholar of the day and whatever he may say is entitled to respectful hearing but when one who knows no more of exoteric buddhism on scientific and materialistic lines than he knows of esoteric philosophy deflames those whom he honours with his spite and assumes with the theosophists the airs of a profound scholar one can only smile and uh, heartily laugh at him. End of note. Of course, the occultists are fully aware of the fact that the vitalist fallacy, so derided by Focht and Huxley, is nevertheless still countenanced in very high scientific quarters, and therefore they are happy to feel that they do not stand alone. Uh, thus, Professor de Quatrefage writes, quote, It is very true we do not know what life is but no more do we know what the force is that set the stars in motion living beings are heavy and therefore subject to gravitation they are the seat of numerous and various physiochemical phenomena which are indispensable to their existence and which must be referred to the action of etherodynamy electricity heat etc but these phenomena are here manifested under the influence of another force Life is not antagonistic to the inanimate forces, but it governs and rules the action by its laws. Unquote. A note. See the human species. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky. A facsimile of the original edition of 1888. Printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1. Cosmogenesis. Book 1. Part 3. Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book One Addenda Chapter Nine The Solar Theory A Short Analysis of the Compound and Single Elements of Science as Against the Occult Teachings How Far Scientific Is This Theory as Generally Accepted? In his reply to Dr. Gall's attack on the theory of vitality, connected inseparably with the elements of the ancients in the occult philosophy, Professor Bale, the great physiologist, has a few words as suggestive as they are beautiful. Quote, there is a mystery in life, a, a mystery which has never been fathomed, and which appears greater the more deep the phenomena of life are studied and contemplated. In living centers, far more central than the centers seen by the highest magnifying powers, in centers of living matter, where the eye cannot penetrate, but towards which the understanding may tend, 
precede changes of the nature of which the most advanced physicists and chemists fail to afford us the conception nor is there the slightest reason to think that the nature of these changes will ever be ascertained by physical investigation, inasmuch as they are certainly of an order or nature totally distinct from that to which any other phenomena known to us can be relegated. Unquote. This, quote, mystery, unquote, or the origin of the life essence occultism locates in the same centre as the nucleus of prima materia, for they are one, of our solar system. Quote, the sun is the heart of the solar world system, and its brain is hidden behind the visible sun. From thence, sensation is radiated into every nerve center of the great body, and the waves of the life essence flow into each artery and vein. The planets are its limbs and pulses. Unquote. It was stated elsewhere in the Theosophist, that occult philosophy denies that the sun is a globe in combustion, but defines it simply as a world, a glowing sphere, the real sun being hidden behind, and the visible being only its reflection, its shell. The Nasmith willow leaves, mistaken by Sir J. Herschel for solar inhabitants, are the reservoirs of solar vital energy, the vital electricity that feeds the whole system, the sun in abscondito, being first the storehouse of our little cosmos, self-generating its vital fluid, and ever receiving as much as it gives out, and the visible sun only a window cut into the real solar palace and presence, which reflects, however, faithfully the interior work. Thus, there is a regular circulation of the vital fluid throughout our system, on which the sun is the heart, the same as the circulation of the blood in the human body during the mammenteric solar period, or life, the sun contracting as rhythmically at every return of it as the human heart does. Only, instead of performing the round in a second or so, it takes the solar blood ten of its years, and a whole year to pass through its auricles and ventricles, before it washes the lungs, and uh, passes thence to the great veins and arteries of the system. This science will not deny, since astronomy knows of the fixed cycle of eleven years when the number of solar spots increases, which is due to the contraction of the solar heart. Note. Not only does it not deny the occurrence, though attributing it to a wrong cause, as always, each theory contradicting every other, see the theories of Sicchi, of Fay, and of Young, the spots depending on the superficial accumulation of vapours cooler than the photosphere within brackets question mark etc etc but we have men of science who astrologize upon the spots professor jevons attributes all the great periodical commercial crises to the influence of the sun spots every eleventh cyclic year see his investigations into currency and finance this is worthy of praise and encouragement, surely. End of note. The universe, our world in uh, this case, breathes, just as man and every living creature, plant and even mineral does upon the earth, and as our globe itself breathes every twenty-four hours. The dark region is not due to the absorption exerted by the vapours issuing from the bosom of the sun and interposed between the observer and the photosphere, as Father Secchi would have it. See Le Soleil 2, page 184. Nor are the spots formed by the matter, heated gaseous matter, which the eruption projects upon the solar disk from the same source. It is similar to the regular and healthy pulsation of the heart as the life fluid passes through its hollow muscles. Could the human heart be made luminous and the living and throbbing organ be made visible so as to have it reflected upon a screen, such as used by the astronomers in their lectures, say for the moon, then everyone would see the sunspot phenomenon repeated every second due to its contraction and the rushing of the blood. It is said in a work on geology, that it is the dream of science that all the recognized chemical elements will one day be found but modifications of a single material element. See World Life, page 48. 
Occult philosophy has taught this since the existence of human speech and languages, adding only on the principle of the immutable law of analogy, as it is above, so it is below, that other axiom, that there is neither spirit nor matter in reality, but only numberless aspects of the one ever hidden, is, or sat. Homogeneous primordial element is simple and single only on the terrestrial plane of consciousness and sensation, since matter, after all, is nothing else than the sequence of our own states of consciousness, and spirit an idea of a psychic intuition. Even on the next higher plane, that single element which is defined on our earth by current science as the ultimate undecomposable constituent of some kind of matter would be pronounced in the world of a high spiritual perception of something very complex indeed. Our purest water would be found to yield, instead of its two declared simple elements of oxygen and hydrogen, many other constituents undreamt of by our terrestrial modern chemistry. As in the realm of matter, so in the realm of spirit, the shadow of that which is cognized on the plane of objectivity exists on that of pure subjectivity. The speck of the perfectly homogeneous substance, the sarcode of the Hercelian monera, is now viewed as the archibiosis of terrestrial existence, Mr. Huxley's protoplasm, and Batibius Hercelii has to be traced to its pre-terrestrial archibiosis. Not an archibiosis and things. Unfortunately, as these pages are being written, the archibiosis of terrestrial existence has turned under a somewhat stricter chemical analysis into a simple precipitate of sulphate of lime, and from the scientific standpoint, not even an organic substance. Three exclamation marks and sic transit gloria mundi. End of note. This is first perceived by the astronomers at its third stage of evolution, and in the secondary creation, so-called. But the students of esoteric philosophy understand too well the secret meaning of the stanza. Brahma has essentially the aspect of prakriti, both evolved and unevolved. Spirit, O twice born, initiate, is the leading aspect of Brahma. The next is a twofold aspect of Prakriti and Purusha, both evolved and unevolved, and time is the last. Anu is one of the names of Brahma, as distinct from Brahma, neuter, and it means atom, anyamsam anyamsam, the most atomic of the atomic, the immutable and imperishable, akuta, purushottama, unquote. Surely, then, the elements now known to us be their number, whatever it may, as they are understood and defined at present, are not, nor can they be, the primordial elements. Those were formed from the curds of the cold radiant mother, and the fire seed of the hot father, who are one, or to express it in the plainer language of modern science, those elements have their genesis in the depths of the primordial fire mist, the masses of incandescent vapour of the irresolvable nebulae. For as Professor Newcomb shows in his Popular Astronomy on pages 444, resolvable nebulae are not a class of proper nebulae. More than half of those which were at first mistaken for nebulae, he thinks, are what he calls starry clusters. The elements now known have arrived at their state of permanency in this fourth round and fifth race. They have a short period of rest before they are propelled once more on their upward spiritual evolution, when the living fire of Orcus will dissociate the most irresolvable and scatter them into primordial one again. Meanwhile, the occultist goes further, as has been shown in the commentaries on the seven stanzas. Hence he can hardly hope for any help of recognition from science, which will reject both his anyamsam and nyasam, the absolutely spiritual atom, and his manasaputras, mind-born man. By resolving the single material element into one absolute irresolvable element, spirit or root matter, thus placing it at once outside the reach and province of physical philosophy, he has, of course, but little in common with the orthodox men of science. 
He maintains that spirit and matter are two facets of the unknowable unity. They are apparently a contrasted aspects depending A on the various degrees of differentiation of the latter and B on the grades of consciousness attained by man himself. This is, however, metaphysics, and has little to do with physics, however great in its own terrestrial limitation that physical philosophy may now be. Nevertheless, once that science admits, if not the actual existence, at any rate the possibility of the existence of a universe which is numberless forms, conditions, and aspects built out of a single substance, it has to go further. Note. In his World Life, page 48, in the appended footnote, Professor Winchell says, It is generally admitted that at excessively high temperatures matter exists in a state of dissociation, that is, no chemical combination can exist, and would appeal to prove the unity of matter to the spectrum in which every case of homogeneity which are a bright line, whereas in the case of several molecular arrangements existing in the nebula, say, or a star, the spectrum should consist of two or three bright lines. Unquote. This would be no proof either way to the physicist occultist, who maintains that beyond a certain limit of visible matter, no spectrum, no telescope, and no microscope are of any use. The unity of matter, of that which is real cosmic matter to the alchemist, or Adam's Earth, as the Kabbalists call it, can hardly be proved or disproved by either the French savant Dumas, who suggests the composite nature of the elements on certain relations of atomic waves, or even by Mr. Crookes' radiant matter, though his experiments may seem to be best understood on the hypothesis of the homogeneity of the elements of matter and the continuity of the states of matter." Unquote. For all this does not go beyond material matter, so to say, even in what is shown by the spectrum, that modern, quote, eye of Shiva, unquote, of physical experiments. It is of this matter only that H. St. Clair de Vie could say that when bodies deemed to be simple combine with one another, they vanish. They are individually annihilated, simply because he could not follow those bodies in their further transformation in the world of spiritual cosmic matter. Verily, modern science will never be able to dig deep enough into the cosmological formations to find the roots of the world star for matter, unless she works on the same lines of thought as a medieval alchemist did. End of note. Unless it also admits the possibility of one element or the one life of the occultists, it will have to hang up that single substance, especially if limited to only the solar nebulae, like the coffin of Mahmet in mid-air, though minus the attractive magnet that sustains that coffin. Fortunately for the speculative physicists, if unable to state with any degree of precision what the nebula theory does imply, we have, thanks to Professor Winchell and several disagreeing astronomers, been able to learn what it does not imply. Read the super. Note. See world life. The same source. End of note. Unfortunately, this is far from clearing even the most simple of the problems that have vexed and still do vex the men of learning in their research after truth. We have to proceed with our inquiries, starting with the earliest hypotheses of modern science, if we would discover where and why it sins. Perchance it may be found that Stahler is right, after all that the blunders, contradictions, and fallacies made by the most eminent men of learning are simply due to their abnormal attitude. They are and want to remain materialistic quand même, and yet the general principles of the atomic mechanical theory, the basis of modern physics, are substantially identical with the cardinal doctrines of ontological metaphysics. Thus the fundamental errors of ontology have become apparent in proportion to the advance of physical science, unquote. See introduction, page 6, to Concepts of Modern Physics. Science is honeycombed with metaphysical conceptions, but the scientists will not admit the charge and fight desperately to put atomic mechanical masks on purely incorporeal and spiritual laws of nature on our plane, refusing to admit their substantiality even on other planes 
the bare existence of which they reject a priori. It is easy to show, however, how scientists, wedded to their materialistic views, have endeavoured, ever since the day of Newton, to put false masks on fact and truth. But their task is becoming with every year more difficult, and with every year also chemistry, above all the other sciences, approaches near and near the realm of the occult in nature. It is assimilating the very truths taught by the occult sciences for ages, but hitherto bitterly derided. Matter is eternal, says the esoteric doctrine. But the matter the occultists conceive of in its laia, or zero state, is not the matter of modern science, not even in its most rarefied gas state. Mr. Crook's radiant matter would appear matter of the grossest kind in the realm of the beginnings, that it becomes pure spirit before it has returned back even to its first point of differentiation, therefore of differentiation, therefore when the adept of alchemists adds that though matter is eternal, for it is pradana, yet atoms are born at every new manvantara, or reconstruction of the universe, it is no such contradiction as a materialist who believes in nothing beyond the atom might think. There is a difference between manifested and unmanifested matter, between pradana, the beginningless and endless cause, and prakriti, or the manifested effect says the sloka, that which is the unevolved cause is empathically called by the most eminent sages pradana, original base, now which is the subtile prakriti, meaning that which is eternal and which at once is and is not a mere process. Note. See Book 1, Chapter 2, Vishnu Puranya, Fitz Edward Alls Translation. End of note. That which in modern phraseology is respectively referred to as spirit and matter is one in eternity as the perpetual cause, and it is neither spirit nor matter but it, rendered in Sanskrit tad, that. All that is, was, or will be, all that the imagination of man is capable of conceiving, even the exoteric pantheism of Hinduism renders it as no monotheistic philosophy ever did, for in superb phraseology its cosmogony begins with the well-known words there was neither day nor night neither heaven nor earth neither darkness nor light and there was not aught else apprehensible by the senses or by the mental faculties there was then one brahma essentially prakriti nature and spirit for the two aspects of vishnu which are other than his supreme essential aspects are prakriti and spirit and brahman when these two other aspects of his no longer subsist, but are dissolved, then that aspect whence form and the rest, that is, creation, proceed anew, is denominated time, O twice born. Unquote. It is that which is dissolved, or the illusionary dual aspect of that, the essence of which is eternally one, that we call eternal matter or substance. See in part two, primordial substance and divine thought. Formless, sexless, inconceivable, even to our sixth sense or mind, in which therefore we refuse to see that which monotheists call personal, anthropomorphic God. Note. See preceding section nine, life, force, and gravity. Quotation from Anugita. End of note. How are these two propositions, that matter is eternal, and the atom periodical and not eternal, viewed by modern exact science? The materialistic physicist will criticize and laugh them to scorn. The liberal and progressive man of science, however, the true and earnest scientific searcher of the truth, for example the eminent chemist Mr. Crookes, will corroborate the probability of the two statements. For hardly has the echo of his lecture on the genesis of the elements died away, the lecture which delivered by him before the chemical section of the British Association at the last Birmingham meeting, so started every evolutionist who heard or read it, that there came another one in March last, 1888. Once more the president of the chemical society brings before the world of science and the public the fruits of some new discoveries in the realm of atoms, 
and these discoveries justify occult teachings in every way they are more startling even than the statements made by him in the first lecture quoted later and deserve well the attention of every occultist theosophist and metaphysician this is what he says in his elements and meta elements thus justifying Strader's charges and provision with the with the fearlessness of a scientific mind which loves science for truth's sake regardless of any consequences to his own glory and reputation we quote his own words permit me gentlemen now to draw your attention for a short time to a subject which concerns the fundamental principles of chemistry a subject which may lead us to admit the possible existence of bodies which though neither compounds nor mixtures are not elements in the strictest sense of the word bodies which i venture to call meta elements to explain my meaning it is necessary for me to revert to our conception of an element what is the criterion of an element where are we to draw the line between a distinct existence and identity no one doubts that oxygen sodium chlorine sulphur are separate elements and when we come to such groups as chlorine bromine iodine etc we still feel no doubt although were degrees of elementicity admissible and to that we may ultimately have to come it might be allowed that chlorine approximates much more closely to bromine than to oxygen sodium or sulphur again nickel and cobalt are near to each other very near though no one questions their claim to rank as distinct elements still i cannot help asking what would have been their prevalent opinion among chemists had the respective solutions of these bodies and the compounds presented identical colours instead of colours which approximately speaking are mutually complementary would their distinct nature have even now been recognised when we pass further and come to the so-called rare earths the ground is less secure under our feet perhaps we may admit scandium aterbium and others of the like sort to elemental rank but what are we to say in the case of praesia of neodymium between which there may be said to exist no well-marked chemical difference their chief claim to separate individuality being slight differences in basicity and crystallizing powers though their physical distinctions as shown by spectrum observations are very strongly marked even here we may imagine the disposition of the majority of chemists would incline toward the side of, of leniency so that they would admit these two bodies within the charmed circle whether in so doing they would be able to appeal to any broad principle is an open question if we admit these candidates how in justice are we to exclude the series of elemental bodies or meat elements made known to us by chris and nilsson here the spectral differences are well marked while my own researches on didymium show also slight difference in basicity between some at least of these doubtful bodies in the same category must be included the numerous separate bodies into which it is probable that yttrium erbium samarium and other elements commonly so called have been and are being split up where then are we to draw the line the different groupings shade off so imperceptibly the one into the other that it is impossible to erect a definite boundary between any two adjacent bodies and to say that the body on this side of the line is an element while the one on the other side is non-elementary or merely something which simulates or approximates to an element wherever an apparently reasonable line might be drawn it would no doubt be easy at once to assign most bodies to their proper side as in all cases of classification the real difficulty comes in when the border line is approached slight chemical differences of course are admitted and up to a certain point so are well marked physical differences what are we to say however when the only chemical difference is an almost imperceptible tendency for the one body of a couple or of a group to precipitate before the other again there are cases where the chemical differences reach the vanishing point although well marked physical differences still remain here we stumble on a new difficulty in such obscurities what is chemical and what is physical and are we not entitled to call a slight tendency of a nascent amorphous precipitate to fall down in advance of another a physical difference 
and may we not call colored reactions depending on the amount of some particular acid present and varying according to the concentration of the solution and to the solvent employed chemical differences i do not see how we can deny elementary character to a body which differs from another by well-marked color or spectrum reactions while we accord it to another body whose only claim is a very minute difference in basic powers having once opened the door wide enough to admit some spectrum differences we have to inquire how minute a difference qualifies the candidate to pass i will give instances from my own experience of some of these doubtful candidates and here the great chemist gives several cases of the very extraordinary behavior of molecules and earths apparently the same and which yet when examined very closely were found to exhibit differences which however imperceptible still show that none of them are simple bodies and that the sixty or seventy elements accepted in chemistry can no longer cover the ground their name apparently is legion but as the so-called periodic theory stands in the way of an unlimited multiplication of elements mr crookes is obliged to find some means of reconciling the new discovery with the old theory that theory he says has received such abundant verification that we cannot like to accept any interpretation of phenomena which fails to be in accordance with it but if we suppose the elements reinforced by a vast number of bodies slightly differing from each other in their properties and forming if i may use the expression aggregations of nebulae where we formerly saw believed we saw separate stars the periodic arrangement can no longer be definitely grasped no longer that is if we retain our usual conception of an element let us then modify this conception for element read elementary group such elementary groups taking the place of the old elements in the periodic scheme and the difficulty falls away in defining an element let us take not an external boundary but an internal type let us say for example the smallest ponderable quantity of yttrium as an assemblage of ultimate atoms almost infinitely more like each other than they are to the atoms any other approximating element it does not necessarily follow that the atoms shall all be absolutely alike among themselves the atomic weight which we ascribed to yttrium therefore merely represents a mean value around which the actual weights of the individual atoms of the element range within certain limits but if my conjecture is tenable could we separate atom from atom we should find them varying within narrow limits on each side of the mean the very process of fractionation implies the existence of such differences in certain bodies thus fact and truth have once more forced the hand of exact science and compelled it to enlarge its views and change its terms which masking the multitude reduced them to one body like the septenary elohim and their hosts transformed by the materialistic religionists into one jehovah replace the chemical terms molecule atom and particle etc by the words hosts monads divas etc and one might think of the genesis of gods the primeval evolution of momentary intelligent forces was being described but the learned lecturer adds something still more suggestive to his descriptive remarks whether consciously or unconsciously who knows for he says the following quote, until lately such bodies passed muster as elements they had definite properties chemical and physical they had recognized atomic weights if we take a pure dilute solution of such a body yttrium for instance and if we add to it the, an excess of strong ammonia we obtain a precipitate which appears perfectly homogeneous but if instead we add very dilute ammonia in quantity sufficient only to precipitate one half of the base present we obtain our immediate precipitate if we stir up the whole thoroughly as to ensure a uniform mixture of the solution and the ammonia and set the vessel aside for an hour carefully excluding dust we may still find the liquid clear and bright without any vestige of turbidity after three or four hours however an opalescence will declare itself and the next morning a precipitate will have appeared now let us ask ourselves what can be the meaning of this phenomenon the quantity of precipitant added was insufficient to throw down more than half the yttria present therefore a process akin to selection has been going on for several hours the precipitation has evidently not been effected at random those molecules of the base being decomposed which happened to come in contact with the corresponding molecule of ammonia 
for we have taken care that the liquids should be uniformly mixed, so that the one molecule of the original salt would not be more exposed to decomposition than any other. If, further, we consider the time which elapses before the appearance of a precipitate, we cannot avoid coming to the conclusion that the action which has been going on for the first few hours is of a selective character. The problem is not why a precipitate is produced, but what determines or directs some atoms to fall down and others to remain in solution. Out of the multitude of atoms present, what power is it that directs each atom to choose the proper path? We may picture to ourselves some directive force, passing the atoms one by one in review, selecting one for precipitation and another for solution, till all have been adjusted. Unquote. Well may a man of sign ask himself, what power is it that directs each atom, and what is it that its character should be selective? Theists would solve the question by answering God, and would solve nothing philosophically. Occultism answers on its own pantheistic grounds, and refers the reader to a subsequent section, God's Monads and Atoms. The learned lecturer sees in it that which is his chief concern, the finger posts and the traces of a path which may lead to the discovery and the full and complete demonstration of a homogeneous element in nature. He remarks, quote, In order that such a selection can be effected, there evidently must be some slight differences between which it is possible to select, and this difference almost certainly must be one of basicity, so slight as to be imperceptible by any test at present known, but susceptible of being nursed and encouraged to a point when the difference can be appreciated by ordinary tests." Unquote. Occultism, which knows of the existence and presence in nature of the one eternal element at the first differentiation of which the roots of the tree of life are periodically struck, needs no scientific proofs. It says, ancient wisdom has solved the problem ages ago. A earnest, as well as mocking reader, science is slowly but as surely approaching our domains of the occult. It is forced by its own discoveries to adopt Norland's volens, our phraseology and symbols. Chemical science is now compelled by the very force of things to accept even our illustration of the evolution of the gods and atoms so suggestively and undeniably figured in the caduceus of Mercury, the god of wisdom, and in the allegorical language of the archaic sages, says a commentary in the esoteric doctrine. The trunk of the Ashvata, the tree of life and being, the rod of the caduceus, grows from and descends at every beginning, every new manvantara, from the two dark wings of the swan, Hansa, of life. The two serpents, the ever-living and its illusion, spirit and matter, whose two heads grow from the one head between the wings, descend along the trunk, interlaced in close embrace. The two tails join on earth, the manifested universe, into one. And this is the great illusion, Ulanu. Everyone knows what the caduceus is, already modified by the Greeks. The original symbol with the triple head of the serpent, became altered into a rod with a knob, and the two lower heads were separated, thus disfiguring somewhat the original meaning. Yet it is as good an illustration as can be for our purpose, this lyre rod entwined by two serpents. Verily the wonderful powers of the magic caduceus were sung by all the ancient poets, with a very good reason for those who understood the secret meaning. Now what says the learned president of the Chemical Society of Great Britain in that same lecture which has any reference to, or bearing upon, our above-mentioned doctrine? Very little. Only this, and uh, nothing more. Quote, in the Birmingham address already referred to, I asked my audience to picture the action of two forces on the original protyle, one being time accompanied by a lowering of temperature, the other swinging to and fro like a mighty pendulum, having periodic cycles of ebb and swell, rest and activity, being intimately connected with imponderable matter, essence, or source of energy we call electricity. Now, a seemingly like this affects its object if it fixes in the mind 
the particular fact it is intended to emphasize, but it must not be expected necessarily to run parallel with all the facts. Besides the lowering of temperature, with the periodic ebb and flow of electricity, positive or negative, requisite to confer on the newly born elements their particular atomicity, it is evident that a third factor must be taken into account. Nature does not act on a flat plane. She demands space for her cosmogenic operations, and, if we introduce space as the third factor, all appears clear. Instead of a pendulum which, though to a certain extent a good illustration, is impossible as a fact, let us seek some more satisfactory way of representing what I conceive may have taken place. Let us suppose the zigzag diagram not drawn upon a plane, but projected in space of three dimensions. What figure can we best select to meet all the conditions involved? Many of the facts can be well explained by supposing the projection in space of Professor Emerson Reynolds' zigzag curve to be a spiral. This figure is, however, inadmissible inasmuch as the curve has to pass through a point neutral as to electricity and chemical energy twice in each cycle. We must, therefore, adopt some other figure. A figure of eight. A luminous gate for the evolution downward from spirit into matter. Another form of a spiral, perhaps, in its re-involutionary path onward from matter into spirit and the necessary gradual and final reabsorption into the liar state, that which science calls in her own way, quote, the point neutral as to electricity, unquote, etc., or the zero point. Such are the occult facts and statement. They may be left with the greatest security and confidence to science to be justified some day. Let us hear some more, however, about this primordial genetic type of the symbolical caduceus. Quote, Such a figure will result from three very simple simultaneous motions. First, a simple oscillation backwards and forwards. Suppose east and west. Secondly, a simple oscillation at right angles to the former. Suppose north and south. Of half the periodic time that is, twice as fast, and thirdly, a motion at right angles to these two, suppose downwards, which, in its simplest form, would be with unvarying velocity. If we project this figure in space, we find on examination that the points of the curves, where chlorine, bromine, and iodine are formed, come close under each other, so also will sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, again phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony, and in like manner other series of analogous bodies. It may be asked whether this scheme explains how and why the elements appear in this order. Let us imagine a cyclical translation in space, each evolution witnessing the genesis of the group of elements which I previously represented as produced during one complete vibration of the pendulum. Let us suppose that one cycle has thus been completed, the center of the unknown creative force and its mighty journey through space having scattered along its track the primitive atoms, the seeds, if I may use the expression, which presently are to coalesce and develop into the groupings now known as lithium and beryllium and boron, carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine. What is most probably the form of track now pursued? What is strictly confined to the same plane of temperature and time, the next elementary groupings to appear would again have been those of lithium, and the original cycle would have been eternally repeated, producing again and again the same fourteen elements. The conditions, however, are not quite the same. Space and electricity are, as at first, but temperature has altered, and thus instead of the atoms of lithium being supplemented with atoms in all respects analogous with themselves, the atomic groupings which come into being when the second cycle commences form, not lithium, but its lineal descendant, potassium. Suppose, therefore, the V generatrix travelling to and fro in cycles along a lemnisate path, as above suggested, while simultaneously temperature is declining and time is flowing on. 
variations which I have endeavoured to represent by the downward sink. Each coil of the limited track crosses the same vertical line at lower and lower points. Projected in space, the curve shows a central line neutral, as far as electricity is concerned, and neutral in chemical properties. Positive electricity on the north, negative on the south. Dominant atomicities are governed by the distance east and west from the neutral central line. Monatomic elements being one removed from it, diatomic two removes, and so on. In every successive coil, the same law holds good. Unquote. And, as if to prove the postulate of occult science and Hindu philosophy, that at the hour of the pralaya, the two aspects of the unknowable deity, the swan in darkness, prakriti and purusha, nature or matter in all its forms and spirit, no longer subsist, but are absolutely dissolved, we learn the conclusive scientific opinion of the great English chemist, who caps his proof by saying, we have now traced the formation of the chemical elements from knots and voids in a primitive formless fluid. We have shown the possibility, nay the probability, that the atoms are not eternal in existence, but share with all other created beings the attributes of decay and death. Occultism says Amen to this, as the scientific quote, possibility unquote, and quote, probability unquote, are for it facts demonstrated beyond the necessity of further proof or any extraneous physical evidence. Nevertheless, it repeats with as much assurance as ever matter is eternal, becoming atomic, its aspect only periodically. This is as sure as that the other proposition, which is almost unanimously accepted by astronomers and physicists, namely that the wear and tear of the body of the universe is steadily going on, and that it will finally lead to the extinction of the solar fires and the destruction of the universe, is quite erroneous on the lines traced by men of science. There will be, as there ever were in time and eternity, periodical dissolutions of the manifested universe, but a, a partial pralaya after every day of Brahma, and b, an universal pralaya, the Maha pralaya, only after the lapse of every Brahma's age. But the scientific causes for such dissolution, as brought forward by exact science, have nothing to do with the true causes. However that may be, occultism is once more justified by science, for Mr. Crookes said, quote, We have shown from arguments drawn from the chemical laboratory that in matter which has responded to every test of an element, there are minute shades of difference which may admit of selection. We have seen that the time under the distinction between elements and compounds no longer keeps pace with the developments of chemical science, but must be modified to include a vast array of intermediate bodies. Meter elements. We have shown how the objections of Clerk Maxwell, weighty as they are, may be met. And finally, we have adduced reasons for believing that primitive matter was formed by the act of a generative force, throwing off at intervals of time atoms endowed with varying quantities of primitive forms of energy. If we may hazard any conjectures as to the source of energy embodied in a chemical atom, we may, I think, premise that the heat radiations propagated outwards through the ether from the ponderable matter of the universe by some process of nature not yet known to us are transformed at the confines of the universe into the primary, the essential, motions of chemical atoms which, the instant they are formed, gravitate inwards, and thus restore to the universe the energy which otherwise would be lost to it through radiant heat. If this conjecture be well founded, Sir William Thompson's startling prediction of the final decrepitude of the universe through the dissipation of its energy falls to the ground. In this fashion, gentlemen, it seems to me that the question of the elements may be provisionally treated. Our slender knowledge of these first mysteries is extending steadily, surely, though slowly." Unquote. 
By a strong and curious coincidence, even our septenary doctrine seems to force the hand of science. If we understand rightly, chemistry speaks of fourteen groupings of primitive atoms. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. And Mr. Crookes, speaking of the dominant atomicities, enumerates seven groups of these, for he says, quote, As the mighty focus of creative energy goes round, we see it in successive cycles, sowing in one tract of space seeds of lithium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. In another tract, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. In a third, sodium, copper, silver, and gold. In a fourth, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. In a fifth, beryllium, calcium, strontium, and barium. In a sixth, magnesium, zinc, cadmium, and mercury. In a seventh, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and bismuth which makes seven groupings on the one hand, and after showing in other tracts the other elements, namely aluminium, gallium, indium, and thallium, silicon, germanium, and tin, carbon, titanium, and syncodium, unquote. He adds, quote, while a natural position near the neutral axis is found for the three groups of elements relegated by Professor Mendeleev to a sort of hospital for incurables, his eighth family, unquote. It might be interesting to compare these seven of the eight family of incurables with the allegories concerning the seven primitive sons of mother, infinite space, or Aditi, and the eighth son rejected by her. Many a strange coincidence may thus be found between those intermediate links named meter elements or elementoids, and those whom occult science names their numenoi the intelligent minds and rulers of those groupings of monads and atoms. But this would lead us too far. Let us be content with finding the confession of the fact that this deviation from absolute homogeneity should mark the constitution of these molecules or aggregations of matter which we designate elements, and will perhaps be clearer if we return in imagination to the earliest dawn of a material universe and, face to face with the great secret, try to consider the processes of elemental evolution. Thus finally science, in the person of its highest representatives, in order to make itself clearer to the profane, adopts the phraseology of such old adepts as Roger Bacon, and returns to the protile. All this is hope and suggestive of the science of the times. Indeed, these signs are many and multiply daily, but none are more important than those just quoted. For now the chasm between the occult, superstitious, and unscientific teachings and exact science is completely bridged, and one, at least, of the few eminent chemists of the day is in the realm of the infinite possibilities of occultism. Every new step he will take will bring him nearer and nearer to that mysterious centre from which radiate the innumerable paths and lead down spirit into matter, and which transform the gods and the living monads into man and sentient nature. But we have something more. The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky A facsimile of the original edition of 1888 Printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Book 1, Part 3, Science and the Secret Doctrine Contrasted. Addenda to Book 1. Addenda Chapter 10, The Coming Force, Its Possibilities and Impossibilities. Shall we say that force is moving matter or matter in motion? and a manifestation of energy, or that matter and force are the phenomenal differentiated aspects of the one primary undifferentiated cosmic substance. This query is made with regard to that stanza which treats of Fohat, and is seven brothers or sons, in other words, of the cause and the effects of cosmic electricity, the latter called in occult parlance the seven primary forces of electricity whose purely phenomenal, and hence grossest, effects 
are alone cognizable by physicists on the cosmic and especially on the terrestrial plane. These include, among other things, sound, light, color, etc., etc. Now what does physical science tell us of these, quote, forces, unquote? Sound, it says, is a sensation produced by the impact of atmospheric molecules on the tympanum, which, by setting up delicate tremors in the auditory apparatus, thus communicate themselves to the brain. Light is the sensation caused by the impact of inconceivably minute vibrations of ether on the retina of the eye. So, too, we say that this is simply the effect produced in our atmosphere and its immediate surroundings, all, in fact, which falls within the range of our terrestrial consciousness. Jupiter Pluvius sent his symbol in drops of rain, or water composed, as is believed, of two elements, which chemistry dissociates and recombines. The compound molecules are in its power, but their atoms still elude its grasp. Occultism sees in all these forces and manifestations a ladder, the lower rungs of which belong to exoteric physics, and the higher are traced to a living, intelligent, invisible power which is, as a rule, the unconcerned and exceptionally the conscious cause of the sense-born phenomenon designated as this or another natural law. We say and maintain that sound, for one thing, is a tremendous occult power, that it is a stupendous force, of which the electricity generated by a million of Niagara's could never counteract the smallest potentiality when directed with occult knowledge. Sound may be produced of such a nature that, that the pyramid of Cheops would be raised in the air, or that a dying man, nay, when at his last breath, would be revived and filled with new energy and vigor. For sound generates, or rather attracts together, the elements that produce an ozone, the fabrication of which is beyond chemistry, but within the limits of alchemy. It may even resurrect a man or an animal whose astral, vital body has not been irreparably separated from the physical body by the severance of the magnetic or odic cord. As one saved thrice from death by that power, the writer ought to be credited with knowing personally something about it. And if all this appears too unscientific to be even noticed, let science explain to what mechanical and physical laws known to it is due to the recently produced phenomena of the so-called Keeley motor. What is it that acts as the formidable generator of invisible but tremendous force of that power which is not only capable of driving an engine of twenty-five horsepower, but has even been employed to lift the machinery bodily? Yet this is done simply by drawing a fiddle-bow across a tuning-fork, has been repeatedly proven. For the etheric force, discovered by the well-known, in America and now in Europe, John Warrell Keeley of Philadelphia, is no hallucination. Notwithstanding his failure to utilize it, a failure prognosticated and maintained by some occultists from the first, the phenomena exhibited by the discoverer during the last few years have been wonderful, almost miraculous, not in the sense of the supernatural, but of the superhuman. Note. The word supernatural implies above or outside of nature. Nature and space are one. Now, space for the metaphysician exists outside of any act of sensation, and is a purely subjective representation. Materialism, which would connect it forcibly with one or the other datum of sensation notwithstanding. For our senses, it is fairly subjective when independent of anything within it. How then can any phenomenon, or anything else, step outside of or be performed beyond that which has no limits but when spatial extension becomes simply conceptual and is thought of in an idea connected with certain actions as by the materialists and the physicists then again they have hardly a right to define and claim that which can or cannot be produced by forces generated within even limited spaces as they have not even an approximate idea of what those forces are End of note. Had Keeley been permitted to succeed, he might have reduced a whole army to atoms in the space of a few seconds, as easily as he reduced a dead ox to the same condition. 
The reader is now asked to give a serious attention to that newly discovered potency which the discoverer has named interetheric force and forces. In the humble opinion of the occultists, as of his immediate friends, Mr. Keeley of Philadelphia was, and still is, at the threshold of some of the greatest secrets of the universe, of that chiefly on which is built the whole mystery of physical forces, and the esoteric significance of the mundane egg symbolism. Occult philosophy, viewing the manifested and the unmanifested cosmos as a unity, symbolizes the ideal conception of the former by that golden egg with two poles in it. It is the positive pole that acts in the manifested world of matter, while the negative is lost in the unknowable absoluteness of Sat, Venus. Note, quote, it is not correct when speaking of idealism to show it based upon the old ontological assumptions that things or entities exist independently of each other, and otherwise than as terms of relations, unquote, says Stalo. At any rate, it is incorrect to say so of idealism in Eastern philosophy and its cognition, for it is just the reverse. End of note. Whether this agrees with the philosophy of Mr. Keeley we cannot tell, nor does it really much matter. Nevertheless, his ideas about the ethereal material construction of the universe look strangely like our own, being in this respect nearly identical. This is what we find him saying in an able pamphlet compiled by Mrs. Bloomfield Moore, an American lady of wealth and possession, whose incessant efforts in the pursuit of truth can never be too highly appreciated. Quote, Mr. Keeley, in explanation of the working of his engine, says, In the conception of any machine heretofore constructed, the medium for inducing a neutral center has never been found. If it had, the difficulties of a perpetual motion seekers would have ended, and this problem would have become unestablished and operating fact. It would only require an introductory impulse of a few pounds on such a device to cause it to run for centuries. In the conception of my vibratory engine, I did not seek to attain perpetual motion, but a circuit is formed that actually has a neutral center, which is in a condition to be vivified by my vibratory ether, and, while under operation by said substance, is really a machine that is virtually independent of the mass or globe and it is the wonderful velocity of the vibratory circuit which makes it so. Still, with all its perfection, it requires to be fed with the vibratory ether to make it an independent motor. Note. Independent, in a certain sense, but not disconnected with it. End of note. Further, all structures require foundation in strength according to the weight of the mass they have to carry, but the foundations of the universe rest on a vacuous point far more minute than a molecule. In fact, to express this truth properly on an interetheric point, which requires an infinite mind to understand it, to look down into the depths of an etheric center is precisely the same as it would be to search into the broad space of heaven's ether to find the end, with this difference, that one is the positive field, while the other is the negative field. Unquote. This, as easily seen, is precisely the Eastern doctrine. His interetheric point is the layer point of the occultists, which, however, does not require an infinite mind to understand it, but only specific intuition and ability to trace its hiding place in this world of matter. Of course, the layer center cannot be produced, but an interetheric vacuum can, as proved in the production of the bell sounds in space. Mr. Keeler speaks as an unconscious occultist, nevertheless, when he remarks in his theory of planetary suspension, quote, As regards planetary volume, we should ask, in a scientific point of view, how can the immense difference of volume in the planets exist without disorganizing the harmonious action that has always characterized them? I can only answer this question properly by entering into a progressive analysis, starting on the rotating etheric centers that were fixed by the Creator with their attractive or accumulative power. 
note, by Fohat more likely than the creator would be an occultist's reply. End of note. If you ask what power it is that gives to each etheric atom its inconceivable velocity of rotation or introductory impulse, I must answer that no finite mind will ever be able to conceive what it is. The philosophy of accumulation is the only proof that such a power has been given. The area, if we can so speak, of such an atom presents to the attractive or magnetic, the elective or propulsive, all the receptive force and all the antagonistic force that characterizes a planet of the largest magnitude. Consequently, as the accumulation goes on, the perfect equation remains the same. When this minute center has once been fixed, the power to rend it from its position would necessarily have to be so great as to displace the most immense planet that exists. When this atomic neutral center is displaced, the planet must go with it. The neutral center carries the full load of any accumulation from the start and remains the same, forever balanced in the eternal space. Unquote. Mr. Keeler illustrates his idea of a neutral center in this way. Quote, we will imagine that, after an accumulation of a planet of any diameter, say 20,000 miles, more or less, for the size has nothing to do with the problem, there should be a displacement of all the material, with exception of a crust 5,000 miles thick, leaving an intervening void between this crust and a center of the size of an ordinary billiard ball. It would then require a force as great to move this small central mass as it would to move the shell of 5,000 miles of thickness. Moreover, this small central mass would carry the load of this crust forever, keeping it equidistant, and there could be no opposing power, however great, that could bring them together. The imagination staggers in contemplating the immense load which bears upon this point of center, where weight ceases. This is what we understand by a neutral center." Unquote and what occultists understand by layer center. The above is pronounced unscientific by many, but so is everything that is not sanctioned and kept on strictly orthodox lines by physical science. Unless the explanation given by the inventor himself is accepted, and his explanations being as observed quite orthodox from the spiritual and the occult standpoints, if not from that, of the materialistic speculative called exact science, are therefore ours in this particular. What can science answer to facts already seen which it is no longer possible for anyone to deny? Occult philosophy divulges few of its most important vital mysteries. It drops them like precious pearls one by one, far and wide apart, and only when forced to do so by the evolutionary tidal wave that carries on humanity slowly, silently, but steadily toward the dawn of the sixth race mankind. For once out of the safe custody of their legitimate heirs and keepers, those mysteries cease to be occult. They fall into the public domain and have to run the risk of becoming in the hands of the selfish, of the Cains, of the human race, curses more often than blessings. Nevertheless, whenever such individuals as the discoverer of etheric force, John Whirl Keeley, men with peculiar psychic and mental capacities are born, they are generally and more frequently helped than allowed to go unassisted, groping on their way, though if left to their own resources, falling very soon victims to martyrdom and unscrupulous speculators. Only they are helped on the condition that they should not become, whether consciously or unconsciously, as additional peril to their age, a danger to the poor, now offered in daily holocaust by the less wealthy to the very wealthy. This necessitates a short digression and an explanation. Notes Note on men with peculiar psychic and mental capacities. The reason for such psychic capacities is given farther on. End of note. Note in the helping of such individuals, etc. The above was written two years ago, 
at a time when hopes of success for the keel motor were at their highest. What was then said by the writer proved true in every word, and now only few remarks are added to it with regard to the failure of his expectations, so far which has now been admitted by the discoverer himself. Though, however, the word failure is here used, the reader should understand it in a relative sense, for, as Mrs. Bloomfield Moore explains, what Mr. Keel does not admit is that, baffled in applying vibratory force to mechanics, up in his first and second lines of experimental research, he was obliged either to confess a commercial failure or to try a third departure from his base or principle, seeking success through another channel, she explained. And this channel is on the physical plane. End of note. Some twelve years back, during the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, the writer, in answering the earnest queries of a theosophist, one of the earliest admirers of Mr. Keeley, repeated to him what she had heard in quarters, information from which she could never doubt. It had been stated that the inventor of the self-motor was what is called, in the jargon of the Kabbalists, a natural-born magician that he was and would remain unconscious of the full range of his powers, and would work out merely those which he had found out and ascertained in his own nature, firstly, because attributing them to a wrong source he could never give them full sway, and secondly, because it was beyond his power to pass to others that which was a capacity inherent in his special nature. Hence the whole secret could not be made over permanently to anyone for practical purposes or use. Note, we learn that these remarks are not applicable to Mr. Keeler's latest discovery. Time alone can show the exact limit of his achievements. End of note. Individuals born with such a capacity are not very rare. That they are not heard of more frequently is due to the fact that they live and die in almost every case in utter ignorance of being possessed of abnormal powers at all. Mr. Keeler possesses powers which are called abnormal just because they happen in our day to be as little known as blood circulation was before harvest time. Blood existed, and it behaved as it does at present in the first man born from woman. And so does that principle in man which can control and guide etheric vibratory force. At any rate, it exists in all those mortals whose inner selves are primordially connected by reason of their direct descent with that group of Dianchochans who are called the firstborn of ether. Mankind, physically considered, is divided into various groups, each of which is connected with one of the Dianic groups that first formed psychic man. See paragraphs 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in the commentary to stanza 7. Mr. Keeley, being greatly favoured in this respect, and moreover, besides his psychic temperament, being intellectually a genius in mechanics, may thus achieve most wonderful results. He has achieved some already, more than any mortal man not initiated into the final mysteries, has achieved in this age up to this present day. What he has done is certainly quite sufficient to demolish with the ham of science the idols of science, the idols of matter with the feet of clay, as his friends justly predict and say of him. Nor would the writer for a moment think of contradicting Mrs. Bloomfield Moore when in her paper on psychic force and etheric force she states that Mr. Keeley, as a philosopher, is great enough in soul, wise enough in mind, and sublime enough in courage to overcome all difficulties and to stand at last before the world as the greatest discoverer and inventor in the world. And again she writes, Quote, should Keeley do no more than lead scientists from the dreary realms where they are groping into the open field of elemental force, where gravity and cohesion are disturbed in their haunts and diverted to use, where, from unity to origin, emanates infinite energy in diversified forms, he will achieve immortal fame. Should he demonstrate, to the destruction of materialism, that the universe is animated by a mysterious principle to which matter, however perfectly organized, is absolutely subservient, he will be a greater spiritual benefactor to our race than the modern world has yet found in any man. 
should he be able to substitute in the treatment of disease the finer forces of nature for the grossly material agencies which have sent more human beings to their graves than war pestilence and famine combined who will merit and receive the gratitude of mankind all this and more will he do if he and those who have watched his progress day by day for years are not too sanguine in their expectations Unquote. writing in the t p s theosophical publication society series number nine the same lady in a pamphlet keely's secrets bring forward a passage from an article written a few years ago by the writer of the present volume in her journal the theosophist in these words Quote, the author of number five of the pamphlets issued by the theosophical publication society what is matter and what is force says therein the men of science have just found out a fourth state of matter whereas the occultists have penetrated years ago beyond the sixth and therefore do not infer but know of the existence of the seventh the last this knowledge comprises one of the secrets of keeler's so-called compound secret it is already known to many that his secret includes the augmentation of energy the installation of the ether and the adaptation of dinospheric force to machinery unquote. It is just because Keeley's discovery would lead to a knowledge of one of the most occult secrets, a secret which can never be allowed to fall into the hands of the masses, that his failure to push his discoveries to their logical end seems certain to occultists. But of this more presently. Even in its limitations, this discovery may prove of the greatest benefit, for, quote, step by step with the patient perseverance which some day the world will honour this man of genius has made his researches overcoming the colossal difficulties which again and again raised up in his path what seemed to be to all but himself insurmountable barriers to further progress but never has the world's index finger so pointed to an hour when all is making ready for the advent of the new form of force that mankind is waiting for nature always reluctant to yield her secrets is listening to the demands made upon her by her master necessity the coal mines of the world cannot long afford the increasing drain made upon them steam has reached its utmost limits of power and does not fulfil the requirements of the age it knows that its days are numbered electricity holds back with bated breath dependent upon the approach of her sister colleague Airships are riding at anchor, as it were, waiting for the force which is to make aerial navigation something more than a dream. As easily as men communicate with their offices from their homes by means of the telephone, so will the inhabitants of separate continents talk across the ocean. Imagination is palsied when seeking to foresee the grand results of this marvellous discovery when once it is applied to art and mechanics. In taking the throne which it will force steam to abdicate, dinospheric force will rule the world with a power so mighty in the interests of civilization that no finite mind can conjecture the results. Lawrence Oliphant, in his preface to Scientific Religion, says, A new moral future is dawning upon the human race, one certainly of which it stands much in need. In no way could this new moral future be so widely, so universally commenced as by the utilizing of dinospheric force to the beneficial purposes in life. Unquote. The occultists are ready to admit all this with the eloquent writer. Molecular vibration is undeniably Keeley's legitimate field of research, and the discoveries made by him will prove wonderful yet only in his hands and through himself. The world so far will get that which it can be safely entrusted. The truth of this assertion has, perhaps, not yet quite 